Hey there, welcome to this Python 101 course. My name is Olaf Paulson, and I'm really excited to get to guide you through the basics of the Python language here on Scrimba. Now, not only will you be learning the most popular, but also likely the most versatile programming language right now, Python, but you will be learning on the Scrimba platform, which will take the tutorial experience to a whole new level. I love it, and I'm hoping that you will too. So why should you learn Python? Well, Python is a really versatile and really easy to learn language. Part of the versatility comes from it being a bit like a smartphone where you can access and use any of the 150,000 or so apps in the App Store. And those modules will help you fix more or less anything you need solved without much effort on your part at all. Python is also very easy to write and forgiving as programming languages go. And to be frank, it's probably the easiest language to get started with as it's even more like regular English than most other programming languages. If you want to create a script to back up files or check something on a web page every 10 minutes or create a face recognition implementation using machine learning or land your first job in development, then Python is for you. Easy access to data on the web. Sometimes people refer to Python as being made for the web. And this mostly means there are lots of tools that you can use to get data from the web and websites or interact with other applications on the web. Again, with very little coding effort on your part. Python is very often used as the programming language when working with AI and machine learning by data scientists and researchers, and there are many reasons for this. But on one level, you need to remember that if you want to work within this area, Python is almost a requirement. And if you ask me, it's probably the easiest language to get started with. So in this course, we're going to work together to take you from a beginner to an intermediate Python developer. So you can start experimenting and using all the available tools, or maybe to prepare you for a more comprehensive programming bootcamp or a course that you want to take. We're going to take you from zero to good, and if you want to get to great, you just need to practice more. The course consists of interactive tutorials where I walk you through various concepts and then exercises where you can practice these concepts. But don't for a second think practice is only in the exercises. You can and should practice and play around with the code as much as possible. Learning is supposed to be fun, so just have fun with this. And that is one of the really great things about Scrimba. You can pause any tutorial whenever you want and start playing with the code. You can add, remove, run, or fork the code and save it. Anything you see on screen, you can modify. And all this experimenting is what's going to make your Python programming muscles strong and really cement the knowledge that you get. So be curious and interrupt me as much as you want. I won't mind at all. As long as you're learning, I'm happy. In the end, how much you learn is really going to be up to you. And you'll get out of this course what you put into it. If you just watch the tutorials without doing any of the coding exercises or trying out the code that you see, you're not going to get anywhere near the full learning experience that I think you expect. So commit to your own learning and work through all the exercises and play around with the code in every tutorial. That is going to make you a great programmer. So as a bonus to this course, we've created a Facebook group for you. It's called Python 101, and you see the link right here that you can click on. Otherwise, search for Python 101 and you'll find the course on Facebook. It's a social learning group where you can learn with others who are doing the course just like you, and you can do more exercises and learn even more. I'm hoping to see you there and interact with you directly. So what are we going to learn in this course? We're going to learn basic syntax and outputting data and program flow. We're going to work with text using strings and store data in variables. We're going to learn how to do math in Python with arithmetic operations. Then we'll look at lists, tuples, sets, and dictionaries for storing different types of data. We'll learn how to control how your code runs with conditionals and if and elif statements. We'll teach you how to use loops, both while and for loops. You'll learn how and why to use functions, return statements, why and how to comment your code, and what to do when you encounter errors. You'll learn about objects and classes and even about inheritance. And you'll even learn about list and dictionary comprehensions and lambda functions, sometimes called anonymous functions. Woo. To prepare for your next step and open up the Python world of opportunities, you're going to learn about modules and how to use them in your code. You will also get plenty of exercises and some projects and other bits and pieces. So it's time to meet your instructor. That's me. My name's Olaf Paulsen. I'm Swedish and I have a passion for education. When I'm not doing this, I'm the advocate for Khan Academy in Swedish. That means I do as much as I can to make sure that we have a Khan Academy in Swedish. That's a not-for-profit project I've been working on for a long time and I will probably continue quite a while longer. 
My background is mainly from the finance industry and investment banking, portfolio management, and also running development teams. And the programming I've done has mainly been around writing algorithms. If you want to reach out and tell me how you found the course, you can do so on Twitter or in the Facebook group. Now with that, there's really only one question left to ask. Are you ready? Then let's get started and see just how deep this rabbit hole goes. I'll see you in the next tutorial. All right, so I'll welcome you to the Python 101 course once more. And I thought I'd tell you how we get a backend language like Python to run on a front-end platform like Scrimba. And as usual, it's an add-in or a module that comes to save us. And in this case, we'll find it in the index.html file. So here in the HTML file, we have the Brython plugin. Now, normally we run this Brython minimum JS. And what it allows us to do is to write Python code that then gets recompiled into JavaScript and can then run on the Scrimba platform or I guess many other platforms. And this is the one we normally use. When we want to do more advanced stuff, or if you want to experiment on your own, edit out and enable this script, the one that has the Brython standard lib. That has more functionality and is something we're going to use when we import modules, for instance. And if you take a look at the versions, of course, by the time you're looking at this course, there might be newer versions. And with really bad luck, maybe some of the code we write isn't going to work on later versions. But anyway, you can do this. You don't have to, but you can. There are also a few oddities that I thought I'd go through that you're going to encounter through the course. And they are not many, but there are at least two. So the first one is the input box that we're going to use when we get user input is in this case really the JavaScript prompt. And for some reason, the screen capture doesn't capture that. So you can't see it. If you run your own code, you can see it. And what it looks like for me when I talk about it and I say, hey, I'm getting an input box and you can't see it is this. And you'll see it as well when you run the code locally, but you just won't see it when I'm running through the code in the tutorial. So bear that in mind. Another thing is that the Scrimba mini browser sometimes hovers in the corner in some tutorials. You don't have to worry about it. I'll show you what I mean. We're talking about this little browser, this guy right here. So he's going to be hanging out down here in the corner just to be out of the way. And in some tutorials, you won't even see it. But again, don't worry about it. So that's how we get Python to run in JavaScript and in Scrimba and are able to do this awesome course for you. So with that, let's get cracking with the first tutorial. Okay, welcome. It's time to get started. I hope you're as excited as I am. So let's start talking about programming languages very briefly. So when we program, we're giving the computer a bunch of instructions. And the programming language we're using has different special words that mean different things. Luckily, most languages have somewhat similar words and ways of writing. So, so they're often more like dialects than totally different languages, which is good if you want to learn multiple languages. So and Python is one of the more simple languages to learn. So that's great, right? So let's get started. So when we write our Python code, we will often want to see if it's working, if we're getting the numbers that we're expecting, and so on. And the way we often do that is to output data down into the console down here. Now, there isn't any data down in there right now, but there will be soon. And to do that, we use the print command, which looks like this. And then inside the print command, we put some quotation marks, either single or double, and then we type whatever string we want to output. So in this case, we'll say, Welcome to Python 101. That means you. Okay, and if we run this, we'll see that it outputs the text without the quotation marks and without the print around it. So the print statement is a way to tell the computer, please print the stuff that I put inside the quotation marks. Okay, and when Python reads our code, let's copy this. It does it in the same way that you read, at least if you read Western languages. So it reads top to bottom and left to right. So if we add a two here and run it, you'll see that we have two rows. We have welcome to Python 101. And then the second row is the second row that I typed. Now, if I move these so that I put this row above the first one, you'll see that it turns around. And that's important to remember because when you're writing code, you want to make sure that you're writing in the same direction that you're reading or and also that the computer is reading because otherwise you might be trying to use something that doesn't exist yet. So for instance, if we create a hammer, create hammer, copy it, and then afterwards we use the hammer, that will look quite good. So first we create the hammer and then we use the hammer. Now it would get really weird if we tried to do this. First we use the hammer 
and then recreate the hammer. Use hammer, create hammer. That's kind of impossible, right? Because you can't use the hammer until you've created it. So let's get rid of that. And then when you're executing, you can either press this green button over here to run your code, or you can use the control S shortcut, or on a Mac, the command S shortcut. Now as your very first assignment, I want you to write a print statement that creates some nails in the right place and then modify the use statement that we have here so that we also use the nails with the hammer. So give that a dot and I'll be back with the solution shortly. Great, so did you try that? I hope you did, and that goes for all the exercises in this course. When there's an exercise, try to do the exercise. Don't just wait for me to come up with the solution because you're going to learn so much more and it's going to stick for so much longer and it'll be so much more fun. So here's a way to do this. So let's copy this. And always in programming, there are many ways to solve the same problem. The way that I show is just going to be one of many ways of solving a problem. And that's something to keep in mind. So just because I write it doesn't mean that it's right. If you solve the problem in a different way, kudos to you. You've solved the problem. All right, so let's create some nails. And then let's use hammer and nails. Let's run that. And there we go. We created nails, create hammer, and then we use hammer and nails. Awesome. I'll see you in the next tutorial. When we're programming, we often work with a lot of data. Sometimes we want to save this data, or maybe we calculate some stuff that we want to save and use later. For that, we use something called variables. And a variable you can view a bit like a box with a label on it. Imagine that you have all your shoes, and you put them inside a brown box, and you put a label outside on the box that says shoes. And every time you ask the computer for your shoes, it gives you the box with all your shoes in it. That's basically how a variable works. So here's a story, we print, about Eric. So his mother is getting this note from school, and Eric had a plan to go to a party this weekend. And he's failing six subjects. Eric will need to redo six courses. Eric is doing well in geography. Well, that's nice. But I guess he's not going to get to go to this party. So what can we do as his slightly unethical friend to help this out? Well, we could rewrite the note that he's getting home. We could, for instance, go in and change these things like we could change the six to a two we can change this six to a two and we could change these things but let's say this was a really really long letter or maybe it was a whole book and we want to change the name of a character or something like that so how would we go about doing that well this is where variables come in handy and concatenating strings and i will show you how to do this so let's start by creating a variable and when we create a variable in python we use small caps so, whoops, failed subjects, we'll call the variable, and we'll set that equals to. And when we assign variables, the equal sign is not the kind of equal sign that you use in math. It's actually an assignment operator. So a better way to see it, instead of saying failed subjects equals six, uh, you should see it as failed subjects gets the number six. So we put the number six inside our failed subjects box. Okay, so that's how that works. And then we are going to put that inside this story. How do we do that? Well, we start by closing off this string here using a plus sign, which tells the computer to add on whatever we put after that. We remove the subjects and then we'll copy this because we're lazy. We don't want to make mistakes. Failed subjects. And then we will finish off with another plus sign and then the end of the sentence, which should have a space. And then we'll copy this part here and we'll paste that into the next one where we have six as well. Add a space. There we go. So now we have changed the strings to contain the variable that we're using. So let's try and run this and see what happens. So we still get the same result because we haven't changed the variable, but let's change it. And we see here that the failing six, we should have had a space there. So let's change it to two. That's a lot better, isn't it? Run it again. And now we see that Eric is only failing two subjects, but maybe it's still not good enough. So we should maybe change this further. So it turns out Eric has a brother and his brother's name is John. Now, unfortunately for John, we're this unethical friend, so we're now going to put the blame on John. 
So let's take this, copy it, and replace this Eric with failed subjects. And you're saying, why failed subjects? Just, we're going to change it to name. There we go. Do the same thing with the, this one. Actually, we don't need those. And then we place it here as well. There, so what we've done is replace these strings with the variables that we just created. So Eric should now have turned into John. Let's see if that works. So now it turns out that Mrs. Badger has the message that your son John is failing two subjects. John will need to redo two courses, and John is doing well in geography. So this is looking good. I think we're going to be able to get Eric to come to that party. However, we're not quite happy yet. Our evil friend isn't done yet. So now what we can do is variables can be reassigned at any time during your program. So we can reassign the value of name down here to be Eric. And what do you think is going to happen now? Let's see. Exactly. So things are looking a lot better for Eric. And it looks like he might be going to that party. So I'll see you next time. Let's talk about the basic data types of Python. So in our previous program, where we learned about variables, we ended up with this code. And all the blue parts here are a data type called strings. And the way you tell a string is by the fact that it's surrounded by two quotation marks at the end. It doesn't matter if you use double quotes or single quotes. They are equal in value. So this is a string, and even the space here is part of the string. Basically, that's alphanumeric characters you can get from the keyboard, and they are treated as characters. They're not treated as numbers. If you want a number, you input a number, and you just don't use the quotes. So that is now something called an integer. So an integer is a whole number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And of course, sometimes we want to have, or most of the time, we might want to have decimal numbers, and those are called floats. So now I've turned this integer into a float, a floating point number. Another type of data that we have is something called a Boolean. Boolean. And a Boolean is a data type that can take on the value true or false, only those two values. And we use those a lot in programming when we want to control how our program runs or when we want to check for different things. We don't use them that often in, in real life, but we use them a lot in programming. So an example in this case might be, is going to party, spelled correctly. There we go. Is going to party equals, now in the beginning of our story, that probably would have been false. At the end of our story, it probably would have been true, which was better for Eric. Not so good for John, because he probably had false. Until Monday, at least, when his mother found out what actually happened, and Eric would be in real trouble. But that's a different story. So when we name variables, we obviously shouldn't do what I did there. It needs to be one word, and we use underscores between the words and don't use capitalization, at least in Python. And you can also use camel casing, which would be this type of writing, where you capitalize every new word. But the standard in Python is to use underscores between the words. So there we go. Now, I said that it doesn't matter if you use double quotes or single quotes, and that's correct. And then there are some cases when you get into trouble and don't know exactly what you're going to do and how to handle it. And here is an example of that. So let's say you have a variable where you want to store the word it's. So you write it's. And if you take a look at the code now, only the it has turned blue. The s is white, and it shouldn't be because we want all of it to be the string. But Python is not understanding us, and that's because this thing is being interpreted as the end of the string. So we need somehow to tell Python that it's not the end of the string, that it needs to use the quotes at the end as the actual end of the string. So the way we can do it here is to change this to double quotes, and at the end, double quotes, and now it's seen as a string and it will be interpreted that way. There's another way to do it, which is called escaping. And there's an escape character in most programming languages, and it's the backslash. So if we were to do the same thing, so here, copy that. This time we want to use the single quotes. We don't want to change the double to double quotes. So it's now broken again. And by inserting a backslash, tells Python, the character I have after this, I want to actually use the literal character, nothing else. So this tells Python, 
that after the backslash, I want to use the character that you see. Don't interpret it as something smart, just do what I tell you. So that's how escaping characters works. So when you're working with this, you sometimes want to know what data type you're dealing with. And there's a command for that called type. And you input whatever variable you have into it and you get an answer. So I'll show you an example right here. So here are four statements and we'll get rid of these for the moment. Now, if we run these, we'll find out what type we're dealing with. So we have a string, hello, we have a number, one, we have another number, 1.64, and we have true. So how are those interpreted? Well, the first one is a string, the second one is an int or an integer, next one is a float, and the last one is a boolean. So now we'll go back to our previous program, paste that back in. Remember I said that you could use the numbers? Well, you can't mix numbers or different data types any way you want. There are some rules around how you can do that. So for instance, you can't put numbers. So if I make this a number, you can't put that inside the string or you can't mix it with the strings. So the way to get around that is something called typecasting or casting or changing a type. Basically, you're telling the type. So in this case, it's an integer. I'm telling the integer, hey, integer, I don't want you to be an integer anymore. I want you to be a string. And the way you do that is by using the shorthand, str, and you encapsulate this like that. And we do the same thing down here. Now it will use the actual number. So let's run that. Now, if I don't have this casting, if we remove this, it fails. It actually says it can't convert int to string implicitly. So I have to do it explicitly. String to change the integer to a string. And the th same thing would happen if I put this like that. So that was a run through of data types and typecasting. And I'll leave you with a few examples. So here, if we cast 1 into an integer, we will get 1. If we cast 2.5 into an integer, we'll get 2. So it removes the decimal. If we cast the string 3 into a decimal, we'll get 3. And here's a special case. If we cast 3.4, the decimal in string format, into an int, it's actually going to return an error. So we'll come back to that a bit later. And if we cast 1 into a float, we'll get a decimal number, so 1.0. 2.5 into a float, 2.5. 3 as a string into a float becomes 3.0. And 4.23 into a float becomes 4.23. So that's the case we had up here, but here it works. Then if we cast 80s, the string, into a string, we of course get the same thing. 22 into a string, we get 22 as a string, so it's no longer a number. 3.01 becomes the string 3.01. Again, it's no longer a number. So let's try and run these and see if the results work. And they do. So now let's go back to the one we had up here. So it turns out that you can't actually do this. If we run it, error. And the reason is, this is a decimal string, and we're turning it into an integer. And that's not an allowed operation. You can do it with a float, as we did down here. So what you can do to handle this is to first cast it into a float, and then cast it into an integer. And then we add the variable, c1, and we see that we get another 3. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time. Hey, and welcome to this exercise on variables and data types. So what we're going to do this time is try to create an app. And the app is, say, for a hardware store, and the hardware store needs to keep track of a few things. So I'm going to paste that in here as comments, and that will give you a chance to see what comments look like. So here's the text. Just to show you, they are comments because they start with a hashtag. So now it's a normal text. Now it's a comment. So create appropriate variables for item name, the name of whatever the item is, the price, and how many you have in stock. So that's your job. So create three variables and choose the right data type for them. Okay, I'm hoping you've tried that exercise. So now I'm gonna give you one alternative to how you could do this. So let's start with the item name. So why don't we just call that item name? And that will get, we'll uh, give it a name, which should probably be a string. So let's say widget. That's the fantastic name of our item. So next step, the price. Why don't we call that price? Don't have to make it harder than it is. And the price could be maybe not always an integer. Maybe it's going to be some decimal number. So let's make that a float. And the way we make it a float is just simply to put a comma in it. That automatically makes it a float. And the next step, how many do we have in stock or our inventory? Let's call that inventory. 
And in this case, we can't have half ones or whole ones because they're widgets. So let's say that's an integer. And let's just say we have 100 of them. Now as a next step, why don't we try and print this as well? So let's print all of them. Let's say print item name, comma, price, comma, inventory. What do you think that's going to print? Let's find out. We get widget 23 and a half and 100. Now another thing we could have done is to use a boolean. So we could have said is in inventory and set that to true. And then we could have had a flag that told us whether or not we had any inventory at all. But of course, we wouldn't know how many we had in inventory. So that would be sort of useful, but not entirely. So that covers that exercise. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Doing basic arithmetic operations in Python, and for that matter, any other programming language, is very, very common. So having a firm grasp on how to do it is definitely a plus plus, just not in Python. After this short tutorial, there's a good chance you will be very awesome at this. Are you ready? And if you just heard me say plus plus before and have absolutely no idea why I said that, or perhaps racking your brain, don't worry. Eventually that penny will drop, Google might be your friend, and you'll realize just what a lame pun that was. And if you did, well, I guess that's just time you'll never get back. Sorry. Anywho, here we go. So let's paste in a few examples. So here we have two variables, a gets six and b gets two. And then we're gonna print out the results of various things. So the first one is addition right here. And you see in Python, we write addition as a plus b, and we would expect the result to be eight, right? Subtraction, we write as we would expect, a minus b. Multiplication, a star b. Division, float division, this is what we would normally call division. So if you divide three by two, you get one and a half, a divided by b. Then we have something called floor division here. Now floor division is sort of an artifact from older versions of Python, where it used to be that if you divided three by two, you would get the answer one, not one and a half. So floor division actually does that old type of division. So if you divide three by two, you will get one, not one and a half. Then we have modulus, and modulus isn't one of the transformers. It's actually an operation we use in computer science and in math that gives you the remainder of the division. So for instance, if we divide 6 by 2, we get 3, and the modulus will be 0. If we divide 7 by 2, we'll get 1, because if you divide 7 by 2, you'll get two groups of 3, and then you have one left over. So it's that leftover remainder that's shown in the modulus. Then we have exponent, which is a to the power of b. All right, so let's run this first, and then we'll change the numbers and show you some interesting stuff. So here we go. The addition is 8, the subtraction is 4, the multiplication is 12, division 3.0, division floor, same, 3, the modulus is 0, and the exponent is 36. So that's to be expected, right? But it's not very interesting, because the division floor and the modulus are both showing the same result or nothing. So let's change the numbers. Let's say we have 10 and divide that by 3. Now we'll see some of the more interesting bits. So now the addition is 13, subtraction is 7, multiplication is 30, the division is 3.3333333, and then weirdly, the last number is a 5. Don't ask me why it's like that. Floor division turns out to be 3. The modulus is 1, so we're dividing 10 by 3, and the remainder will be 1, right? Because you have three groups of 3. And the exponent, when you do 10 to the power of 3, that's 10 times 10 times 10, is 1,000. And those are basically the arithmetic operators that you need to understand to be able to become a master of Python. You might need to learn some other stuff as well, but we'll get to that. Talk to you later. Okay, time to talk about strings. So we use strings a lot in programming. We take them apart, we put them together, we create new ones, we delete old ones, just lots of things. And I'll introduce you to some of the basic concepts when it comes to using strings. So as you see, we've already printed, we've already run this statement. We have a message, welcome to Python 101 strings. Then we run the print message and you see the output down in the console. So one of the things we can do is print a message multiple times. And you could do that, by concatenating the message. So just by typing a plus sign and then the message again. So if we run that, 
we'll get the string, just the two strings put together with no space in between them. So that's one way of doing that. You can achieve exactly the same thing by multiplying the string, which seems a bit weird. But if we multiply that by two, we'll get exactly the same result. So no difference, the strings are just put together. So there's another way we can do this, and that is to separate these by a comma and say message, message. So what's going to happen then? Now you see a space has been inserted after the strings. So the comma does that. And this, this is actually a statement you can use inside print, and I think you use it in input as well. But I'm not sure if you can put together strings in a variable by doing this. But at least now you know three different ways of multiplying strings. So there we go. So another thing we might want to do is change the casing of the string. So there are some different ways we can do that. We can say upper which will, and then um, parentheses, nothing inside the parentheses. If we run that, the whole string will become uppercase. And you might guess that we can do the same thing by saying lower, like that. And that is going to give us the whole string in lowercase. But we can do more. We can say capitalize. It will actually make sure that only the first word in the string is capitalized. So then we get that result. So as you see, it even changed the capitalization of the word Python. It's now in lowercase. But the first letter, which was previously in lowercase, is now in uppercase. Now, if you wanted all the different words to have uppercase, there's actually a function for that as well. And that function is called title. That will give us this result. So each of the words are capitalized. Now it actually fails sometimes, for instance, when we have a, an apostrophe in what we're writing. So I'll introduce one up here. So let's say we have it's, and now I've messed up the string as well, so I need to introduce an escape character to make it easy. There we go. So if I run it now, and you take a look at the result, you'll see that welcome to it's, and then there's an apostrophe, and it interprets the S as a new word. So the S also gets capitalized, which is not optimal, but it sort of works, except when you have that situation. Okay, so those are some basic things that we can do with uh, changing the aspects of the string. So let's remove those and let's try some other stuff. Let's find out some information about the string. So for instance, let's say we want to find out how long the string is. And we'll also get rid of this because it's just going to be annoying. There we go. So print message. And what I want now is to find out the length of the message. There's a command called len, which is short for length, which will give us the length of the string. So let's run that. It's 30 characters long. Great. So another thing we can find out is we can count the number of instances of a certain word or a letter. And we do that by the command count. And that looks like this. So let's say message dot count. And what do we want to count? We want to count the instances of Python. We'll run that. How many instances are there? There are zero. And that's because it's case sensitive. So it's now only looking for lowercase Python. So if we change it to uppercase, it will find one instance. Now, of course, we could search for something else. We could search for just the letter O and see how many we find. There are three O's in Python 101 or in the whole string. Great. So that's how you measure the length of a string and then how you count how many instances of something you have in the string. But we can do more stuff. We're going to go into something called slicing strings. Slicing. So slicing strings is getting parts of a string and returning them. So let me give you an example. So the way strings in Python are numbered is in the following way. The numbering starts at zero. So the first character is zero, or the first position, then it's two, well, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And it's the same thing for lists in Python. So to access this, first we'll need to comment this out so that it doesn't get run. So the way to access this is to use square brackets. I'll input square brackets, number zero, and that will give us the letter W. If I use number five, it will give us M, because that's the sixth position, which is number five. Now, you can also use negative uh, indexes on this. So for instance, is if, for instance, if I take minus one, this will give me the last character. That gives me S. If I take minus three, it will give me the n. So that's second from the last as it starts at minus one is the last one. There's another way to use this. So if I say two colon, the colon will tell Python to grab everything after the uh, 
number two string. So in this case, if I say, if I do this, I will get almost the whole thing. I'll come to Python 101 strings. If I specify an endpoint, now it gets a bit more interesting. So let's say uh, 15, see where that winds up. Welcome to Pyth. So that's, let's do another one that we can count. So there. So now I've asked for two to seven, and two, that specifies the second position. Seven is the seventh one, but it's not inclusive. So it takes up to that, but it doesn't actually take the seventh one, as you'll see from the outcome that we have. We have position two, three, four, five, and six, but not number seven. That's kind of important to keep in mind. And then lastly, if I turn it around, remove the two, Python will now assume that I want everything starting from zero. So this will give me the whole string up until the sixth one. So welcome. All right, let's start with that and continue with some more string information in the next tutorial. See you then. Okay, great. Welcome to your first exercise. So here's the exercise. From the string, welcome to Python 101 strings, extract text and then create, print a new string that says one welcome ring to Tyler. Every first letter in a word should be capitalized, so it should be in title format. And then the second exercise, which we haven't gone through, print the same string backwards. Google is your friend. So give that a shot and see how it turns out. I'll come back with the solution in a second. Great, so did you try that out? Let's see what we can do. Let's start by creating a variable for our new string. So we'll call that message one. And then we're gonna print message one as we work along so that we can see that we're doing the right thing. So let's start concatenating a string. So we'll start with message. I think we're gonna be using that a lot. So message, what's the first thing we need? We need the number one. So that's at position 17 maybe, let's see. We'll print, that was empty. So that means it's probably 18, so there we go. Great, one. And then we need to add to that a space since we wanna have one space. Next up, we want welcome. And we actually have the word welcome, right? So we can use a slicing method here. So message, we wanna slice from the first letter to the eighth. The reason we want eight is because we also want the space so that we don't have to add a space here before the next one. So then we grab another slice now we want ring and ring actually exists as a word inside the word strings right so we can grab that so that's if number one is 18 it's 19 20 21 22 23 24 25 it starts at 25 to 29 let's check what we have so far one welcome ring we add some more now we need to add a space because there wasn't one there and then we add the word two which we find at position eight to eleven Eight to 11. And actually, if we print that, we'll see it works. But do we really need this space? We could do start at seven. And we get the space before it too. So there we go. Then, then we have to pick the different letters to create the name Tyler. So let's do that. So we've got message T is in position 13. We've got, we've got Y in position 12. And we have L in position two. E in position one, and the R we can grab from the fifth position from the end. So plus minus five. Let's try out our string. One welcome ring to Tyler. Awesome. And then we need to capitalize it. So let's do that. How do you do that? Well, you say title. One welcome ring to Tyler. Fantastic. And then as our second exercise, we're going to print this string backwards. So how do you do that? Well, there's a slicing trick and it's really simple. Just haven't gone through it yet. So let's try it. It's print message one. And here comes the slicing trick, colon, colon, minus one. That prints a string backwards. So let's do that. And let's also make it in title format. So everybody's happy. And there you go. Now you've learned a new trick on slicing strings. Talk to you later. Okay, let's continue working with strings. So the first thing I thought I'd show you is how to do multi-line strings. Now, unfortunately, this is one of those things that Scrimba is not going to support, or rather maybe it's the Brython plugin that doesn't support it. But uh, what you do to get a multi-line string is something along these lines. 
You use triple quotes to start the string, and then you just use return to break the lines, and then you use triple quotes at the end. And if I now execute this, it's actually just going to print on one line, which is not at all what we want, but it's what we get in this version of Scrimba. So you'll just have to trust me on this and maybe go to Replit or some other place and try it in a real Python environment, and then you'll see what it looks like. So let's go back to where we were. There. As our next step, we're going to try some find and replace. So we'll start with find. We'll go in here and we'll say print find. And now we're looking for the H character. So we find it the first H at position 14, which is the 15th position. So that's one way we can then later reference it. Or if we look for, for instance, Python, it starts at position 11. Okay, so the other thing we can do is actually replace. So let's go in back here, change the find to replace. And now we'll replace Python with the syntax. Now it takes two parameters. The first one is what we're looking for. The second one is what we want to replace it with. So we'll replace it with Java. We'll run that. So we now have a string that says, welcome to Java 101. Or we could say, see. So that's how you use replace. Now, one thing to remember about this is that strings are what are called immutable. So that means that you can't change them when you've created them. So you need to save them into a new instance. So if I want to save this result, I can't save it in the existing message one. I can create a new one or I can just set it to a new variable. So I could do this, message one equals message replace Python with C. And then print message one. So if I run this, we now get the same result. We need to save it into a new variable. We could have also saved it into the same variable like this. That would also work. The next thing we're going to try out is something called membership. So let's look at the following. So now we're going to print and we'll say Python in message. Now what this is going to do is check if Python exists in message. Let's try that. It prints true, so it does exist in there. If we want to check if it doesn't exist, then we can say not in message, and we'll print false. And lastly, we'll cover something called string formatting. So previously, you remember we concatenated strings. Now I'm going to paste in an example here. So we have a variable that has the value Terry. We have a color, red, and then we've concatenated a string. And then we'll run a print statement as well. So we'll run print message. So what does this give us? It says Terry loves color red. Now when we get longer strings that we concatenate, it can get very messy to keep track of what's where. So there's a function in Python that allows us to format strings in a nicer format and make it easier for us to read and not make as many mistakes. So I'll show you that. So we can achieve the same result with a different formatting that looks like this. So we'll create a different one called message1 and it starts with an F and then we start a string. In this case we start with the square brackets and then what we do is we take our variables and insert them in curly brackets and this makes it a lot easier to read and we don't have the plus signs and the extra quotation marks floating around the string. So here we have name loves the color and then new curly brackets color lower because we have those in capital letters, or maybe we don't, but we don't know. So we want these to be in lower. Let's make the same change up here. There we go. And then we'll run another print statement. Print message one. As you see, this gives us exactly the same result. And now we just have the Terry bit to change. So we've got name here. And what do we want to change that to? So here's your first assignment on this. Make the name Terry capitalized so did you try that out? So how do you do that? Well, there's one way. Run it. And there we go. So those are some further things you can do with strings. I'll talk to you later. How do you capture user input? Well, stick around and I'll show you. So now we're going to try some 
user input. And actually, Scrimbud doesn't support the input box properly. So you won't see it in the screencast. I mean, I see it on my computer when I run this, and you'll see it if you test the code on your computer, but you can't see it in the screencast. So you'll see me writing something, and then something will pop up in the console at the bottom, but you won't actually see the data that I input into the box. The way you can see it is just to pause or stop and try the code yourself just after or before I do, and then you'll get the same result, and you'll see the pop-up box. Fortunately, not my fault. I'm sure Scrimbo will handle it at some point when they start supporting Python properly, but they don't, so we can't really complain either. So here we go. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask our user for their name. So we create a variable, name, name gets, and then we type input, then we'll type something. Let's try what is your name, question mark. There we go. Maybe a colon as well. Now when I run this, I'm going to get an input box where I can input my name, which we won't, you won't see. And then it will print name. Let's see how that works. So I now see a box and I'm typing a name. Let's pretend that my name is Eric. There we go. Eric is now typed out. But that's not fun enough. So let's do something with that name. Let's add something to it like hello. So now we've added hello and the name. And let's add exclamation point at the end. There we go. And we'll run that. So again, type the name. Hello, Eric. Awesome. So now what else can we do? Well, let's add some more information. Let's ask for their age. So age gets input. What is your age? And they give us some kind of answer. And then we will add that here. So hello, Eric, and then we'll write some more. You are plus, and then we'll add our age, age, and then we'll add more text, years old, period. And we want a space here as well. So let's try that. I'm running it. I get a box, ask for my name, Eric, and it asks my age. What's your age? Let's say I'm 37, not, but let's pretend. So it says, hello, Eric, you are 37 years old. Awesome, right? So this is one way to get some input. Now let's try and build something more interesting. Let's try and build a calculator. See how that works. So in a calculator, we want to ask for a number. So we have number one, and we'll ask the user for a number. So input, and we will say, enter a digit. There we go. And then we want another number. So number two gets input enter a second number and then we'll do something with those numbers we'll add them together so we'll say answer gets num1 plus num2 and then we will print the answer print answer what happens if we run this do you think well actually it's not going to work and do you know why well, we're entering a digit up here, and it's going to be a string. And we're entering a digit here, which is going to be another string. So we need to convert these to some kind of number. So let's typecast them into a float. That looks a lot better. So let's try and run that. So it's asking me for a digit, let's say 4, and then another one, 12. The answer is 16.0. Wonderful. So that's a way to get some user input, and uh, see you next time. Hey, welcome to the exercise. Now we're going to do a user input exercise and flex our programming muscles. So here on the slide, we have the exercise. We're going to create a distance converter converting kilometers to miles. So we're going to take two inputs from the user, the first name and the distance in kilometers. Then we're going to print a greeting where we greet the user by name and we show the kilometer and mile values. And one mile is equal to 1.609 kilometers. Or and then as a hint, Make sure you, we use the correct types for calculating in print, and then remember to capitalize the name. So let's remove this and go up here, and I'll paste this as some help. Why don't you give that a shot, and I'll be back in a second to show you one way of solving this problem. All right, I'm sure you did awesomely at this task. So let's take a look at this and what we need to do. So the first thing we need to do is take two inputs from user. So that's two inputs. Let's take the first one, the name. Let's just call that name. So name gets input, enter your name. 
Then as the second input, we're going to get the distance in kilometers. So we'll call that distance underscore kilometers. And that's another input. And we'll say enter distance in kilometers. And then we're going to calculate the distance in miles. So we'll create a variable out of that, distance miles, which is equal to a float. So we need to convert the number that we get in the input box because when we create an input and capture it it's always a string so we could convert that in the input line when we get distance kilometers or we can do it now so in this case we're doing it right here so we'll convert to a float the distance in kilometers and then we'll divide that by 1.609 and the next step we need to do is write a print statement where we greet the user by name. So let's do a print and we'll use an F string. So we'll say F and then we'll say I and the name and we'll capitalize that. So we'll say title and the curly brackets, exclamation point, space, open a new curly bracket for the variable that we're going to put here. So we'll use distance kilometers, close the curly bracket. The text KM for kilometer is equivalent to then we have the next variable distance miles close the variable and the word miles period so that should work let's see what happens if we run it we get an input box enter the name we'll say john and we'll say 10 kilometers so it answers hi john 10 kilometers is equivalent to 6.215 and a lot of decimals so probably we might want to round that number, don't you think? So the way to round it is to go in here to distance in miles and round that number. We simply say round parentheses and then after the variable, put a comma and then how many decimals we want to see. Let's say one. And then we close the parentheses. There we go. And let's run it again. So we'll say John and let's say 14 kilometers. Hi, John. 14 kilometers is equivalent to 8.7 miles. And now we've solved that issue. Awesome. So I'll see you in the next cast. Now we'll take a look at lists. So lists are used very often in programming, and they're very similar to variables. So a variable can hold a number or a string or a Boolean or something else. And a list can hold multiple instances of these. So you might have a list of 500 names or 500 numbers or maybe even 500,000 numbers. And so they're very practical. And the way you create a list is, again, very similar to how you create a variable. I'll give you an example. Let's say I have some friends. Friends and friends get, and then we use square brackets to hold the friends. So we'll have our first friend, John. Then we insert a comma. Next one, Michael. Terry. Eric. And Graham. We finish with another square bracket and we're done. So that is the list friends. And now if we print that, we see that we print the list. Now very similar to a variable, the way we access the different parts of a list is by using an index. And it's the same way that we access content in a string. So the first one is position zero. The second one is position one. Third one is position two, and so on. So that's how you access values in a list, very similar to values in a string. So one way you can access parts of a string is to actually print the index that you want. If I input one, I'm going to get the Michael, and we printed Michael. If I want two, I can say friends, square bracket, and then maybe number four. So now it gets Michael and Graham. There's another way similar to what we did with strings and slicing, where you can ask for different parts of the list. So let's say print friends square bracket one. And again, it will print Michael. We can then use negative indices like minus one, which will give us the last number. We can use the slicing syntax using the colon. So we can say from number two to number four, but not by printing the actual number four. So we get Terry and Eric. And again, exactly as we did with strings, if we don't have a first number, it will assume that we mean from the start of the string. So we get John, Michael, Terry, and Eric. If we don't input anything, we get the whole list. We can also get some different information about the list, like for instance, how long it is. And the way you do that is by using the same command we did in strings, len. We run that. And we find out that there are five elements in the list. What if we want to find out at what position Eric is? Well, we can say print friends 
index Eric. And that tells us that Eric is at index 3. We can also count the number of occurrences of Eric. We can do that by using the count function. So those are the very basics of strings, and we'll continue with some more advanced commands in the next tutorial. See you then. So we're back with our friends list, and I've also added a cars list. So those are model numbers of cars. I'm sure you can guess the brands. And one thing I didn't mention last time is that lists can actually contain a mix of different things. They can contain a mix of strings, numbers, booleans, and so on. You can mix them any way you want. Okay, so I thought we'd start out with some sorting. So in order to sort a list in place, which means that we're not creating a new list, we're sorting the one we have. You say friends dot sort, and then we'll print that as well so we can compare the two. So now it's going to sort it in ascending order. So as we now see, we start with the first letter and then we have sorted it in the right direction. If we want to change the order, we can say friends dot sort reverse equals true. And the capital T is important because it's indicating a true statement for the Boolean. Okay, then we'll print that. Now you've sorted that in descending order. Now there's another function called reverse, which reverses the string. So it's not a reverse sorting in descending order. It just reverses the order of the original string. So you, the way you use that is friends.reverse. And you get the original string reversed compared to how it was before. So those are ways to sort lists. We could, of course, do the same thing with the numbers. If we change this to cars, we see that we've sorted the list of cars. Okay, well, that's great. So now let's get on to some other stuff. One thing we might want to know about a list is what the minimum, maximum, and maybe even the sum of a list are. So let's try some of those. Let's say print min of cars. So that gives us 130. So that's the lowest number in that list. If we change it to max, we'll get the highest number, which is 911. And if we wanted to sum them, we can do that. We get 2,952, completely irrelevant number. So you don't always just want to do things out of the blue. The sum wouldn't work in the friends list. And I'm not sure even what would happen if we do min on the friends. Oh, okay, it does work. So that gives you the lowest value of the list or the first letter. So that means we should be able to do max as well. Yeah, so I learned something. I've honestly never done that before. So now let's continue with modifying lists. So get rid of this, go up here. When we're working with lists, oftentimes we want to add something to the list. So for instance, we might want to add another friend. And the way we can do that is by using either an append statement, an insert statement, or we can just specify the index where we want to input something. So we'll start with the easiest one. We just add another friend to our list. So we will say friends, append, then we input the name of the new friend, Terry G. We run that. We now say that we have an extra friend called Terry G at the end. So there are other ways we could add Terry G. We could insert him at a certain point. We would then use the insert statement. And we specify the position where we ins want to insert him. So one, that inserts him at position one. So let's take a look at our list. So as we see, Terry G is now at position one, which is the second position in the string, or index number one, I should say. Another way we can do this is to use the index directly to specify. So then we would just specify friends and square brackets, the position where we want him, say 2, and then we set that position to get Terry G as a value. Now, as you notice, we now removed the old Terry and replaced that Terry with Terry G. So now we've not appended the list or added to it. We've actually changed one of the values. Another thing we might want to do is extend the list. I put two lists together. So we can do that by saying friends, extend, and then we specify the list we want to extend with. 
we run that. Now we get a long list where everything has been added together in one long list. The next thing we might want to do is completely remove things without putting something new in there. Then we can use the remove, pop, or delete functions, and those are slightly different, and I'll run through them. So first, we might want to just remove something, and the way we can remove something is to specify which one we want to remove. So let's say friends, remove, we'll specify Terry. So we remove Terry. Now you see we have a list of four names, and Terry is gone. Instead of using remove, we can use the command pop. And pop does something slightly differently to remove. So when you remove something, you just remove it. When you use the pop function, you actually pop it into memory so that you can use it in your program. So if I want to specify pop, this will, by default, grab the last or remove the last name in the array. So if we run it, we see that the array has now lost Graham, but Graham has actually been popped, so we can use that name. You can also specify what you want to pop. So if you want to pop number two, you can do that. Now I've popped the second index, that was Terry, or I could pop minus one, so this is the same kind of naming as we use when we're slicing strings or accessing indexes. So pop is really useful. Those are some ways to remove individual parts of the list. We can also remove the whole list. We can start by just clearing the list. The way you do that is by specifying friends, clear. We now have an empty list. But if we want to remove it completely, we would say delete del friends. Now, as you see, there is nothing to print at all anymore. It's just gone. So we get an error. We can do the same thing if we just want to delete parts of the friends. So if we use del friends and we specify two, we still have the list, but we now remove index two, i.e. the third object in the list. So del is a bit more powerful, so be careful with using that. And lastly, let's get on to copying lists. And I'll show three different ways that you can copy lists. So the first one, we can let's say we have a new friends list. New friends equals friends. And the first way we can specify is to say square brackets and colon. That creates a new list and we'll print this one as well. So we'll print print new friends. We've now created a copy of that. Another way you can specify this is to say new friends copy. Remove the square bracket part. This will do the same thing. It will copy and give you a new list. And the third way you can copy a list is to say list friends. Great. I hope that wasn't too confusing and that you now know how to manipulate lists. I'll talk to you next time. Welcome to this exercise on lists. So in this exercise, we have a lemonade business, and we're going to keep track of our best and worst days and our combined total for those two days. So in the back here, we have three lists, the sales of week one, the sales of week two, and then a list called sales, which is just empty. So here's the exercise. We sell lemonade over two weeks. The lists show us the number of lemonades sold per week. Profit for each lemonade sold is a dollar and a half. We're going to add another day of sales to week two by capturing a number as an input. Then we're going to combine the two lists into a list called sales. Calculate and print how much we've earned on the best day, on the worst day, and then separately and in total. So a total of three prints. All right, so give that a shot. I'll reduce the slide over here, and you can look at it anytime you want while you're working. So have a crack at that, and I'll be back shortly. All right, how did that go? I'm sure it went awesomely. Okay, so let's look at what we need to do. The first thing we need to do is get that new day of input. So let's call that data new day. And that gets input, and let's ask the user for some input. We'll say enter number lemonades for new day. So here we'll capture some number in this new day variable. So then let's append that to the week two sales. So that's sales week two append. And when we capture the new day from an input, it comes in as a string. Remember, all input is captured as strings. So we need to convert this into a number. So let's convert it into an integer. We could convert it into floats as well, but since they're going to be whole numbers, it doesn't make much sense. So let's just make it an integer. 
There we go. We've made new day into an integer and we've appended it to sales. That's great. So the next thing we're going to do now is combine the two lists. And we're going to do that in two different ways. And I'll show you first this one. We're going to use the extend method first. So sales is that empty list we have. So we're going to extend that with sales of week one first. Now it would be nice if we could extend it immediately with week two, but for some reason that doesn't work and that's a bit annoying. So we have to do the same thing again. So we'll copy this because we're lazy and don't want to make mistakes. And all we have to change is week two. So now we've extended it twice. So that's one way of doing it by using the extend method. Another way to do it is to simply add the lists. So sales gets sales week one plus sales week two. Now I see an obvious benefit to this. We could add sales week three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And if we did that with the extend method, we would have 10 rows. There are some other methods in Python, of course, but we haven't talked about those. So I'm not going to cheat and use those here. So I actually kind of prefer this one, but let's comment that out for now. And I'll show you later that it works. All right. So what's the next step? Now we're going to sort that combined list, the sales list. And the reason we want to sort it, so sales, sort is so that the first number will be the lowest number and we're going to grab that for the worst day and then the last number in the list is going to be the highest number so that's the best day so we're going to grab that as well so that's the next step so we're going to grab the numbers for worst day prof or profit and that gets sales and then we're going to slice so we'll get the first position, which is zero, right? We're going to multiply that by 1.5, which is one and a half dollars per lemonade sold. Okay, and then we're going to copy this and change that to best. And in this case, we're going to use the last position in the list. So that's minus one, remember? And then we're going to do some prints. So we'll print an F string and we'll say worst day profit colon add a dollar sign. So the worst day prof, close that curly bracket and we'll copy this print statement and then we'll get the best day. Change that to best day. Then for our last print, which is our combined days, so the best day and the worst day. So, so we'll call that combined profit. So that's the worst day profit plus best day prof. There we go. So this should be our code. Let's give it a shot and run it and see what happens. So we get a text box. I'm going to enter 10 lemonades for that extra day. And here's our result. Worst day profit, best day profit, and combined profit. So now I'm going to show you this thing that we tried up here. So I'm going to uncomment that and comment these two instead. So they are now no longer active. So let's try that code. Again, we'll enter 10 and we get the same result. So that's awesome. That's two different ways of using it. I actually like this plus version better because you can extend with more. So now I'm going to show you one more thing. So here, when we created these worst day and best day with the sales and the slicing of the list, we can actually do that in a different way. Instead of using the slicing, we can say min, so that's the minimum value of sales, and we don't need the slicing then. And then we can say max for this, which is the maximum value. And if we do that, we of course don't need to sort the list, which is useful. So let's try and run that. Again, I get a pop-up box, enter 10, and we get the same result again. So that's fantastic, right? So now we've solved all our problems for our lemonade business, and we can just continue to make money. And you are doing so well. And I'll see you in the next tutorial. Hey, now we're going to take a look at splitting and joining. So sometimes you want to split apart strings that you have, and sometimes you want to take lists or tuples or something else and join them into a string according to your own preferences. Let's start with some data to work with. So there are three variables. We have a string, we have a second string separated by commas, and then we have a list of friends. So we are going to start with the top one, message. What could we do to break this string apart? Well, one thing we could do is turn it into a list by using the list command and then calling message. And that breaks it apart completely. That's not at all what we wanted. So luckily, there's a function called split. And it's actually a method on the string object. So if we run that, it splits our string apart into a list. And it's separated by white spaces. Now this could be written in a different way. You say split, and then you say on what type of character it should split. So let's run that. That gives us exactly the same result. But these functions are actually different, and you'll see that if I introduce some spaces here. So we'll introduce extra spaces. 
we run it again, you'll see that the top one doesn't care that we have multiple spaces or white spaces involved, but the bottom one does. It actually shows those as empty strings. That's not really what we wanted. So that's something you need to keep in mind when you're using these splitting functions. So what are we actually splitting into? Well, if we copy this and ask what the type is and run it, we see that when we split, we create a list. So we're splitting from a string and we are creating a list. So depending on what your string looks like, you can just input whatever it is that the splitting character should be into the split. So in the case of the second one, we want to split on the comma in the CSV file. So let's try that. CSV split on comma, and we'll get rid of this. And this, and run that. Now we've split the comma separated file into a list with the names of our friends. So with that information, I think you can split most any string that you come across, as long as it only needs to be split on one character. Okay, so now we'll move on to our friends list, and we are going to join that into a string. So again, let's try something similar to what we did first with the message. Let's try and turn it into a string. We'll say string friends list. We run that. Now that looks like a list, doesn't it? But it's actually a string, and it's not really what we wanted. We wanted to turn this into a string that looks like a string, that doesn't have the square brackets at the end. So let's try something different. We'll now use the join command, which looks like this. We specify what the joining character is going to be. Let's use a hyphen, period, then we type join, and then the object is the friends list. We run that. Now we get Eric, John, Michael, Terry, and Graham separated by a hyphen. That's excellent. And that is indeed a string. If we wanted to join multiple versions of this and concatenate two strings, we could do that as well. So we could join it twice. This could, of course, be another list. It doesn't have to be this one. If we do that, we get it twice. Okay. Now if we join it on nothing, an empty string, it just joins everything into one long string. Now, given that we know that when we split, we turn something into a list, and when we join, we turn it into a string, that means that if we start out with a string, we could create a list and then go back to a string. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, one example would be if we want to strip out all of the spaces from a string, like the one we have above, the message. So how could we do that? Well, let's try this. We can run print. Now, the first thing we might want to do is split our message on white space. So that turns it into a list. And after we've done that, we want to join it, but we join it with an empty string. Parentheses around that, and closing the parentheses. Now if we run this, it should strip out all the spaces. Let's see how it works. Welcome to Python 101, split and join without spaces. Now there's a more convenient way to do this that doesn't run through join and split, and that's to do print, and this time we will just do message replace, and we replace all the spaces with the empty strings. This should basically do the same thing, and it does. And that's an introduction to using splits and joins. I'll see you next time. Okay, welcome to the exercise. So we have a CSV file, or rather we have a CSV variable, which is filled with names that are separated by commas, but unfortunately also by a colon and a semicolon. So somebody obviously messed up. And our job is to separate it anyway. And we need to turn the CSV variable with the names into a list where we have one name per slot. And then at the end, we're going to print that friends list to prove that we've finished this. So that's your task. Give that a try, and I'll talk to you shortly and show you some ways to do this. Okay, awesome. You're back. I hope that worked. And now I'll show you two different ways that you could solve this. And I'm going to do sort of a roundabout way to walk through it so it's clear. So what we're going to try and do is use this join and split function, which we used before, to do this. So we'll start with the CSV, and we'll start using print statements to make sure that we're doing things correctly. So the first thing we'll try to see what happens if we split on just comma. So there we go, splitting on comma. So what does that give us? Eric, John, Michael, Terry, Graham, Terry G, and Brian, which are not looking too great. So we didn't manage to split that properly. So we'll have to keep working on this. So let's start with one of the ones that's not the final splits. Let's start with the semicolon and split on that. And then after we've done that, let's join on the comma again. So join, parentheses, we need to close that parentheses as well. There we go. What does it look like now? We managed to separate Terry G and Brian, but we still have that colon that we don't want. So let's keep going. Let's copy this. And let's do another split. We'll go in here and split. This time we'll split on the colon. So what's that going to give us? 
Now that's giving us a list and we have managed to split them apart properly. And now we add another, we'll copy this again. We'll add another join at the beginning. So we have join on comma again, and then we need parentheses and we need a parentheses at the end as well. So if we run that, it actually looks good. We now have a string that's separated by commas. So all we have to do now is split that. So we'll copy this again. And we need to do one more split at the end. And we'll say split on the comma that we wanted to do from the beginning. We need to close up all the parentheses properly. So we've got one there. Try that. Now we managed to turn them into a list. So let's get rid of all the ones except the last one. There we go. Run it again. So there's our list. Now we take that list and we put it inside here to create our friends list. And now we're printing the friends list so we can get rid of this. There we go. We've printed it. All right. Awesome. So we've solved that problem. There's another way you could solve this. You could use the replace function that we used before. So we could say print, but this is using replace. So CSV, replace. Now we want to replace the semicolons with commas. And then when we've done that, we want to do a second replace, where we replace all the colons also with commas. So that's going to keep everything still as a string. And then when we're done doing that, we need to split everything. So then at the end, we're going to split everything using a comma. So is that going to work? Let's find out. So a replace has Eric, John, Michael, Terry, Graham, Terry G, and Brian. So that worked as well. Now, probably the main reason to run this exercise is to show you how cumbersome it is to use the split and join and even the replace functions to do these things. Now, there are much better tools for this in Python, especially if you start using regular expressions, and we'll get into that in a future tutorial. One of the reasons to do this is to get you psyched to use it because it's super useful and a lot less work than this is. So I hope you look forward to that. I'll see you next time. Okay, let's talk about tuples. So tuples are lists that you can't change. So we looked at lists before and we've done some things with them. We have a friends list up here and a tuple is actually a list and you can't change it. And they're also slightly faster, probably because you can't change them, remove some complexity that makes the computer handle them faster. So I'll show you an example of what a tuple can look like. I'll use the same list. So we'll call this friends tuple. We have the same people in it. And as you see, the only difference is that instead of square brackets, I'm using regular parentheses to enclose it. And that makes it a tuple. So let's see what we can do with it. We'll paste that in there and we'll change the name to friends tuple. And if we print those, we get the same result. They both show the same thing. And we can access the elements in the same way as well. So if I, I want to access element two, I can do that here. If we run it, we get the same result. We can also slice both as we've done previously, two to four, four. So they do exactly the same thing. The main difference is that the tuples you can't change. They're what's called immutable. So when you create it the first time, that's the tuple that you have. If you want to change it, you'll have to create a new tuple and save the old one into it. Also, because of their, I guess, less complexity, or them being less complex, they're also slightly faster to work with. So iterations or searches are faster in tuples than they are in regular lists. Now getting data about the tuples, you can use the same functions that we use for lists, but you can't use any of the append or remove or pop or any of these functions. So when do you want to use a tuple instead of a list? Well, if you have data that you don't want to change during your program running and want to make sure that it doesn't change, a tuple might be a good way to go. Then there are also some secret magic ways to make tuples behave more like lists, which you'll learn when you become more advanced, but I'm not going to talk about that here, so you'll have to look that up on your own for now. I'll speak to you soon. So because lists and tuples aren't enough, somebody figured out that we have more bracket characters on the keyboard and we should really use all three of them. So curly brackets, we need to do something with. So somebody figured out that we could make up sets. And sets use curly brackets, just like tuples use parentheses and lists use square brackets. Sets use curly brackets. And the main difference between a list and a set is that a set is unordered 
and it also removes any duplicates that are inside it. So only one of each thing can exist in a set. Sets are also a lot faster at finding members inside the, the set than a list is. Um, can be up to 100 times faster. And in programming, speed is a reason all on its own to do things. So let's take a look at what it looks like if we print this out. So as you noticed, I've added an extra Eric at the end here just to show you that it's going to be removed when we do the printout. So we print, and as you see, that last Eric is gone. But we don't see any sight of the fact that it's an unordered list because it's printing in the same order every time. I'm not sure why that is. In some Python interpreters, it actually shifts the order around randomly. And the fact that it is unordered is probably one of the reasons why it's a lot faster. So what can we do with sets? Well, we can do basically the same things that we can do with lists, but sets are faster for some things. I'll show you some examples of when they are faster. So we'll remove this. Now we have a second set, my friends set. And then we have a command at the bottom, which says print friends set dot intersection my friends underscore set. So what this is going to do, it's going to print the members who are in both friends set and my friends set. So in the top one, it's John, Michael, Terry, Eric, Graham, and Eric. The bottom one is Reg, Loretta, Colin, Eric, and Graham. So which ones are in both? Let's find out. So Eric and Graham are the ones that exist in both. We can also find the ones that are not in both. And then we say difference. We run that. We find that John, Michael, and Terry are the ones that are different. These are the ones in the friend set that don't exist in the my friend set. That's how it's measured. Another thing you can do is take the two and put them together by using the union command. So this now gives me a set with all of the names in both of the sets with no duplicates. One last thing we can look at is the behavior of lists, tuples, and sets when we're creating empty ones. So take a look at this. So when you're creating empty lists, if you create an empty list, you only need two square brackets. That will give you an empty list called empty list. You can also use the list command. With an empty tuple, you can create an empty tuple by using two parentheses, or you can use the command tuple. With an empty set, if you try to use two curly brackets, you'll actually end up with a dictionary, which is not what you want. So you cannot create a set by just specifying two curly brackets. An empty set should always be specified by the command set. But you can, of course, create a set that has members or content with just using the curly brackets. You don't need the set command then. And that's about everything I know about sets. That was pretty quick. I'll talk to you next time. All right, let's do an exercise on sets. And part of this exercise is to help you relate regular words to things that we do in set theory and programming. So what we'll do is I'll read out each one of the six questions. You give it a shot one by one, and then I'll show you a solution to them one by one. Sound good? All right, let's get cracking. So how about the first one? Check if Eric and John exist in the set friends. So first, maybe check if just Eric exists, and then check if both Eric and John exist. Give that a shot. Okay, so what we're going to be performing is a membership test. And we will ask if Eric is in set friends. So is he? Turns out he is. But if we want to check if both Eric and John are in friends, well, in that case, we need to do the same thing again. So we'll say John in friends. Now we're asking both Eric and John are in friends. Let's see if they are. They are. That's awesome. So the next one, combine or add the two sets. How would you do that? Give that a shot. All right, in this case, we are going to be using a union. Print, friends, union, and then union with what? Well, with my friends. There's actually an alternate way to write this. It's shorter, and we'll start by copying that. Move one of the parentheses. Move that. And instead, we'll use the pipe character. That means union. Let's run those and see if we get the same result. And we do. What about the next one? Number three, find names that are in both sets. So did you try that? I hope you did. So in this case, we're going to be using the intersection. And for intersection, use the and sign. This is going to give us all the names that exist in both of the sets. And that's just John and Graham. Next one, number four, find names that are only 
and friends. How would we do that? Well, we'd use the difference. Difference, easy to remember, uses a minus sign as the shorthand. So what are we actually going to get now? Well, think of it a bit like subtracting the two sets. So we'll run it first. Look at what we get. We get Michael, Terry, and Eric. Those exist only in the first set. So what we basically do is we subtract the second set, my friends, from friends, but we can only subtract the items that actually exist in friends. So it doesn't help much to subtract Colin because Colin isn't part of friends. But we can subtract John because John is in friends, and that's why we get the other ones left over. So it's sort of a weird kind of subtraction. What about if we turn it around and say, my friends, say friends here. And we're going to be subtracting friends from my friends. What would you expect the result to be? That's right, a different one. Now we have Reg, Loretta, and Colin, which exist only in my friends. So just to prove that it works, we'll change this as well. So there we go. All right, number five, show only the names that only appear in one of the lists. How do we go about doing that? Well, luckily there's a function for it. Symmetric difference. Now, if you're wondering, how do we do symmetric difference? And it's the roof character. So what that's going to do is show us all of the different items or members that exist in just one of the sets. Reg, Loretta, Colin, Michael, Terry, and Eric. These are the ones that don't exist in both of the sets. Alrighty then, as a last exercise, create a new cars list without any duplicates. How do we go about doing that? Well, we actually sort of did it when we did the union because we were using sets. And we're using the function in sets that they don't contain duplicates. First, we'll create a variable cars, no duplicates. And we'll set that be the set of cars, because cars is a list, so it can contain duplicates, but a set can't. Then we print, there's no duplicates, and we get a set without duplicates, because we turned it into a set. If we want it back into a list, let's turn it back into a list. And voila, we have a list with no duplicates. Awesome. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'll talk to you next time. So comments are text in the code that Python just ignores. So it's mainly for communication between humans. The three main reasons to write comments. Number one, writing notes to other humans about the code so that they can keep track of what it does, how you were thinking when you built it, maybe even a to-do list to yourself or to others on what needs to be done in the code, or some other interesting comment. Number two is for mainly for debugging or testing, where you can disable lines of code to see what's running and what's not. And then number three, auto-generation of documentation about the code. And we're not going to talk about that here. And seriously, if that's the kind of code you need to write, you're probably in the wrong tutorial. So let's get into what comments actually look like. So underneath the print statement here, we actually have a comment. And it starts with a hashtag or a hash or what used to be called a pound sign. And anything we write after that hash is ignored by Python. So now you see it lighting up. As soon as I put the hash there, it goes gray. So basically, you can see the hash as a message to Python saying, no, bad dog, don't touch this code ever. And that's basically what it is. So this is a way for us to hide messages from the computer. So you can do this, and if you want to do multi-line, there is really only one way. You have to add another hash to the next line and keep writing more comments. Uh, there is a way around this, which isn't sanctioned in any way, and it's not really good practice. So you can do this, then you can write multiple lines of comments. So for instance, which while being true, is not really useful as a comment. As you see, if I run the code, it's just going to run this print statement. And it's not going to show us the comments. And it's also not going to show us the string that I typed. And the reason it's not showing the string is because it's not allocated anywhere. So immediately when Python runs, it just deletes that string. So that's why it's not being shown. So it's not really a comment. It's actually a string, but it's not being allocated anywhere. So probably not a good idea. Maybe Python will have multi-line comments in the future. So here's a list, fruits. And above it, I've written fruits holds the fruits input by the user as strings. So that tells whoever is working on this code what it actually does. What about troubleshooting code or experimenting, which I mentioned? How does that work? Well, let's take a look. Let's say we have this code in front of us. 
and it it doesn't work. We don't know why, so we read the comments. Hmm, what is this? Entry form for ministry applications. To do. Fix it. It doesn't work. Okay, great. So we have a name. We have then a name being assigned by an input. And then we have a print statement. And apparently nothing works. So let's try by commenting out a line of code or two. So when I do this, as you see, it goes gray. That means Python's going to skip over it. And let's run it again. Now it runs. So I know that the lines that I have uncommented now are okay. So let's uncomment this one as well. It still runs. So it looks like the row that I have here is the culprit. Maybe there's something wrong with this. Let's take a look at it. Ah, it looks like somebody forgot to make it into a string. Let's see. I get a console that you don't see. And naturally, Loretta needs a job. And it says, thank you, Loretta, for applying to the Ministry of Silly Walks. And now we'll do this. Fixed. Or we'll just delete the row. Because we've fixed it. There we go. Try to comment your code so that other people can understand it better. And use comments for debugging and testing. Good luck, and I'll talk to you soon. OK, time to talk about functions. And functions, they're a way to bundle together code you often use to make it easier to reuse later. So if you often use or copy the same lines of code and use them again and again, maybe that piece of code or that snippet might be a good candidate to make a function out of. Another good thing with functions is that it allows you to split up your code so that it's easier to understand and read, both for yourself and for others. And you'll find that yourself is going to be important as you move on and write more code, because you're going to find some old code that you wrote a long time ago that you just don't understand without having useful names, which is another thing. You should always use names that you understand. That makes it easier for you and for the rest of the world to read your code, and of course to use your code. Another rule that you should remember about functions is this always declare functions before you're going to use them okay so always declare the function above where you're using it okay great so now let's get into writing some code and creating some functions here we have a print statement which is not super useful so we're going to turn this into a greeting message so what we're going to do is move that down one row and we're going to start with def which is a keyword which means define and that's what you use every time you want to define a function we're going to define a function called greeting. This is how you define a function. You type the name, and then you have two parentheses. You finish with a colon. Now, everything underneath that define greeting is going to be part of that function, as long as it's indented. So let's indent the print statement. There we go. Now it's part of the function. So this print statement will change, and we'll say, hello, friend. That's a personalized message anybody could use in an e-commerce message, right? Awesome. So then we're going to run it. So what do you think is going to happen? Let's try. Nothing. And why is that? Well, in order to use a function, you have to call the function. So let's call the function. How do you do that? Well, you write the name of the function, and you finish with the parentheses. And that's all you need to do. So let's try that. Look at that. It prints out the message, very personalized, hello, friend. That makes any user on your site very happy. Great. So we're going to make that user a bit more happy now by trying to send a personalized message to them. So the first thing we're going to do is specify in our function something called a parameter. And a parameter is some kind of variable that we're going to use inside our function. So let's do that. So we'll say name. And then we're going to use name down here. So we're going to extend and concatenate the string. We're going to say hello plus name plus an exclamation mark. Now we also have to specify what's called an argument, which is what we're going to send from the call of the function. And let's say that we want to say hi to Brian. OK, let's try and run this. Look at that. Hello, Brian. Now it's much more personalized. He's going to be so happy, right? But we want to be even more personalized. So we want to personalize this more for Brian. We want to add something he's going to appreciate, like maybe his age. So let's put a comma here and put another parameter in there. And we're going to call that age. We're going to use that down in our print statement, the age. So we'll say, hello, Brian. And then we're going to say, you are age. And again, the exclamation mark. 
So there we go. So now it's going to say, hello, Brian, you are, and whatever the age is going to be. We also need to specify the age in our call. So that needs to be sent along as an argument. Let's do that, comma, and then another argument. So we'll say that Brian is 32. So let's run that. Hello, Brian, you're 32. And maybe we should have put a space there to make it look better. There we go. So now we've personalized this, and you're starting to notice that this print statement is getting slightly unwieldy, right? And we talked about formatting strings before, and I'm now going to use that just to show you how convenient they are. So print, and we're going to say hello, and then we want to say the name, right? And the way we say the name is using curly brackets. Name, comma, space, you are age, exclamation point. Now, do you feel that that message is shorter and snappier and easy to, easier to read than the one above? I sure do. So let's use both of those and see what the result is. Well, that wasn't great. Now, what a mistake did I make now? Ah, yes. You have to specify an F before for the format. Sorry about that. There we go. Now we have the same message twice. And the second one is a lot easier to write, as long as you remember the F, which I omitted. Okay, so let's keep going. Now, sometimes we might not know the age of our subject or the person we're working with. So we might have it on file for some people. So maybe sometimes we need a default value. So let's try a default value. And the way you set a default value is set one of the parameters equal to something. So in this case, we'll set it equal to default, let's say, 28. So if we don't send a number for age, it's going to choose 28. So that makes our thing a little bit more flexible. So let's try that. Let's do another greeting. So greeting, Judith, and we don't set an age for Judith. And let's run this and see what happens. Look at that. So we have two greetings and the one for Judith says 28, our default value when we didn't have one. So that's how you add a default value. Now, another thing we might want to do is actually take the value to use as name from an input box from the user. So let's try that. Input. Enter your name, and that will be the variable name. Then we'll use this inside here. So now we will get an input from the user, use that in the greeting, and send it as an argument to our function greeting. So let's try that. I get a box that you don't see, which I'm going to fill out with Peter. Now it says, hello, Peter, you are 32, and Judith, she's still 28. All right, great. So now what I'd like to do is change the 32 into a real number, not a string. So I want that to change. And I want to change it up here as well. I don't want it to be a string anymore. And now you'll notice something cool very soon. So let's run this again. So I run it. We'll say Peter again. Now we get an error. And the reason we get an error here is because of this line right here. The age is expecting a string because it's concatenating a string, but we're not sending one. We've turned the age into an integer. So we need to convert that integer into a string. So why did I say that was cool? Let's run it again and you'll see why. So Peter. Now we're getting the answers, but we didn't convert the string on the age down here. We didn't do the string conversion. Why is that? Well, because it works anyway. Isn't that cool? So you don't have to do the string conversion here. We can just put it together in this way. Now with that, hopefully I've given you some indication that using formatted strings is a lot easier, both on your eyes and on your work and making less mistakes. And also you don't have to convert integers into strings and floats and so on. So I hope to see you in the exercise soon. Okay, welcome to this exercise on functions. So what we're going to do is modify the above function. And the instructions are below, starting with one. Add a new print statement on a new line, which says, we hear you like the color XXX, which is a string. Then number two, we're going to extend the function with another input parameter called color that defaults to red. Capture the color is going to be done via an input box as a variable called color. Change the URXX text to say you will be XX plus one years old next birthday. So we're going to add one to the age. Then we're going to capitalize the first letter of the name, make sure the rest are small caps, and the favorite color should be in lowercase. So there's the exercise. Give that a shot, and I'll be back with one possible solution in a jiffy. Just remember that you have two print lines, one which is not a formatted string, and one which is. You can work on both of them for practice. All right, I'll see you soon. 
Okay, are you done? Awesome. All right, let's get cracking at this. So the first thing we want to do is add a new print statement on a new line. All right, great. So let's do that. We'll say print. And what's it going to say? Formatted string. We here like the color. And then we're going to input some form of variable here, I guess. So let's open it up and put something in there when we know what we're going to call it. And exclamation point. There we go. So what else? Extend the function with another input parameter, color, that defaults to red. Well, input parameters go up here. So we're going to take color, and it's going to default to red. There we go. Now we've set another parameter, and it defaults to red. Now we're going to capture the color via an input box as variable color. OK. So we'll put that down here. Color gets input favorite color. There we go. And then we're going to change the x, u, r, x, x text to say you will be. OK, let's say start here. You will be. And then string. And we're going to add one. So whatever the age string is, we're going to add one to it. So we'll say age plus one. And then we also want next birthday. And we'll say space next birthday. And then we'll do the same here. Low name, you are age plus one. Not you are, you will be. Age plus one, next, birthday. And then we need to handle our variable here. So color should be color, right? And then we want it in lowercase. So we'll call the lower. Go. Now we also need to change the call to the function. Greeting, name, and then we have an int, which is our age. We have the color. So is that about done? Right, we need to capitalize the first letter of the name. So our name is here. So name capitalize and capitalize this one as well. This should be done. Maybe we should improve comments. Age next year. So is that about done, do you think? Let's give it a whirl and see if we can fix something. Get a pop-up box, enter your name, let's go with John. Enter your age, let's go with 22. And favorite color, hot pink. So what do we get? Hello John, you'll be 23 next birthday. And the other one seems right too. We hear you like the color hot pink. Awesome. So that's one way to solve this. Of course, you could have solved it in many different ways. And the main point with all these exercises is just to practice. Make an effort and try to do the best you can. Hopefully you can learn something from the solution and from your own attempts. All right, I'll see you next time. All right, let's talk about name notation and functions. But first, I want to mention that it's really important to comment your code. The more you comment your code, the easier it is for you and for other people to understand what the code does and what it's supposed to do. So let's look at our old code. So we had this code before, where we had our greeting, where we had the parameters name, age, and color. And then we printed out a message based on that. And we called our function with this greeting call down here. And that works run it. And as you see, we're printing the Hello Brian row twice. And I'm now going to remove this top one, this string concatenation. I think we've agreed that that is more tedious to work with than these formatted strings, which are much more pretty. And as you see, I've commented my code right here. Greets user with name from input box and age. If available, default age is used. If unavailable, it should say. There we go. If unavailable, default age is used. Expertly commented. So as we said before, in regular function parameters, we learned that to call the function with arguments in the same order as they're listed, or it won't work. And that is not entirely true. Actually, it's a bit like asking if you can breathe underwater. Well, no, you can't, but there's this thing called scuba. Hmm. Same thing here, kind of. You can get around this positional argument thing by using something called name notation. That's basically putting names on your arguments down here so that they correspond to the names up here so that the function understands what goes where. That way you can pass them in any order you want, which is useful. So I'll do my best to demonstrate how to do this. And also you should know that this has the added benefit of increasing readability and clarity of your code. Just like commenting, that's always good, right? So let's take a look. So we've run this. Let's run it again. Now we only have one row. So if we throw these things around, so if I put 27 here at the front instead and remove the other 27, what do you think is going to happen? Well, most likely it's going to fail. 
Ooh. But if we name the arguments, so age, name, and color, magically it works. So by inputting the names of the different parameters down here as arguments, they match up regardless of the order we put them in. And that's really useful. And in this case, it was kind of easy to understand what was what, but you'll run into places where it's not as easy to see what's going on. So let's take an example. So here's a function called profile. Now we obviously don't have the profile here. This is just an example to show you. And we have 1995, 83 and a half, 192 and blue. Now you might be able to guess what that is, but we could be wrong. It's not that readable. But if we said year of birth and then weight and then height and eye color, it's a lot more readable and that would make it easier to understand. So with that, I think we've discussed some of the most important things about name notation for functions. So I'll speak to you next time. So what are return statements? Well, Python functions are collections of code that perform a specific function. We've gone through that before. Most of the time, functions just perform that task and then they're kind of done. But sometimes we want the function to give us some kind of data back or maybe a value back. That's what a return statement is. Okay, so what we're going to do now is write some code and create a function and make it return some data. So we're going to examine something called value added tax. For those of you not familiar with the concept of value added tax, it's basically a sales tax, but it's used in other parts of the world. So there we have our value added tax, and we are going to take some input into that. We'll set an amount, indent. So now we're going to write the function. So let's say tax equals amount multiplied by 0 0.25. And then we'll go down here and run the function. So value added x, and we'll input 100. And then we'll print that value and see what we get. We get none. So what's none? Well, it turns out if you don't have a return value, which we don't at the moment in the function, all functions that you call return an empty object, something called null in some other programming languages. So it just returns empty. So to get a value back, we need to modify the function. So let's do that. We'll go up here and write return. And what are we gonna return? Let's return the tax. Okay, let's run it again and see what we get. 25.0. So if you buy something for 100, you have to pay 25 in tax, and that's on top of the 100, just like a sales tax. So let's calculate some other numbers. Let's calculate total amount. Equals amount times 1.25. And let's modify what we output as well. So let's say price, and let's set that equal to the return value. instead of printing the value added tax, let's print the result, the price. And that again, we get the same result. So now let's look at some interesting things. What are we actually getting back? So let's start by adding something to the print statement. Let's check the type of what we're getting back. Let's also print the type of price. Run that. So that gives us back a float. That's to be expected, right? But what if we send more values back from the function? Let's try that. So let's send back amount, which is the value we took in, the tax, and the total amount. Now let's see what we get back. Now we get back a tuple. What if we make some changes to this? What if we put square brackets around it? Then what are we going to get back? Then we get back a list. Can we then print a part of the list? Let's find out. Let's see if we can print element one so that's the tax yep we could do that okay so what if we change it to something else let's change it and see if we can get a set out of here so we change that to curly brackets this to curly brackets we won't actually access the individual cells because that doesn't work on a set because we don't know which one is which because it's unordered remember ah so now we get a set back 
Could we change it to a string? Let's do a formatted string using curly brackets around the variables. Will that work? Yes, it will, and we get back a string. Great, so we were able to get both a float back, or if we had multiple values, we could get back either a set or a tuple or a list or a string. That's interesting. I'll see you next time. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about comparisons and a little bit about the properties of Booleans. So let's start by checking some different operators. So the first operators we see here on top are the assignment operators. Those are the single equal signs. They assign a value to a variable. When you want to compare something, you can write a two equal signs, b. Here we're asking if a is equal to b, and the answer is false, because it's not. 7 is not equal to 3. If we want to check if something is not equal, we use the exclamation point. And that goes for most programming languages. The exclamation point almost always means not. So this means a not equal to b. And that evaluates to true. Next, we might want to check if something is greater than or less than. So greater than? Yes, 7 is greater than 3. Less than? No, 7 is not less than 3. So the answer is false. If we say less than or equal to, we use an equal sign. So this means a less than or equal to b. That is false because it's bigger than b. And if we change the sign to greater than, it still evaluates to true. Another interesting operator is the in operator, which denotes membership. So for instance, if we have something that's an iterable, like a list or a string or something else, we can ask o in john. This asks the question if the letter o appears in the string john and that evaluates to true. The opposite of it is the not in, so not in. That asks if the letter O is not found in the string John, and that is false, because it is found in the string John. The next operator gets a little bit more tricky. It's called the identity, and it checks if two values are identical. So now we'll say A, 3, 7, 42. We will set B equal to A. Then we'll print A equals B. That evaluates to true. Now let's ask if A is B. Are they identical? Are they the same thing? And that evaluates also to true. What this is referring to is if they're occupying the same memory space in the computer. So if they are identical objects. So we can check that with the ID statement. So we can say ID of A and ID of B. So we see that the memory is 2 in both cases. Now if we instead actually allocate a list that's identical to B, we'll see what the result is. 3742. We evaluate that. They are equal to each other, so they are the same in value. But they are not the same in memory, so that's why A is B evaluates to false. And the IDs are also not identical, so that's why we see two different numbers there. Now I'll paste in some comparison operators for us to use as reference. We'll run those, and you can take a look on your own. Now we'll take a look at some Boolean properties that will help us later on. So we'll get rid of these. First, we'll check what happens when we make an int out of a Boolean. So we print int. That evaluates to 1. We do the same with false. We'll see that it evaluates to 0. That has some interesting effects we'll look at a little bit later. Now if we instead convert some values into Booleans, so we'll use the keyword bool, We'll start by converting some strings. So the word parrot evaluates to true. And a string with a space evaluates to true. The empty string evaluates to false. If we look at numbers, if we evaluate the number 42, it's true. 1, also true. And 0 is false. So what we see is that empty objects, or zeros, evaluate to false, and everything else seems to evaluate to true. And that's actually what happens. Let's take a look at a list. So if we have a list with two objects, it evaluates to true. But the empty list evaluates to false. What we find is that all trivial values evaluate to zero, and all values that are non-trivial evaluate to one. Something else that's interesting is that Boolean values can actually be converted to one and zero. So if we take the number 42 plus true, we get 43. Take the number 42 plus false, 
we get 42 because it adds zero and Python does that conversion automatically. So that's a run through of some different comparison operators and you'll get to use those as we start doing conditionals soon. I'll see you soon. Now we're going to talk about conditionals and specifically we're going to start with if statements. So if statements are a way for our programs to make decisions. They can run different code depending on different circumstances. So it sort of makes the programs a little bit more intelligent. An example could be a website that checks if you're already logged in to run a certain function. And if you aren't, it asks you to log in. If you are, it just lets you access the function. That's an example of a conditional. Or in real life, maybe if you hold your breath underwater, when you run out of air, you come up to the surface. So the conditional might be, if I can't hold my breath anymore equals true, then stop holding breath and come up just not in that order. So if an if statement is true, I run this code. And if it isn't, then I run some other code or maybe just stop the program altogether. So let's create an example of a personal butler helping you figure out how to have a great day. So let's start with some kind of Boolean that tells us what the weather is like today. So let's see, is it raining today? Is raining? We'll set that to true. Then our butler will greet us with a message. So he'll say, Good morning. Then we create our conditional. Move that. If is raining, colon. Then we indent, and this is the code that will get run. Print. Bring umbrella. So let's run that. So we get good morning, bring umbrella. What about if it's false, if it's not raining? Then we just get good morning. Maybe we'd like some kind of other message. So let's go down and create an else. So this means in all cases when it is not raining, we say something else. Print. Umbrella is optional. Let's run that. Good morning. Umbrella is optional. Great. Maybe we'll add some more features to this. So maybe he also checks if it's cold outside. So let's put in another variable called is cold. We'll set that to true to start. We'll set this back to true. So what do we want to do? Well, now I'm going to introduce the or statement, which we'll add here. If is raining or is cold. So now if it's either raining or cold is true or both are true, this is going to be true, this whole statement. So then we'll say bring umbrella. So now we'll say bring umbrella or jacket or both. So let's run it. Good morning. Bring umbrella or jacket or both because both are true. So let's try and set one of these to false. It still executes, but if we set both of them to false, we get umbrella is optional. What if we use another logical operator called and? Let's try that. So now this top one, if is raining and is cold, will only be true if it's both raining and cold. So right now it's not. So let's change both to true. And if it is, we need to bring umbrella and jacket. Good morning, bring umbrella and jacket. But then we have some instances when it's either raining or cold, but not both. And we need to handle those. We either need to bring our umbrella or our jacket, but not both. So now we'll introduce an elif statement, which means else if. And we'll say is raining and now we introduce another logical operator called not. So not, then we put what we want to check inside the parentheses. In this case is cold finish with a colon. So this says, if it's raining, but it's not cold, what do we need to do? Well, in that case, copy this. So in this case, we need to bring only the umbrella. And if it's not raining, but cold, we want to bring our jacket. So let's do one for that as well. So we'll copy this. And this time we'll say it's not raining. So not and is cold. So it's not raining, but is cold. In that case, we bring jacket. All right, let's try this. So good morning, bring umbrella and jacket. That's when it's both raining and cold. So if we change this to false, so it's no longer raining, 
good morning, bring jacket. And if we change it to be raining, like that, we should bring the umbrella. And at the very end, we'll make a change so that if it's neither raining nor cold, we'll say shirt is fine. There we go. We run that. Excellent. So we got that to work. Now let's run a short example on doing this with numbers as well. So let's say, for instance, that you're doing a credit card purchase, or rather you're the credit card machine company, and you have the instructions that all purchases under $50 or 50 whatever the currency is, don't need a pin code to be approved. So let's try and write a short algorithm for that. So let's start with an amount, the amount of the purchase, amount equals 10. Then we have an if statement, less than or equal to 50. And if it is, we'll say print purchase approved else we'll print please enter your pin well let's try this so the amount was 10 so it was approved let's try the amount 49 still approved let's try 50 still approved because it's smaller than or equal to. What if we run 51? There, please enter your pin. And we're done with that. So see you next time. Welcome to this exercise where we're going to build a calculator. So here's the exercise. We're going to create a calculator which handles plus, minus, multiplied, and divided by, and outputs the answer based on the mode or operator used. There's a hint to use three separate inputs. And then as a bonus, extend the functionality with an extra mode so it also does Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. And the formula for that is the temperature in Celsius times 9 fifths plus 32 gives you the temperature in Fahrenheit. So give that a shot, and I'll see you in a few seconds after you've tried. Okay, you're back. Awesome. So I hope that worked. I'll give you an example of how to solve this and start coding. So we're going to need a mode or an operator, and we're going to need two inputs to be able to add two numbers. So let's start with the mode. Mode gets, and we'll use an input, so input, enter math operation, and we'll help the user by telling them what they can use, multiplied and divided by, and parentheses, colon, and then we need the first number, so num1 gets, copy this, enter first number. Okay, we need a second number, so we'll just copy this. Make that num2, enter second number. Now if we use it this way, we'll get strings as the input, and we don't want that. So let's convert these to a float. Would have been smarter to do it before, but better late than ever. So here as well. So whatever is input there will be turned into a float. If they type something, we're in trouble, but let's not worry too much about that. So now let's get into the conditionals. If we start with an if mode, is equal to, two equal signs, means equal to, and then we'll specify a string, in this case, plus, then colon, indent, whatever we want to indent. We want to print. So we'll print a formatted string. We'll say answer is, and we'll add the two numbers, num1 plus num2. And we'll copy all of this. Down a row, go back, paste. We could use an if. But the difference between using an if and an elif, which is what we're going to use, is that if we run ifs, each one of the ifs will get checked. So first it goes to check if mode is plus, and then if we use an if on the next one, it's going to check that as well. If we use elifs, it will only check until it finds something that is correct, then it stops and exits the conditional. So that's the benefit of using elifs. So here, we'll say minus, and instead of the plus here, we'll say minus. And we'll copy this because the rest of the statements we're going to use are going to be elifs. Go back. Next one. If we have a asterisk, which means multiplied, we are going to multiply the numbers. Great. And then and if we have divided by, so divided by, we are going to divide the numbers. Great. That's pretty much done. Except we might run into the case where somebody types something wrong, so we need an else to capture anything else. So let's say if anything else happens, we'll print an error message. So we'll say input error. There we go. 
Now, strictly speaking, if I haven't made any mistakes, this should actually run. So let's try it. I get a pop-up that asks me for the math operation, so we'll say plus. And then it asks me for the first number, 12, second number, 13. That should be 25. Yay, we get 25. Awesome. Let's see if it works with multiplied as well. Let's run it again. We will use multiplied. We will multiply 7 by 9, which is 81, right? Or 63, potentially. 63. There we go. So it seems to work, at least for multiplied and plus. Let's just assume that the other ones work as well. Now we need to add this Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. We can actually do that in two ways. We can do it in the following way by adding another elif statement. So elif, and then whatever we decide it's going to be, like f, for instance, let's say if they input the letter f. And because people don't know the difference between a shift key and other keys, we will make sure that it's a lowercase. And now it'll work even if they enter a large caps f. But of course we need to capture it as well, so we need to extend our input up here. So we'll say or f for Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. We've done that. We now need to change the calculation down here. So we are going to use the formula that we have. We'll say num1 times 9 fifths. We'll put that in parentheses and we will add 32. So if it gets an F, it should output answer is. And let's change that text as well and say, let's add the num1. Num1. Celsius is equivalent to Fahrenheit. So if we run this, we'll now enter an F and enter a temperature, say zero. Enter a second number. We don't actually need that number. That's annoying. So we'll enter 45. Now we get zero degrees Celsius is equivalent to 32 Fahrenheit. That's actually correct. But that second pop-up box was a bit annoying. So how do we get rid of that? Well, if we take this term, and we'll try to do some coding so that we get rid of the second pop-up. So we'll put that in front of this num2. So here we'll say, now it says elif, but we're going to say if the mode is lower f, then we're going to print this text. And if it's not, so if we want to use the regular calculator mode, we'll say else. Now everything here needs to be indented. So it's only going to have, so everything needs to be indented Now the main if that we're running is this one. First we'll check if lower case mode is F. If it is, we'll run this print statement and it's not gonna do anything else. But if it's not, it's going to run this else statement. It's going to ask us for the second number and then it's going to run another if statement to see if we have plus, minus, multiplied or divided by. And then if there's an error, it's going to give us an input error. So let's see if that works. So we'll say F for Fahrenheit, the first number, which is going to be the only number. Let's do 28 degrees, which is comfortable. So now it didn't ask us for the second number. So it says 28 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 82.4 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of warm and nice. So let's try it again. Let's try with the multiplication now. Multiplied, and then we'll take 10 times 20, which would be 200. And it is. So there we got two input boxes, and we got the right number. And we're done with that exercise. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. Welcome to this exercise where we're going to build a calculator. So here's the exercise. We're going to create a calculator which handles plus, minus, multiplied, and divided by, and outputs the answer based on the mode or operator used. There's a hint to use three separate inputs. And then as a bonus, extend the functionality with an extra mode so it also does Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. And the formula for that is the temperature in Celsius times 9 fifths plus 32 gives you the temperature in Fahrenheit. So give that a shot, and I'll see you in a few seconds after you've tried. Okay, you're back. Awesome. So I hope that worked. I'll give you an example of how to solve this and start coding. So we're going to need a mode or an operator, and we're going to need two inputs to be able to add two numbers. So let's start with the mode. Mode gets, and we'll use an input, so input, enter math operation, and we'll help the user by telling them what they can use, multiplied and divided by, and parentheses, colon, and then we need the first number, so num1 gets, copy this, enter first number, okay, you need a second number, so we'll just copy this, 
We'll make that num2, enter a second number. Now if we use it this way, we'll get strings as the input, and we don't want that, so let's convert these to a float. Would have been smarter to do it before, but better late than ever. So here as well. So whatever is input there will be turned into a float. If they type something, we're in trouble, but let's not worry too much about that. So now let's get into the conditionals. If we start with an if mode is equal to, to equal signs means equal to, and then we'll specify a string, in this case plus, then colon, indent, whatever we want to indent, we want to print. We'll print a formatted string. We'll say answer is, and we'll add the two numbers, number one, plus num2. Then we'll copy all of this, down a row, go back, paste. We could use an if, but the difference between using an if and an elif, which is what we're going to use, is that if we run ifs, each one of the ifs will get checked. So first it goes to check if mode is plus, and then if we use an if on the next one, it's going to check that as well. If we use elifs, it will only check until it finds something that is correct, then it stops and exits the conditional. So that's the benefit of using elifs. So here, we'll say minus, and instead of the plus here, we'll say minus. And we'll copy this because the rest of the statements we're going to use are going to be elifs. Go back. Next one. If we have a asterisk, which means multiplied, we are going to multiply the numbers. Great. And then and if we have divided by, so divided by, we are going to divide the numbers. Great. That's pretty much done. Except we might run into the case where somebody types something wrong, so we need an else to capture anything else. So let's say if anything else happens, we'll print an error message. So we'll say input error. There we go. Now, strictly speaking, if I haven't made any mistakes, this should actually run. So let's try it. I get a pop-up that asks me for the math operation, so we'll say plus. And then it asks me for the first number, 12, second number, 13. That should be 25. Yay, we get 25. Awesome. Let's see if it works with multiplied as well. Let's run it again. We will use multiplied. We will multiply 7 by 9, which is 81, right? Or 63, potentially. 63. There we go. So it seems to work, at least for multiplied and plus. Let's just assume that the other ones work as well. Now we need to add this Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. We can actually do that in two ways. We can do it in the following way by adding another elif statement. So elif, and then whatever we decide it's going to be, like f, for instance, let's say if they input the letter f. And because people don't know the difference between a shift key and other keys, we will make sure that it's a lowercase. And now it'll work even if they enter a large caps f. But of course we need to capture it as well, so we need to extend our input up here. So we'll say or f for Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. We've done that. We now need to change the calculation down here. So we are going to use the formula that we have. We'll say num1 times 9 fifths. We'll put that in parentheses and we will add 32. So if it gets an F, it should output answer is. And let's change that text as well and say, let's add the num1. Num1. Celsius is equivalent to Fahrenheit. So if we run this, we'll now enter an F and enter a temperature, say zero. Enter a second number. We don't actually need that number. That's annoying. So we'll enter 45. Now we get zero degrees Celsius is equivalent to 32 Fahrenheit. That's actually correct. But that second pop-up box was a bit annoying. So how do we get rid of that? Well, if we take this term and we'll Whenever you see repeated code like this, as a programmer, you should immediately feel an urge to optimize the code and say to yourself, hmm, I wonder if a loop would help here. The answer is almost always yes. You'll find that programmers in general are pretty lazy people, and doing things over and over again just is in line with being lazy. So less keyboard strikes, always better. And if you react by deep frustration when you see this, then you're definitely programmer material. Go you. So loops, what are they? Well. Their code that runs again and again until some condition tells it to stop. Loops are absolutely fantastic for doing things that would bore humans to death, like perhaps checking a list of 5 billion emails for some particular word, which naturally nobody does, since where would they get all the emails? Let's start by looking at while loops, because what we have on the screen right now is not awesome, 
and awesome is our goal every time. So the first problem we have here is that we've written out some text and it's the same text. And if we want to change something, we have to change it in all the five rows. Now we have five rows, so that's not too bad. But imagine we had 5,000 rows and there were some small differences. And here we can definitely see a pattern, right? Because we're typing the same text and we have one star on the first one, two stars on the second one, three, four, and five. We also see the counter here at the beginning, one, two, three, four, five, and we can see a pattern there. To do this, we'll use a while loop. So how do you write a while loop? Well, the syntax is really simple. You write while and then some condition, colon, then you indent whatever the code is that you're going to run, and then probably you have some iterator or counter that you're going to increase or decrease or whatever the case might be, and then you're done. So every time you want to use a loop, you want to ask yourself three questions. We'll call them the three loop questions. And they are the following. What do I want to repeat? What do I want to change each time? And how long should I keep repeating? So in this case, what do I want to repeat? Well, the message. And what do I want to change? The stars. And how long should we repeat? Five times. Okay, so those are our questions and our answers. And we'll start by creating a variable, which is the counter or iterator, which is generally labeled i. i equals zero. And then we'll write this condition. And the condition will be while i less than five, we'll run some code. And the code will be print loops are awesome. And then iterator, we haven't talked about that before, so you're probably wondering what that is. That's where we take the number i, which we're checking at the top, and we're changing it. So we'll say i equals i plus 1. So what's going to happen here is that the while loop will start. So the first time the program comes down here, it will check if i is less than 5, and i has started out as 0. So it's less than 5, it will go into the loop, it will look at the first command, which is print, loops are awesome, and then after it's printed that, it will go down here and see, ooh, I need to increase the number of i to i plus 1, so it goes from 0 to 1. Then it goes back to the top and runs the loop again. So then it checks i, which is now 1, still less than 5, runs through the loop again, comes down to the bottom, increases it by 1, now i is 2, goes up to the top, i is now 2, it checks it, it's less than 5, continues down, and it does that until it comes up here and it's 5. So i is now 5. i is now no longer less than 5 because it's the same. So it will not execute anymore. It will just leave the loop and continue down. That's how the loop works. So let's start by try running this code and see what we get. So now we're printing loops are awesome. That's great, but we haven't got the stars yet. So we need to format our print statement. So we'll use a formatted string for this. So we type an F, then we use the I, period, and a star, and at the end, we'll put a star. Let's run it again. So now we have a counter, but it's starting at zero, and we only have one star on either side. Hmm, what do we do about that? Well, let's format the string a bit more. Let's go in here, and we'll concatenate, and close the star in quotation marks, concatenate that with the rest of the string, and then we'll multiply this by i. So we'll multiply it by the iterator, which will take on a number between 0 and 5. And we'll do the same at the end. So we'll say quotation marks plus times times i. Now we'll run it. There we go. Now to get some more space, let's remove this these old print statements. Run it again. Now we're getting somewhere, getting close. So now we're getting zero at the top. We're getting zero stars and the number is zero. So we could change that either by starting with a higher iterator. So we start at one and end at six, or we could move the iterator. So we could move the iterator in front of the print statement. Then we'll get the counter increased before. So we'll increase the number zero here to one and we'll put one star in here. So let's run that. Ah, see, now we're getting there. Now, I told you before that programmers are lazy, and iterators are used really, really often. So there's shorthand for writing iterators. And the shorthand for this particular iterator is to write i plus equals 1. Now, in this case, the syntax is take i, add, because it's a plus sign, the number 1 to it each time. So if we had a multiplication here, it would multiply by 1 or 2 or whatever the case might be. So this is the syntax. 
In a lot of other programming languages, you can write it even shorter. You can write I++. And that's the same thing as saying increase the number I by one, but not in Python, at least not yet. So I plus equals one. Run that again. There we go. And then just to show that you can use multiplication, we'll increase the number of stars at the end and multiply it by two. Now we get more stars at the end. That's an introduction to while loops. I'll talk to you next time. In this exercise, we are going to build a guessing game. So here we have some instructions. Guess the correct number in three guesses. If you don't get it right after three guesses, you lose the game. Then we need to give the user an input box to capture guesses. And then we print or use input boxes if the user wins or if the user loses. And then there's a tip, and that's really that in Scrimba, you won't see the prints that you make. So that's probably a good reason to use the input boxes to output data while the while loop is running. And then as a modification, try to use the number one to 100 and then tell the user if the guess is too high or too low and let them have maybe five to 10 guesses. So there we go. And maybe the first thing to take a look at are these three loop questions. What do I want to repeat? What do I want to change each time? And how long should we repeat? So take a look at this and I'll be back shortly with one example of how to solve this. So I would love to see the code you've just written, and I'm sure it worked. So let's take a look at one way you could solve this. So let's start with the questions. What is it that we want to repeat? Well, we want to repeat the guesses. So we want the user to guess a couple of times. What do I want to change each time? Well, the guess number. And what else? The number of guesses the user has taken. And how long should we repeat? Well, until user loses runs out of guesses or wins, right? Those are the things that we want to look for. So with that, let's get cracking with some code. So the first thing we want to specify is a number. So let's just call that number. So that's going to be our secret number. Let's call it 12. And then we're going to make a guess. We can start that number with zero. So that's the number that we're going to be guessing. And then let's say we have a guess limit, which is the maximum number of guesses our user is going to get. So let's say three. And then the current guess number, which we need to keep track of. So let's call that zero. All right. So now what are we going to do? Well, we need to create a while loop that loops until the guess number no longer is less than the guess limit, right? So the number of guesses the user is going to take needs to be less than the guess limit. And as long as it is, they can keep guessing. So let's say while guess number less than guess limit. We are going to do something. What are we going to do? Well, let's ask the user for a guess. So let's say that our guess is equal to, and we raise an input box where we say, guess a number one to 20. There we go. And what's this going to be? Well, when we use an input box, we get a string, right? And we don't want a string. We want this to be an integer because we're going to be comparing it to things. So we cast it into an int. And then let's say that the user guesses the right number. So if guess double equals, which means equals num, our secret number, then we're going to do something. What are we going to do? Well, let's print that they won. So we print, use a formatted string, and we'll say you win. You guessed it. And let's put the guess in there so they know which value it was that was correct. Finish off that. Okay. And if that happens, we want to break out of the loop. So we enter a break. And else, so if they don't get it right, we want them to guess again. So then we'll print no, not, and then again the variable guess. And then we also need to increment the guess number. So guess number plus equals one. We add one to it. If we leave the loop, so if the guess is not equal to number, and we, the while loop is no longer active, so the guess number is now as big as the guess limit, then they lose, right? So if we say if guess is not equal to num, then we print sorry, you lose. And let's input the actual number that they were supposed to guess, which was num. That looks a bit weird. In fact, let's make that a bit more interesting. Let's say f, the formatted string. This should also be a formatted string. So let's say, let's also tell them what the guess number is. So we'll say guess number. And let's see if that works. And then let's tell them what their last guess was. So, 
last guess was guess. And a colon to make it more readable. There we go. Let's see what happens if we run it. Ah, I get a pop-up box that you don't see, so you can run it on your end as well. So let's enter a number. I'm going to guess 11. Ah, it asks me to guess again. I'm going to guess 13. Mm, still not right. That was guess number 2. And then I'm going to guess 12. There you go, I guessed it correctly. So no, not 11, no, not 13. You win, you guessed it 12. So one of the things that can be tricky in this is to keep track of what the number of the counter is. So when we enter into this while loop, the guess number is zero. And it doesn't get updated until here. So as long as I'm in here, it's still zero. And that's why it's outputting the wrong number here. So I actually need to raise this by plus one. You can try this on your own and see what happens. So let's try it again. Let's see that it works if I don't get it right. So now I'm going to guess 13, 14, and 15. See, now it said, sorry you lose, it was 12. Great. So now let's try and extend this thing. Let's try and add that part where it gives us some more information if we guess too high or too low. So what were the things we needed to, to do? Take a number between 1 and 100, tell a user if the guess was too high or too low. So we need to make some changes here. Let's change the number to, say, 76. And now we're going to allow five guesses. And we still start at zero. So the first thing we want to check is if they are wrong. Because if they are wrong, we want to go in and show them if they're too high or too low. So let's start here and say, if the guess is not equal to number, so if guess not equal to number, then let's update the guess number here. Guess number plus equals one. And then, so if their guess is higher than number, then we let them input a new guess and we tell them that their guess was too high. So guess gets guess again, 1 to 100. And if that's not the case, so else, we can paste in the same thing. But now we have too low. So that should handle the higher and lower. But the first time they guess, we want to give them the generic guess. So that's sort of this one. Let's cut that and put that before the while loop. And let's change it slightly. Let's just say... This is the first time they guess, so guess a number 1 to 20, and they, don't, they haven't guessed before, so they don't have a last guess. So we come into the loop. If guess is not equal to number, because we have captured the guess here, we increase the guess number by 1. And then if the guess is higher than number, we say too high, guess again. If it's not, we say too low, guess again. And then we need to change some stuff down here. So we can actually keep this. If guess equals number, then we print you win, you guessed it. So we can leave that. This else statement, we don't need anymore. And then at the end, when we break out of the while loop, if the guess is not equal to number, sorry you lose, it was this number. So I hope you understood why we broke out the guess outside of the while loop, and that's so that we capture it the first time outside, and then we do the higher or lower inside the loop. Now this actually gives us quite an interesting learning experience, because when we break out the first input box, you'll see that that's the first guess the user gets. And then we run the loop, giving the user another five guesses. So that's six guesses in total. That's not what we want. So we need to do something about that. What could we do? Well, the first thing we could do is change the guess limit. So we could change that to four, and that will now give us five guesses. One guess before, and then four loops. So that's five. That's not really intuitive, because we have a guess limit of four, but we're saying that it's going to be five guesses. So somebody who reads the code after us might not find that very intuitive. So let's leave that at five. Another way we could do this is to change the while loop so that we actually change the counter. We only count up to guess limit minus 1. So it's not going to count to 5, it's going to count to 4. That's another way we could do it. We could do it another way. We could initiate the guess number to 1, that way stripping away one of the while loops, right? And in the same manner, we could actually take this bit and we could put that either above or below. Below seems a bit more intuitive. Put it all the way in. Of course, then we don't want this to 1 anymore. We want it to 0. And we could increase the guess number by 1 after our first guess. That way, the code will run the way we want it to. So if we increase this to 100, like that, and we try running our code, I get an input box. So I'm going to guess. Let's guess 20. Too low. So guess another one. 40. Still too low. 60. Hmm. How about 70? That's guess number 4. So this is my last guess. 70 was too low. So let's guess 77. 
oh no, I lost. So at least I got the five guesses, which is correct, right? So I hope you enjoyed that. And again, realize that almost all code challenges can be solved in many different ways. I'll see you in the next cast. So previously we covered while loops, and this tutorial is about for loops. For loops differ from while loops in that you'll generally know the number of iterations a for loop will perform beforehand, which isn't always the case with a while loop. Most of the time, for loops are used for looping through all the letters, all the objects, members, or whatever in a string, list, or something else. They're really awesome for that. A deep understanding of the difference between for and while loops is sort of optional, but the most fun and memorable way I'm aware of is the push-up analogy. It goes like this. Imagine that you're in the military and your drill instructor or drill sergeant often hands out, let's say, motivation in the form of push-ups to be performed, like drop and give me 20, which means that you need to get down and perform 20 push-ups. Now, this type of order can be viewed a bit like a for loop because you know in advance how many push-ups, loops, you need to do, and when you're done, you can stop, exit the loop, generally at least. Sometimes, however, you will be told by a drill instructor to do push-ups, which means you keep pushing until your instructor is happy, which could be a while. This, I'm not sure how many I need to do, so I better check if I should stop or continue after each push-up loop can be likened a bit to a while loop. Now, I wish, really wish I'd come up with that myself, but I haven't. Credit goes completely to a guy named Baron Stone's YouTube video. Thanks, Baron. And now, let's take a look at some different for loops. So let's start with the syntax. So here's a for command, and we'll go down a row, and we will indent this command. We'll move the next one down a row, and we'll change this to letter. In the command, we have the for word, which is the command. Then we have a variable called letter. You can call it anything you want. And what it does, for makes this variable go in through each one of the atoms, let's call it, of this string or a list or whatever else it is and pick up each one of them. So the first time it will pick up the N, then the O, then the R and so on. So let's run this and see what happens. So here we go. So it's going to print out Norwegian blue. And again, as one of these oddities with the Brython Scrimba thing, you see that there is no space printed out. For some reason, it skips spaces. Normal Python doesn't do that, but in this environment, it does. So you see we printed that out. And if I wanted to, just to prove this to you, I could call this a Fergal. Of course, I would need to call this a Fergal as well, so that you believe that you can actually call these things anything you want. And I'll get the same result. OK, so what else can we try and do? Well, we can use ranges. A range is a really useful tool when you want to pick up different numbers. So we can say or item in range, and let's say eight. This means that we will take all of the numbers from zero up to eight, but not including eight. So let's run that. Now we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can modify this command and say, starting from two, up to 8. So this will then start at 2 and run to 8, but not including 8. So now we have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You can also use a step. We could start at 1, we could run to 15, and we could do in steps of 3. So we then get 1, and then we have a step of 3, we get 4, step of 3, 7, 10, and 13. We could also do this in a list. So let's add a list with some names. Let's do John, Terry, Eric, Michael, and George. And let's change the Fergal to be name. Not that it matters, but just to show you that you can do call them useful things, because these are names, so that makes sense. And of course, it's not a range. Sorry about that. Let's remove the range. Run it again. So there we get the different names. We could move these names to a variable like this. So we'll grab that, and we'll say we have a friends list equals that and we'll say for friend in friends print friend and we get the same loop in this case it's looping through all of the different items in the list that we have we can also specify the number by finding it out by using the length of the list instead of doing it this way we could say for index in range so now we're going to specify a number and the way we're going to specify the number is getting the length len of the friends list so now it's getting a number which is going to be one two three four five and then we want to print we don't want to print the friend anymore now we have to specify what to print friends and then the index and so we'll run this 
and you get the same list. Great. So now let's remove this length counting and let's look at two statements, the break and the continue statement. The break statement takes you out of a, a loop and the continue allows you to continue when something happens inside your loop. So I'll show you an example of how to use these. So let's say again, for friend in friends. Now inside the for loop, let's specify a conditional, an if statement. So here we go. We'll say if friend is equal to, i.e. is identical to Eric, then we'll do something. And what are we going to do? So we need to indent what we're going to do. Print found and then what we found. Friend plus exclamation point like that. And then we are not going to print the index, but print the friend. That's outside the if, inside the for loop. If we find the friend, we're going to break. Now this is going to break out of the loop. So let's give this a shot and see what happens. So it finds John, Terry, and then it found Eric. Space. And then it jumps out of the loop and it goes down and prints the for loop done. Okay, what if we use the continue statement? If we run with continue, it finds John, Terry, found Eric, then it continues with Michael, and then George, and then the for loop is done. So what it does here is when it hits the continue, it goes back up to the top of the for loop. Now that's different to if we remove it completely. So now we have neither break nor continue, and we run it. Then we see we have John, Terry, found Eric. Then we have Eric again, Michael, and George. That's because when it finds Eric, it then continues inside the for loop and runs the print friend, which is Eric, which we just printed found friend because friend is still Eric. Okay, great. So that was break and continue statements. Those are good to keep track of because you can use them for different things when you're controlling your code. The last thing we're going to cover are nested loops. And a nested loop is basically a loop inside another loop. So I'll show you. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll exchange this for a for loop instead. So we'll put another for loop inside the first loop. And we'll say for number in then a list. One, two, three. And we will print friend, comma, number. Like that. We'll remove this. And we'll remove two names just to make the printout a bit shorter. So what's going to happen here is that first the top loop is going to run. So we'll go and find John. And then it finds the next for loop. So it goes in and for each one of the numbers, one, two, and three, it's going to have John as friend and then it will run numbers. So it should print John one, John two, John three. Then go up and get Terry. Do the same thing again. And I should not forget colon here. John 1, 2, 3, Terry 1, 2, 3, and Eric 1, 2, 3. For loop done. And that's it for for loops this time. Hey, welcome back. It's great to see you again. It's awesome to see that you've gotten this far in your Python programming. And I'm sure you feel that you've learned a lot because you really have. So let's get started with this for loop exercise. Let's take a look at what we need to do. We've got two lists. So we need to make party invitations. So we're going to have a party and we want to invite our friends. We want to print out invitations for each friend using for loops. Okay, great. So the names are in two lists, names and names one. We also need to add two extra names to the list using an input box when we run the code. So when the code starts, we should see first one and then another input box where we can input a new name. Print out one invitation for each friend or line, and names should be properly capitalized. So the first letter of each name, first and last name, should be a capital letter. And here's an example of a printout. Okay. And then we may need two for loops to solve this exercise. So that's the exercise. You know how to do this now. Just pause me, and we'll make this thing small again. And then just get coding, try it out, use print to debug your code, and then come back to me in a few seconds. All right, welcome back. I'd love to see your solution because I'm sure that you've solved this very well. So let's take a look at one way of doing this. So first, let's just write part of the message, the message that we're going to use for all of the people. Let's call that message. Message, and let's say something interesting like, you are invited to party Saturday, period. So that's going to be the text that all of the friends get. Next thing we need to do is combine our two lists because we've got two lists of names and we want all of them to be in the same one. So we can do that in many ways. I'm going to show you two. The first one, let's just extend names. So we'll say names, extend with, what do we want to extend it with? Well, names one. That will create 
a new list, or rather it will extend names with the contents of names one. So we get one long list that contains all the names. Great, so we've done that. Another way we can do this is to say names gets names plus names one. And we're going to start with the top one. So then we'd like this input box. So let's just start with an input box. So input, enter a new name. So where do we want this new name? Well, we want to append it to our names list, right? So let's say names, append, and we'll put that inside parentheses. There we go. And we want to do it twice. So we'll need a for loop or another loop. So we'll say for index in range, let's say two. That means we're going to run through the numbers zero and one, but not two. And then we need to indent this, and that should give us the two input boxes. So that's great. The next thing we want to do is print out the actual invitations. So this time we want to run through each one of the names in our new names list and the two added ones we've just made. So for name, and the name is just a temporary variable that I can call anything, in names. That's the actual name of the list. So that means it's going to iterate through all of the items inside the names list. New line. Let's create another message. We'll say message one gets, and we'll use an F string because that feels like it's best practice. So the first variable we want to use is name, right? Then maybe an exclamation point, a space, and then the generic message that everybody gets. So message. Then we want to print this. There we go. Let's give that a shot. We get a pop-up box. We'll get our first person, John J and Jamie Lee. So there's our printout. One row for each person, and we have John J and Jamie Lee at the end. Looks like it's printing out well. And Terry here only doesn't have a last name because he doesn't have a last name in the names one list either. But they aren't very well capitalized, so we need to handle that. How do you do that? Well, let's go to the name here and let's title. So using the method on the string called title, that's going to capitalize the first letter of each word, which is what we want for a name, right? Let's try it again. Get a pop-up box, John J and Jamie Lee. Now that looks a lot nicer. Now let's take a look at the names up here. Now we'll uncomment the second one and comment the one we've been using and run it again. So John J and Jamie Lee. Again, it works. Now let's try this instead. You think that's going to work? Let's give it a shot. John J, Jamie Lee. That works too. Great. There's one other way we could print, of course, using a normal concatenation or not an F string. So we could say message one gets name, title, plus, we'll insert our exclamation point with the space, plus message. We'll comment out the first one, run that, pop-up box, John J, Jamie Lee, and look at that, that worked too. So we managed to solve this birthday invitation, or at least party invitation, I don't know if it was a birthday. I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you in the next tutorial. The enumerate function, and we're going to travel back 2,000 years and imagine that we work at the ticket office at the Coliseum, and this weekend there's a big gladiator game going on, and we want to keep track of who gets in first, and right now there's a line of five people outside the Coliseum, five friends in fact, and we write their names down on, I guess, a piece of stone or something, and then we bring them back to put them into the computer, and let's not discuss the computer anymore, or how we get power for it, let's just continue. So now the big dog, the Roman Pontius Pilate, shows up, and he wants a list of the people that are in line so we can see who gets in first. So we naturally know how to do that, so we say, for friend in friends, and then we'll print friend. Very happy with ourselves. There's our list, we give it to Pontius, and we say, are you happy? And he says, no, I want them numbered. How do you want them numbered? Well, I want a number in front of each one of them. I want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Our loop doesn't really help us with that. We don't have a number that we can use. Now, naturally, this is an old problem. And in most programming languages, you would solve it in this way. You would create an iterator called i almost always. Set that to zero. And then we run the loop, and then we print the i with friend. And then we increase the i. So we set i gets i plus one. Or, of course, the other notation, which can be plus equals one, right? So if we run that, he gets his list. He's not terribly happy with it starting at zero. He wants it to start at one. So we'll oblige and we'll change the iterator start to one. And then we'll run it again. 
Now, there's a list, and he's sort of happy, but he's thinking a bit. So while he's thinking, let's see how we could solve this in a more Pythonic way. It turns out that the nice people who created Python for us gave us a special function. It's called enumerate. So if we take this and copy it, and we say for friend in friends, but we use the function enumerate like that and then what we need to do is say for num we could actually say i to make it exactly the same as the other one but since it's python we're going to use nice things that we understand what they mean so for num friend in enumerate friends print num friend and we don't need this incremental thing here so let's run that so first we have the old school loop, and then we have our own, starting with Brian. But it also starts at zero, so what do we do about that? Well, the nice people at Python have thought of us again. So there's actually an option to introduce a starting number. So let's start it at one and run it again. Now, as you see, they both look the same. So that's awesome, right? But now Pontius Pilate is coming back and he doesn't look too happy. He says, well, that list is nice, but um, I think they should go lower down on the list. Why is that, we say? Well, I have a few of my friends who'd like to come and they would like better seating. Right, so how many friends do you have? Five, six, mm, 50. Okay, so we'll change this number to 50. Actually, I guess we'll change it to 51 since all 50 of them probably want to get in or will be crucified. And then we change the iterator to 50. Run it again. Aha! So now we've solved Pontius' problem. Now let's look at what this function enumerate actually does. And we'll do that by copying this. And then I'm going to pretend that I'm the computer. So we're going to say e friends, and this is our enumerated friends. So what it actually does is it goes in here and it says, in this case, 51, comma. And then I'm not sure if it does a highlighting like this. Does that. Makes it into a tuple. Does the same thing with this, 52. And it does this, 53, 54, and 55. And then, of course, we need to make them into tuples. So we'll do that quickly. So that's basically what the function does. It goes into the list, turns all the elements inside it into tuples, and puts a sequence number in front of them. So that, of course, is useful not only for printing, but if you want to modify a variable in this way and have a counter on it. So let's look at what it actually is. So let's say print the type of the enumerated friends. And then we'll copy that and we'll turn it into a list. Let's comment out this code. We don't need it. We'll see that when we run enumerate, it actually turns into a separate class or data type called enumerate. And we see below that when we print it, we actually do get those tuples inside that list, which looks very much like the one we had up here, except the numbering isn't great because we don't have numbering on this one. So it starts from zero. So let's look at a couple of examples of what you can do with this. For instance, if we don't want to use this number or the sequence number, we copy that. And we say only for friend. And then we print only the friend. Then you see we print the separate tuples. If we were to do the same thing. But we enumerate the enumerated object. And we number that from minus 100. What's going to happen then? Then you see that we get a tuple with a tuple inside. And the first one has a sequence number minus 100, 99, 98, 97, 96. Those are increasing in size since they're negative. And then we have the other tuple with the other numbering inside. Now this isn't just for lists, of course. We can do this with tuples or with strings. With dictionaries and sets, not so much. It doesn't make sense there because they're not really sequences. Let's go back to this one and paste that and try with a string. So let's change this to Python. And we'll say for num, we'll keep that, and then we'll call this letter in enumerate python 51. And we can actually use a keyword, which is start, equals to say five. And then we print num and letter. What do you think that's going to result in? Exactly. It's going to give us five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and python. So that was a short introduction to enumerate, and I'm hoping you find some interesting things you can do with it. And I will see you next time. Print my tube. When we looked at lists and strings, we did some sorting. And by now, you may have figured out that the results of the sorting isn't always clear, depending on if you use the sort method on the lists or if you use the sorted function. I thought I'd try and bring some clarity to this. So here, 
we have a list, a dictionary, a tuple, and a string. We know that lists are mutable, so we can change them. That's why they have a sorting method. Dictionaries are a bit special, we'll get back to those, but they are also mutable. Tuples and strings are immutable, so they naturally don't have a sorting function because you can't change them at all. If you want to change them, you turn them into something new. So if you compare the method on the list item, sort, with the sorting function, you'll find that the sort method doesn't actually return anything. It just does the work of sorting. So it goes in and sorts the list. It doesn't return a new list, whereas the function sorted actually returns a new object that has been sorted. So let's take a look at what that actually means. So let's start by printing my list and we'll say this is the original so let's run that so that's the original my list right now if we go ahead and sort this and try and print it using the sort method what's going to happen we get nothing print can't print anything because nothing is being delivered however we copy this and print the list again and call it new so when we print the list again, we see a sorted version of the list. Even though we weren't able to print it, it has actually been sorted. Now the same is true if we use the reverse. We see that we get a none, and then the new list has been reversed. Not sorted in reverse order, but just reversed. Now let's take a look at the sorted function. So let's do this. Sorted, my list. And the parentheses. Now we see that the sorted function actually yields a new list down here. But we also see that the print of the my list is still the same as it was in the beginning. So this is actually a new list that we've created here. And it's actually the equivalent of doing the following. Copy that. We'll say my list one equals sorted version of my list. And then we'll print my list one. So that yields exactly the same thing. And what we're actually doing is creating this new object. We're just not naming it when we're printing. So let's get rid of this again. So let's take a look at what happens if we start printing some other things. Let's print a sorted version of my tuple. So now when we sort the tuple, we don't actually get a tuple. As you see here in the middle, we get a list. If we print my tuple, it's still the same thing that it was before. Let's try and do the same thing with the string. We have the Python string, and then we have the new Python, which are both the same. And then we have our new object, which again is a list with the individual letters sorted in order, in this case, in ascending order. So let's move on to the dictionary. What happens if we sort a dictionary? So we have the dictionary on top, and in the middle we have the sorted version. So we see what we've actually managed to do is sort just the key values in ascending order. So that's all we get. We've lost a lot of information. There are some other ways we could approach that same thing. For instance, we could sort my dictionary items. If we run that, we now get the results of the dictionary, but we get them as tuples inside a list. And again, they've been sorted on the key, so the first element. So add, b, car, and dog. As we did when we call the dictionary without any method, we can call the values. Now we're going to get the values in ascending order. Just as we could with the sort method, we can sort in reverse. So we can say comma reverse equal to true. And if we do that, we'll get the values in reverse order. So the syntax on both of those functions are the same. So let's go back to the list. And instead of sorted, we can use the reversed. And when we run that, we get something called a reversed object. So if we want to take a look at what that looks like, we need to turn it into a list. Now we get a reversed object, which again does not sort in reverse order. It just flips the list around. Now as a last example, we'll show a special case with lists. And that's a slicing syntax where we can say my list colon colon minus one. What do you think that's going to yield? That does the same thing we just did. It reverses the list. So with that, we'll take a look at some ways you can use the key feature when you're sorting. So let's get a new list and then a list of lists. So the top list has some negative values in it. So if we sort it, we'll get them in the order that we would expect. But what if we wanted to sort them in absolute value order? Then we can use the key feature. So we can say key. And then we input the name of the function that we want to use, in this case, the absolute function. If we just do that, 
they will now be sorted in order of the number, regardless of whether it's a positive or negative number. So you can basically put any function inside this key and it can get kind of convoluted and complex. And we'll try to cover this in a later tutorial. I'll give you an example of how you can actually sort something like a list of lists. So let's take the one we have here and we'll change to my list. So if we start by sorting that, we see what we get. The list of lists has been sorted by the first element, so what we have here, add, and then the others follow, so a, b, car, and dog. So if we want to use a key, we can say key gets, and now instead of a built-in function, we can define our own function using a lambda function. A lambda functions are throwaway functions that you can write on one line. They're really convenient, and we have a separate tutorial on them. So lambda, and then we'll say item, so that's the item in the list that we are trying to sort. And then we write the actual command, which is item. So that's the list inside the list. And then we specify which index in the list we want to sort on. So if we want to sort on the same one we just did, we'll input zero. So if we run this, it sorts the same way. If we input one, so that's the second index, run it. As you see, now it's the second element, the one, two, three, and four. If we sort it on two, it now sorts on the last item, so 10, 24, 30, and 65. Hopefully that cleared some things up, and I'll talk a lot like ordinary. Let's talk about dictionaries in Python. Dictionaries store name value pairs, or key value pairs. So they're a lot like ordinary dictionaries. You look up a word, that's the key, and then you get a definition or a translation, that's the value. So for instance, if you have short names for months, like January, that's January. And then you would have Feb, which is February. Now that could be seen as a dictionary. It's sort of a translation table. So on the left, you have the key value, and on the right, you have the value. So let's get rid of that, and let's build a new movie dictionary. So we'll give the dictionary the name movie, and that will get curly brackets, move to the next line, and we will give it some input. So we'll start with the title, separate by colon, life of Brian, and with a comma. Next one is year, colon, 1979, comma, and then we have the cast. We'll make that into a list. So we've got John, Eric, Michael, George, and Terry. So now we've created the key value pairs. So we've got the key here on the left, title, year, and cast. And we've got the values on the right, Life of Brian, 1979, and the cast. And as you see, we have a string, a number, and list. And we can actually use any data types. And we'll go down here, and we'll print movie. So now it prints the whole thing. Got the title, the year, and the cast. So what if we just want to print part of it? So for instance, just the title. Then we use the same kind of syntax that we use to get numbers from a list. So we'll say movie, and we'll write the string. So in this case, we want the title. That's the key. So we get Life of Brian. What if we ask for something that doesn't exist, like the budget? Then we're going to get an error. And sometimes you don't want errors in your return values. So to avoid that, we can use the get method, which we run on the dictionary. So we say movie.get, and then we specify what the name is. So in this case, we don't have budget. So what are we going to get back? Then we get back none, which is essentially an empty object. And that's sometimes more preferable. And what if we want to set a default value? Well, we can do that too with the get function. We can't when we're asking for it in the square bracket notation. So we can say budget, comma, not found. And now when we run it, we'll get a different answer, not found. So we can specify what we're going to get by using a default value. Another thing we might want to do is update the dictionary. So how do you do that? Well, you can just specify what value you want to update, again, with the square bracket notation. So we'll go down back here, and we'll say movie. We'll change the title. So we'll set that equal to the holy grail. And then we want to move this. And we want to print something, so we want to print the new title. Movie, get, title. Close parentheses, run it. Now we get the holy grail instead. And if we want to set something that doesn't exist, that can be done also. Go here, new line, and we set movie budget 
equals 250,000 pounds. And then we ask for the budget. We've now updated with a new entry in the dictionary. So if we print the whole dictionary, we've now added the budget to the end, the over here. If we want to update the whole dictionary, we can do that as well with the update command. So let's try that. So we'll say movie.update and we'll send in a dictionary. So that's curly brackets. We'll leave this and separate with a colon. Next we have year, colon, 1975. Then we have the cast, colon, and miraculously it's the same cast as before. Strictly speaking, we don't need to update it since it's already there. Then we close with a curly bracket and end the update command, the close parentheses. Now what do we get? Now we've updated the Holy Grail, 1975, and the same cast. Great. Other things we might want to do with the dictionary is delete entries from it. So let's try and do that. So one way to do it would be down here to delete. Use the del command. So we'll say delete movie year. That should delete the year. And then we'll see what happens when we print it. Now we see that the year is gone. A more often used and more useful way to remove values, while at the same time using the value in your code, is to use the pop command that we used for lists as well. And that's done in the following way. So let's specify a variable. We'll call that year. Gets movie dot pop. And then we pop the year. Then we'll print year. So now we've printed the movie and underneath 1975. So we pop the value from the dictionary, so it's gone, but we saved it in a variable and now we have it printed. So you can also get some other data from the dictionaries and we'll get rid of this first and this. So if we want the length of the dictionary, how many entries there are, we can ask for length. So we use the len command, same as in the lists. That gives us three. We can also print the keys or the values or both of them. So we can start by printing movie.keys. And that gives us the dictionary keys, title, year, and cast. We can print the values. So we've got those. We've got a string, a number, and a list. We can also ask for the items. As you see, the results now are actually tuples. So the title, Life of Brian, year 1979, and cast with its string are each tuples. Now, another thing that you often do is that you want to loop through all the items in a dictionary. And it looks like this. For key in movie, and then we're going to print the key. If we run that, we get the title, year, and the cast, but we want both. So in order to get both of them, we need to extend up here and use both the key and the value. And we need to use the movie.items. So for key value in movie.items, and then we're going to print the key and the value. So there you see, now we have the title, Life of Brian, year 1979, and the cast with the names. And this, is the, and this is the for loop that you'll probably use a lot when you're working with dictionaries. And with that, I'll leave you for this time. Welcome back. We're going to do some more with dictionaries. So here is where we finished, and let's paste in some new dictionaries. Here we go. Here are three dictionaries with people and ages. And these are just ages that I'm assuming that these people have had at some point in their life. In the case of Brian down here, that's, I think, about as old as he got. So like sets, dictionaries aren't ordered, and they also can't contain duplicate values, at least of the keys. They can, of course, contain duplicate values. So no duplicate keys, like there can only be one Arthur in the Holy Grail dictionary, but there can be multiple values that hold the value 40. That's not a problem. And like sets, membership tests are really quick. So let's look at doing a membership test. So how do we do that? Well, let's say we're going to print if Arthur is in Holy Grail. And that should give us a true if he is. So let's see if he is. He isn't. Now why is that? Well, it's pretty simple. It's because it's case sensitive. So if we make it Arthur with a capital A, voila, it becomes true. That's important to remember. All right, let's do something more interesting. If is not in Python, then we're going to print a message. So we'll say print. He's not here. As you see, this didn't work too well because we now have an apostrophe that's actually a quotation mark. So we need to do something about that. How about we escape that character? 
There we go. Now it works. So if Arthur is not a part of Python, which he isn't, it should print he's not here like that. And he's not here. Great. But if we asked if he was in Python, it would print true and then it would print nothing because the if statement is not going to execute this print line, right? So we'll go back to that. Now let's look at concatenating or putting several dictionaries together. How can we go about doing that? Well, there are three different ways I thought I'd show. So we'll start with creating a few dictionaries. So we'll call them people. So people gets an empty dictionary. We'll copy that, create another one and another one. We'll call this one number one, and we'll call this one number two. So our first method is the update method. This allows you to take one dictionary and add another one to it. So we'll say people, update, and then we'll update it with the dictionary Python. And then we will print people, see what happens there. So we've now printed the dictionary at the bottom here. And we see that it's only the Python one. Now, if we wanted to add all of these dictionaries together, we could copy the same code again, or mostly like that, except this time the people dictionary now already has Python. So let's add Holy Grail. And then if we print it this time, it now has more. Now it has the characters from Holy Grail as well. And if we do it again, we can add the Life of Brian cast like so and print that and now we get all of the ones from all of the dictionaries so that's awesome right so that's one way of doing this so let's look at number two a comprehension so in this case we'll say four groups in and then we'll choose python and holy grail as a start and then a colon and then we will say people one update with groups. So that means it's going to take what we're calling groups. So that's actually first, it's going to be Python, then it's going to be Holy Grail. So it's using the same code, it's just doing it in a comprehension. So first, it's updating with the Python, then the Holy Grail. And then if we print that, like this, we'll see that now we get a print that only contains part of what we had before. So that's not the cast of Life of Brian, we need to add that as well. So let's do that. Life of Brian, Run it again. Now we see that we have exactly the same result again. Now as our last version, we'll run method three, unpacking. And that works in Python 3.5 and later. Okay, so if you have an older Python, not gonna work, or at least not very well. So in this case, we have people two, and that gets double star. That's the unpacking key. Python, then a double star. Holy grail, double star. Life of Brian. And then we'll print people two. Now let's see if we get the same result. Let's take a look at this. And it turns out we get the same result, but it's not sorted in the same way. Now, I'm actually not sure why it's not sorted in the same way, so I can't give you a good answer to this. But we know that dictionaries are inherently not sorted or ordered. So let's do something about it. Let's sort them to make it easy. So we'll do sorted. We'll do the same thing here. And the same thing on the last one. Now when we run it, now we only get the keys, which is not really what we wanted. We want the items as well, but at least now they're ordered in the same way, right? So let's add the items. Copy this. After we add a dot, here we go, put that there, put that here. Now we run it, and voila, we get the result we were looking for. The last thing that we might want to do is sometimes we want to find the sum of all of the values that we have. So perhaps it's a shopping cart and we want to add all the numbers together. So the way to do that, if we print, write a text, say, sum of the ages is something, and then we write sum people values. We look at the bottom here, we see the sum of the ages is 531. So that's how you sum over a dictionary in this case. However, if we make one of these numbers a string, it's going to crash. So let's run it again. So we get the list, but when we come down here to the sum, it's not going to work. So be careful about the values that you have inside. So which one of these methods to put the dictionaries together should you use? Well, if you just have two dictionaries, a regular update works fine. You just take the original one. We didn't have to create a new one called people. We could have used Python and added the holy grail to it, and we would have been done. If we want to do more than two, then using the comprehensions works really well, because that's only one line of code. And so does the unpacking. That works well as well, if you're over 3.5. So I hope that was useful, and I'll see you in the exercise.
by Germanic tribe. All right, let's do an exercise on dictionaries in the form of a fantastic adventure game. Well, maybe it's not even a game. The instructions are up here, and we have a slide which tells us the instructions as well. So for our first version, and for the other ones, the background is the following. Our village is being attacked by a Germanic tribe. Those are dangerous. And you need to run to the store and get some stuff to help us save the day and probably some girl or boy that we want to marry. All the prices that we see are in gold pieces, excluding VAT, because let's face it, back in the old days, VAT hadn't been invented. So hurry up, the Germans are coming. The first version that we're going to build now, the code should allow us to get one thing from each store. So if we have several stores, that's probably a for loop working there somewhere. And each item you get should be removed from the store inventory, and then do the same for the next store. One way to buy would be by typing the key newt, for instance, in an input box. At the end, we should print the items that we've taken or bought. In this version, we don't have to worry about paying for stuff or adding it up, so that's great. We'll hit the other versions in later casts, and we'll start with this one. If you want to do these as well, 1.2, 1.4, 1.5, you're welcome to it. But otherwise, we'll finish those in some other casts. So let's get cracking and take a look at what we can do. So the code instructions are up here, and I've added the three shops. The freelancing shop in form of a dictionary, the antiques shop. First, we have a name that doesn't have a price, right? And then we have the same thing in the antiques shop and the same thing in the pet shop. Then we have the stuff that you can actually buy. So you can buy or rent, I guess, Brian, the Black Knight, Bickus Dickus, and the Grim Reaper, and a minstrel. If you're wondering what a minstrel is, it's a performer from the medieval times. And the reason it's negative is probably because they weren't very good very often. Then from the antique shop, we can buy a French castle, a wooden grail, a scythe, which is a sickle, which is what the Grim Reaper normally carries, a catapult, or a German joke on a piece of paper, whatever that is. Then in the pet shop, we can buy a blue parrot, a white fluffy rabbit, or a newt. And a newt is a small lizard. Right. So if you want to, you can either just start writing the code here, or you can extend the code that I have down here, which is what I'm going to be doing later. I have some instructions here. The ones that are capitalized are basically where you need to type and change some code, and maybe add some other stuff that you want to. So get cracking, and I'll be back in a little bit to show you one way to do this. All right, I hope you gave that a shot, and I'm sure it worked awesomely. If you didn't, give it a shot, and then come back. I'll still be here. I'm waiting. All right, I'm here. So let's take a stab at this. So we start with a cart. Then we're going to loop through our stores or dictionaries. So first, I'm going to remove this, bring it up closer. So we need to loop over our three shops or our three dictionaries. So that's three of those. Let's loop over just two of them to make it easy in the beginning, and then we'll add the third one at the end. Four shop in what are they in we'll do a parentheses we'll say freelancers and antiques now if you want to stop at any time and continue the code from where i am you're free to do that as well of course so let's get rid of this there we go so there's our for loop and then we have our buy item so this is the item that we're buying from the store so it says input and f string welcome to and then the name of the shop those are the ones that i put up here name freelancing shop name antique shop name pet shop so we need to input one of those so the way we could write that that's just getting the value from a dictionary we've learned how to do that right so we could say antique and then square bracket, and then put the name of what we want, which is name, right? Except we don't want the antiques name every time, right? We want what we've called it in this for loop, shop. So let's change antiques for shop. And then it asks us, what do we want to buy? Well, we would like to buy something that they have in the store. What do they have in the store? Well, that's actually just the dictionary. So here we just input the name again, antiques, that will give us just the antiques all the time. That's not what we want, so we'll do shop again. So that should give us an input box that gives us some information about what we can buy and allows us to type in what we want to buy. Then we need to update the cart, and then what we'd like to do is make it lowercase, because people can't type. And then look at that, it's all blue. We need a end of that F string, so there we go. Then we're going to update our cart with the contents of what we just bought. We need to create something into our cart, which is going to be a dictionary. So we're going to insert a key val, and our key val is that text that we just got. So that's buy item. That's a string, and that string is going to give us some form of value. From what dictionary? Well, again, we could write antique, but we're not going to do that because we're going to write shop. 
And then what we want to do is what? We want to remove the item, remember? It should be gone from the inventory. So we're going to pop it. What are we going to pop? Well, here's where we need to enter the key value, which is the one we typed earlier in this row. So buy item. Because that's a variable name, we don't need the quotation marks, right? So that's all well and good. And then the print statement is going to tell us what we purchased. What did we purchase? Well, we just purchased the cart, right? And we've added some stuff to that cart because we've been updating each time in the for loop here, cart update. So the first time it's gonna give us whatever we bought from the freelancing thing. Then the second time it's gonna give us what we bought from the antiques store. So we're gonna put the cart here and say cart. And what do we want from the cart? We want just the keys. So those are the names of the items. And with a bit of luck, this should run. Let's try it. So I get a pop-up. I'm going to buy Brian. Let's not worry about what they do at the moment. And then I'm going to buy a catapult. So there we go. You purchased Dict Keys Brian Catapult. Today it is all free. Have a nice day of mayhem. So that was almost nice, except I don't like this formatting. Dict Keys, not very good. Let's say that was a receipt. We don't want that kind of information on the receipt. Let's try and make that into a list. Let's say list and see if that makes it any nicer. So we'll run it again. So I'm going to buy the minstrel this time. And then I'm going to buy a scythe. So this time we purchased Minstrel Scythe. Today it's all free. Hmm, I kind of like it, but it's inside a list. I'd like it to be just normal text. So how do we do that? Well, we've learned how to join lists into text before. So let's do that. So what's the syntax for that? Quotation marks, and then whatever we want to split with. I want to split with a comma, and then a space afterwards. And then there's a dot, and then we have the list, which we need to join. Parentheses, close parentheses. Close parentheses. Let's try that. So I'm going to buy the Grim Reaper. That's death. That should be good. And then we're going to buy a scythe for him. That's a sickle. That's what the Grim Reaper uses. So now we purchased the Grim Reaper and scythe. Today it's all free. Have a nice day of mayhem. Well, that's awesome. I'd like to enter a period there. And then as good form, you should probably not make calculations like this and format stuff in your final print string. So let's move that outside of this print string. So we'll take all of this text and call it something instead and make a variable out of it. So we'll cut that and let's put it here. Let's call it the items we've bought. So buy items and we'll say that that gets the thing that we just had there. So this thing. And then let's put buy items in here. And then let's also add our pet shop up here. So now we're really going to buy from all the stores. So let's give this a shot. First store, I'm going to buy the Grim Reaper. Then I'm going to buy a Scythe for him again. And then what do we buy? Well, the blue parrot from Monty Python tends to be dead, if you've seen that sketch. So let's buy him a blue parrot to keep him company. That should make him happy. You purchased Grim Reaper, Scythe, Blue Parrot. Today it's all free. Have a nice day of mayhem. So I think we'll win this war. That's awesome. So I'll see you in the next cast where we can talk about future versions of this. Okay, it's time for version 1.2 of our exercise. Let's take a look at it. So we need to add the ability to exit the store if we type exit or if we try and buy or type a non-existent item. We also need to add a purse with a thousand gold pieces and then fix all the payment things so that we can see how much we bought for, how much we paid, how much we got back, those kind of informations that might be interesting on a receipt, for instance. So let's start there, and you have a crack at that, and I'll be back with one way to solve it. There are obviously many ways, but this is sort of going to be a slightly dictionary-centric way to solve this. Go ahead, I'll be back in a sec. All right, did you try that? I hope you did, otherwise, go back and do it. You done? Great, let's take a look at this. The first thing I thought we'd try and handle is this part about exiting, if they type exit or if they buy something that doesn't exist. So that's the for loop we're talking about. We're inside a store, and we want to leave the store without buying anything, or if, leave the store if they buy something that actually doesn't exist, right? What we need to do is enter some if statements. First, a comment. There we go. So if the buy item so that's the string text that is entered by the user. If that's equal to, so not gets, but equal to, exit, colon, then we're going to do something. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to continue. I jump to the next iteration of the loop. So just leave the store. So we'll go to the next shop. 
Okay, the other part is if they buy something that doesn't exist. So in this case, it will be if the buy item, we need to do a membership test and see if the buy item is actually inside the dictionary. So if it's not in, so if it's not in the dictionary and the dictionary is shop, we need to do something. Same thing, continue. Great, so we're done. That should make us exit and should handle any case where we buy an item that doesn't exist. Let's try it out. Running the code, first store, I buy a minstrel. Second store, I type exit. Third store, I buy a cow, which doesn't exist. So as you see, the only thing we purchased was the minstrel. The other ones didn't even show up. So it looks like that code runs well. The second thing we want to do is create a purse with a thousand gold pieces. So let's do that. And we'll call it purse. Why make things more difficult than they need to be? And that gets a thousand. So it's just an integer. So that's great. Then we need to calculate the price somewhere, probably down here in the print statement. Just before we do that, let's add some information for the user up here. Type exit to exit store. That should do it, right? So down here in the print statement. Today it's all free. Unfortunately, it's not free anymore. We have to start paying for stuff. So let's say your total is, and then we need some kind of variable there. Let's just say we don't know what the variable is yet. So we'll just have an empty variable there. Gold pieces. And then we want some change. Again, an empty variable. There we go. So let's take the first one. Your total is, what is the total space there? Well, we want to sum all the stuff that we have in the cart. And we have the values up here, right? We've been updating this cart. So we've got the buy items and the values of them. So let's just say sum and the values. Then we copy that. And in the second one, we need to calculate what our change is. So our change is the amount of money we gave them. Let's say we gave them a thousand gold pieces and we need some change back. So that's going to be whatever we gave them, the purse, thousand, minus that total amount of stuff that we purchased for. So that's that same formula. Now with a bit of luck, that should work. Let's run it again. Purchasing Grim Reaper. Also purchasing a catapult. And then we'll purchase a white rabbit. Purchase Grim Reaper, Catapult, White Rabbit. Your total is 580 GP. Your change is 420 GP. Great. Seems like it's calculating correctly because 1,000 minus 580 is indeed 420. Perfect. Except we're using this sum down here twice. That's not optimal. So let's take that sum and let's create a variable for it. Let's call it total sum. And that gets that formula. And then we just replace this text with total sum. Copy it, paste that in there, and that's going to run. Now, while we're on that subject, I'd like to change this text here in the beginning so that it displays not only the names, but also how much they cost. And we're going to do that by creating a string and then reusing that string and adding to the string in this for loop. So each time we buy an item, we add it to the string. So to make life easier, let's start by creating that string. So we'll call it buy items one, and we'll just give it the empty string as the input. That's just to initialize the string. Then we need to grab some values for it. We need to do that before we pop the values here because otherwise we can't access stuff from the original dictionaries, right? Because when we pop them, they're gone and we actually want the one that's being popped. So let's do that here. Update the string. Buy items one gets, and we'll start out with an empty buy items one because that's what it's gonna be on the first iteration. And then we'll concatenate that with something that we've just created. So the first time we come through this, we have a buy item, right? And that's what we want to add. So let's add an F string, F, and we have a variable. And that variable is just the string buy item. So the buy item, that's the Scythe or Grim Reaper or Brian or something. Then a colon, just to make it look more like a dictionary, but it's really not. Then in the second part, we'll put the value. So how much that item cost. So to do that, we need to access it from the dictionary. So the shop square bracket notation, and it's the buy item because that's the text that they input. And then the price in GP, a comma and a space to make things look nice. Then we'll go down here and copy this so that we can compare our results. And we'll just add a one here using our new variable instead. So let's see if that works. Running the code, let's buy the Grim Reaper. And then let's buy a Scythe for him again. And the Blue Parrot as his trusty dead companion. So now you see we have exactly the same text, except the second one has more information. Grim Reaper, 500 gold pieces. Scythe, 150 gold pieces. Blue Parrot, 10 gold pieces. So that's great. 
Now we've handled things so far. Now it's time for 1.5. Print inventory before and after purchases as one department. So basically bring all the store inventory together and then print it before to satisfy the big business from the big city and then after we've purchased the stuff to show that the pop actually worked and also to keep inventory management flowing. So how do we do that? Well, we need to do something at the end of all the code and something at the beginning of the code. So that's the beginning of the day. Let's say this is the beginning of the day. So let's call it morning inventory. Department store gets an empty dictionary. That's just to initialize it. And then we're going to use this dictionary comprehension to create the department store. So for freelancers, antiques, and pet shop, we're going to update the department store with the department. We'll print morning inventory of stores, and we'll sort these. So sorted the items like so and then to separate the text we'll do an extra print line like that we'll copy this for later use go to the end and then we'll get the evening inventory the department store after is a new variable which we'll get we'll use a different notation this time freelancers antiques and pet shop and again needs to be after Python 3.5. We'll paste in what we borrowed from there, move this last one to here, we'll run the code again. Whoops, forgot to make that into a string. And the same here, of course. Now we can run it, except we need to change the department store to the department store after and run that. So let's buy Grim Reaper, let's buy him a French castle, and let's buy a white rabbit. Now, as you see, we first get a morning inventory print, which contains one aspect, which is not really that useful, and that's the name. But notice that the shop is only there once. That's because the other two have been removed because it can't contain duplicate keys. So we've got name and pet shop. That's not really inventory, is it? So we want to get rid of that. We'll do that in a second. Then in the morning inventory down here, which should be evening inventory, we'll change that. As you see, we have a white rabbit in the top one, but the white rabbit is gone, so our popping has worked. That's good. And we've sent a correct inventory, except we need to change the text. So let's do that. There, evening inventory. Now let's look at how to actually solve this problem. The thing that we want to do here is get something that will help us beat this Germanic tribe. And we've been buying the Grim Reaper with a scythe and giving him a blue parrot, and that makes sense. But is, that costs quite a bit of money. Is there a different way to do this? Well, if you know Python lore, you'll know that this white rabbit here is in fact the white rabbit or rabbit of Karbanog, which is a lethal rabbit which will kill everyone who doesn't have armor. And since they're Germans, this brings us to another sketch, which is the one about the German joke, the one that kills anyone that listens to it. Since the people reading it don't know German, they can read the joke and all the Germans attacking will die. So let's try that after we've removed the name of our store. So let's go out here before our print and we'll say department store pop the name so that should remove that we'll do the same thing at the end department store after pop name now let's run it so in this first one we'll buy the minstrel which we're going to get paid for so that's awesome the second one we're going to buy the german joke the third one we're going to buy the white fluffy rabbit now we see the morning inventory no longer has the name of the store. We purchased the minstrel, German joke, and white rabbit. And we actually made money. So our total is minus 5 GP. So our change is 1,005 GP. So we have more money now than we did before. We've saved the village. Everybody's happy. That was a bit long, but I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next Because something. Now we're going to talk about error handling in Python. When you're running code, sometimes you encounter errors and your code crashes. Now, sometimes that's because something you did, and sometimes it's because something happens on the outside of the code. Maybe it receives bad input, or maybe some part crashes, or you can't access a server, or whatever the case might be. When this happens, it's usually a bad idea to crash your program, because other things might be dependent on it. There might be a file open that crashes, and then you lose all the contents of the file if you're unlucky. That's why we have try accept blocks, and they are structured in the following four steps. First, you have a try, which is the first part of the code. That's where you put the code that you'd like to run. 
Then you have the accept part, which is executed whenever you run into some type of error. Then you have the else part, which is where you put the code that you want to execute if everything goes well. And then finally, and finally, you have code that will always run. So that's a good place to clean up after yourself, close any couplings you have to any databases or files or anything else. And this is the actual structure. Now I'll leave this here so that you can reference it. We're going to start with the two top parts, try and accept, because those are the main ones that you need to use. And then we'll go into the last bits. And then at the end, we'll talk about raising exceptions. So let's start with a piece of code. So here's some code that takes in a number from a user, takes 30 and divides it by that number, and then prints out a message. So let's run that and see what happens. So I get a box where I'm asked to input a number. I'll input 5. 30 divided by 5 is 6. Thank you for playing. So that's how that works. Now what could possibly go wrong with this thing? Well, let's try. Let's try and input something that's not a number. Let's try and input a string. So I'll input two letters. Then we get an error. That's no good. What can we do to handle this situation so our whole program doesn't crash whenever we take in a string? Well, we can use the try. So we'll say try, colon, put that inside the try, this inside the try, and then we use the accept statement. So accept, and when accept happens, we will print an error message and say invalid input. We run it again. We enter two letters. Now our program doesn't crash. It doesn't give us an answer, but it doesn't crash. Now we get the string invalid input as our output. So how can we improve on this? Well, we could specify the error that we're getting. So in this case, we won't just do a general exception. We'll do an extra line. We'll do an exception, except something called value error. And an example of a value error is what we just had. So it's the wrong type of value that we're expecting. And we're expecting an int because we've got int here and we received a string. So accept value error. And if we get one of those, we will print bad value. We run it again. Now we get bad value. And the reason we get bad value is because the exceptions run from top to bottom. So anytime it hits an exception, it stops looking for more of them. So it's only going to give you one at a time. So this is a way you can sort of roll through your program and pick up error after error, which can be frustrating. So there we go. To further improve this, maybe we want to handle the specific case when somebody enters a zero and we try to divide by zero, which is no good. So let's enter that as well. Say accept something called zero division error. And when that happens, we'll print, you can't divide by zero. Run this, enter zero, and you get, you can't divide by zero. Now we can improve the readability of the message by adding a keyword here, as. That way we can specify the actual error that we're getting. So specify that as error, and then we'll put that in the print statement. So we'll say error. Say that here as well. Run it. Now let's try with a string. Invalid literal for int with base 10, ll, bad value. Okay, so that's the second exception. What if we run it again and enter a zero? This time we get division by zero. You can't divide by zero. And if we get some other kind of error, we'll get down here to the invalid input. Okay, and now if we look at the rest of the try accept blocks, the else and the finally, how do we use those? Well, under the accept, let's start with the else. So this is the command that we would like to run when everything goes smoothly, so everything works. And that's actually this print statement up here, right? So we'll take that and we'll put it inside the else block. And then finally is where we put the code that always runs. And that's this code. And that should complete our statement. So let's run that and see what happens. So we'll start with entering a number, 5. And it got printed double because we don't need this line up here. Although we need to still calculate the number. Otherwise, we won't get a division by 0. We'll say num1 gets 30 divided by num. We'll run it. We'll enter 0. Division by 0. We'll run it again, we'll enter a string, get an invalid literal. And now let's say that we want to extend this program so that we only accept numbers between 1 and 30. So enter a number between 1 and 30. 
now we're going to use an if statement. So we'll say if num greater than 30 colon, we will raise value error of num. So if this happens, we'll raise the value error down here. And then we'll also put in the number here. So we'll say num. We'll extend this by saying not between 1 and 30. Let's try it. We know the other parts work. So now let's try a number of 35. Ooh, 35, bad value, not between 1 and 30. Will it work for normal values? 20? 30 divided by 20 is 1.5. So that's an introduction to try, accept, and handling exceptions in your Python code. Car. So earlier we looked at different data types, like strings, numbers, booleans, and even more complex ones like lists, dictionaries, and so on. But sometimes you need even more than that. Sometimes you need more special data types to describe something, like maybe a car, a shoe, or a movie, or a student. A class is a custom-made data type that allows you to do that. You can say that classes are a representation of the abstract concept of something, like a blueprint. And then when you actually make something out of those blueprints, you are creating objects. So that's the real version of something. So for instance, the concept of a movie could be a class, and the actual movie, Life of Brian, could be an object of that class. And when we create classes, they have variables, which we call attributes, and functions inside, which we call methods. So I'll paste that in here. Classes are blueprints, objects are the actual things you build, and then variables are called attributes, and functions are called methods. So with that, let's get cracking on creating a class. So to start, we write the keyword class, and then when we name classes, we use capitalization. So if we create a class called new cars, we would use camel casing. So every new word starts with a capital letter. In this case, we're going to create a movie class. So we'll call that movie. Now everything we indent is going to be part of this class. The first thing we're going to do is give, give it some variables, which are then called attributes. And we give it those attributes when we actually create the function, when it's born. We do that with an initialization statement, which is the action that creates the object. So def two underscores init, which is short for initialize, keyword self. So what kind of variables or attributes do we want the movie to have? Probably a title a year it was made, maybe the IMDB score, and whether or not we've seen it, so have seen. Finish with a colon, and now when we name these, we need to start using the keyword self, and I'll explain what that is in a second. So self.title equals title. Self dot year. Self.imdb score. IMDB score. Self have seen equals have seen. Now the keyword self refers to the object that we're creating. So in the class, when we create this new object, that is the self. So you could call that anything, but convention is to use the word self so that everyone knows what it means. You could call it Joe or whatever you want, but don't is my recommendation. So let's start with that and see how we can access some information about this object that we are now going to create. So to create the object, we use the same kind of syntax that we've used before. So we call movie, and then we call it with the parameters that we have. So we'll call it with a title, a year, a score, and whether or not we've seen it. Brian, 1979, 8.1 in score, and true. And we'll call this film1. Now, as an equivalent, you could view this as if we were creating a list. So think of if we were saying message, and we say, hi, how are you? Here we're creating a list and populating it with one object. And above, we're creating one film. We're using the movie to tell it to create an object of the class movie. Let's create another one. Let's create a film too as well. Copy that. Holy Grail, 75.2. And true, this is not film one, but this is now film two. And then we might want to get some information from this. So let's print some information. Let's print film, title of film one, and film one's IMDB score. So it's printed Life of Brian, and 8.1 is the score. Now let's create a function inside the movie class, and so we can use that as well. So we'll go back up here, and we'll create a print function. So define nice print. And that takes in one argument, self. 
and that'll be interesting in a second. I'll explain why. Well then, so what this function will do is print a nice layout of all the details of the movie. So I'll paste in some text here. There we go. So we start out with printing the title, and then we use self.title because we're actually referring to the title of the object that we've just created. Then the year of production, self.year, then self.imdb score, and then self.have seen. Now we'll call this function to print it. So we'll say film2 using the method of that class, nice print. So if we run that, so we get that. Let's comment out this row for a second. So there we go. We have the title, your production, and the IMDb score. As you see, this doesn't take an argument, and that's because it's run on film 2. So the argument is implicit in that call because it's done from that object. Now, this would be equivalent to writing the following movie dot nice print and then specifying the film we're getting this information on. So if we run that, we will get exactly the same result. So we now get it twice. That's how self works. It's always a reference to the object that's active at the moment. Now you might want to create a database of these movies, and we could do that using a list. So we could create something called films and set it equal to film one, and then film two. And then we could of course print information from that. So we could print films one title and films zero a title. And of course we could use the internal method as well, saying films zero nice print, and that would print everything of that referenced object. So at the top we have the Holy Grail, Life of Brian, and then we have the nice print of the films index zero. And that's an introduction to classes and objects. Car class. So now let's talk about inheritance in Python and in most programming languages for that matter. So inheritance is when you have a class, say for instance a car, and then you have another class which will inherit the attributes and methods of that car class. So for instance a car might be able to drive forward, turn, and brake. And if you were building a sports car, that would be able to do all the things that a normal car can do, but it will also be able to drive really, really quickly or have really, really expensive repair jobs. And those methods could be special to that class, but it will reuse the same methods as the original car class. So we'll do an example and imagine that we're creating a game. And in the game, there are a bunch of characters. So we'll start with the first basic character type, a person. So the person in this game has a method move. When it does that, it moves four paces. It also has a rest method. And when it does that, it gains four health points. So in order to use this, we might say, Character 1 equals person, and then character 1 move. So if we run that, we get that the person moves 4 paces. Now if we want to add some more characters to this game, we could do that. So let's create another class, and we'll call this class Doctor. So we'll have a doctor in the game. And the doctor does all the things that the person does, except he's also able to heal and help people get better. So one way we can do this is create the doctor class by copying all the information that's inside the person. But that seems unnecessary, and that's what inheritance is really good at solving. So the way we can handle this instead is simply to say, using the following syntax, that it inherits from person. So that means doctor is a person. So it has all the things that the person has, and then it might have some more. So if we don't have anything more, we could use the command pass, which simply means Python will skip the empty code and a doctor will be identical with the person. But let's create that extra method. So define heal self. He does that. He heals 10 health points. Now, instead of creating a person, let's create a doctor. And he'll move again. We've got the colon. Let's run it again. He's still moving four paces, but now let's have him do something different. Let's have him heal. So he heals 10 health points. So that's great. He can do all the things that the person can do, and he can also do the heal. So let's add another character to the game, a fighter. And he can also do all the things that a person can do. So he inherits from person. But he can also fight. So we'll say he has a method called fight. And when he does that, he causes 10 health points of damage. So we'll say 
Crit. Do 10 health points of damage. There. So let's run our fighter instead. Now let's run him with heal and see what happens. That's going to throw an error. So the person doesn't have heal, and fighter is inheriting from person. So he doesn't have the heal method. That's only the doctor. So let's do something that he can do. Let's fight. Now he does 10 health points of damage. But let's do something else. Let's override the original move function because it turns out that our fighter is actually quite nimble and quick. So he can move faster than a normal person. So he also has a move method, his own or her own. Self. Copy this. And instead of moving four paces, our fighter can move six paces. So this time, let's see what happens when the fighter moves. Now he moves six paces. So that shows you a little bit of what we can do with simple inheritance. But we can also inherit from multiple classes. We'll add another character in our game, the class Wizard. So a wizard can do all the things that a doctor can do. So we'll inherit from the doctor. But he also has his own special method, which we'll call Cast Spell, which turns him invisible. And we'll also override the original Dr. Heal method so that our wizard doesn't heal 10 points, he heals 15. So let's see how that, what happens there. So now we'll create a wizard instead, and we'll heal. Now he heals 15 points. So now we've inherited from the doctor, which in its turn inherited from the person, which means that the wizard can still move because that's inherited from the person. What we can also do, the wizard is sort of a mix between a fighter and a doctor, right? So we could inherit also from the fighter. And that means, of course, that we get these methods as well. So what happens if we move our wizard now? Now we move six paces because that's closer in inheritance. So that's the moves that he's using from the fighter. And that's the way, in general, that the inheritance works. And also, if you have two that collide, it will choose the one that's first in the list, if you have two methods on both. So that's an introduction to inheritance and multiple inheritance. And there's lots more to learn about inheritance. But let's leave it here for now. Same files or mod modules. Now we're going to talk about something in Python that's going to make you look like a much better programmer than you actually are. So when you write code and functions, after you get a lot of it, it makes sense to package the code according to use, putting related code in the same files or modules. And then when you need to use some of that code, instead of just copy-pasting it, in Python you can import that file or module and access the functions, objects, or whatever is inside. Now there are lots of modules you can use in this way, from those that are packaged with Python to those created by other programmers, just like you and me. And they might be made to solve specific problems. And you can use them as long as you can find them, you can import them. Now modules are a really big and important part of Python, and they're imported all the time. So learning how to use them is an important part of your journey to awesomeness. Some common ones are date time for date objects, random for creating random numbers or strings, string for working with string, OS for various parts of the operating system, math for more advanced math functions, browser when you're interacting with the browser, and so on. There are lots and lots of these. In this course so far, we haven't actually imported any modules, but we've just run basic Python commands. To import modules, we need to add some stuff to our workspace over here in the index file. So let's look at this. So the reason we can run Python at all is this Brython add-in. And as long as we're running with this Brython min JS, we can use normal Python commands. Now we need to use this part as well, the Brython standard library, which is bigger, which is going to make the whole interface a bit slower, but that means we can start importing things. So now we've changed that. And a good place to start when you're looking for modules is this URL. So you can copy that into your browser and go check some different modules. All right, so modules. They're really simple to import. All you have to do is write import, and in this case, we'll import platform. And when you import a module, a good thing to always do is to check what it does. And a command to do that is the dir command. And then you run that on, on the module. So let's run that. That gives you all the methods inside the module. In this case, we're going to try out the Python version. So let's do that. And the way you call it is by saying platform python version. 
Now, if we run that, it's going to show us the Python version we're running, 3.7.0. So if we wanted to import more than one module, we could do that by separating them with a comma. So we could import platform, string, and OS. And if we want to access any of those functions inside those modules, we would prefix them with the name, so string or OS or platform. To shorten our typing a bit, we can import them and give them an alias. So we can say import platform as PL. Then I would just change the platform to PL and run it. Now when you do this, you can no longer use the platform command. So if I write platform, it's going to throw an error. So you need to keep track of what you're doing with that. Now to make life even simpler, you might want to import just this Python version so you don't have to type it all the time. From platform import Python version. Now we're explicitly just importing the Python version. And if we want more functions, we can import system, for instance, which is also one of the functions. So now we've imported just those two. And now when we want to access them, we don't need the prefix. So we can just run Python version directly. So now if we run that, we get the same result. And if we wanted to run system, that works too. It shows us the system we're on. So let's go back to our Python version. And this we can also alias. So we can say from platform import Python version as PV. And then we can call this function simply by calling PV. And this will no longer run because we don't, we haven't imported that. So we'll comment that out. Run it again. Whoops. And I forgot the as. So from platform import Python version as PV. There we go. So those are some ways to import modules and aliasing them and importing multiple versions of them. So I really suggest that you go check out that URL and see which ones are there and try this out on your own. And I will speak zip command, which is oftentimes when you're programming, you want to combine different iterables. And iterables are strings, tuples, lists, and so on. Things that you can iterate through. So in this case, we have three different lists, and we're going to combine them in some different ways to see how to use the zip command, which is really convenient. So let's start by creating a new variable, which we'll call combo. And the combo will get to zip, nums, and letters. And then we'll print whatever is inside combo. Let's run that. We get a zip object, and we can't really see what's inside it. So let's turn it into a list. Run it again. Now we see that we get a list of tuples, and they are matched by index number. And that's what zip does. If you have two iterables of the same length, it's going to match them. The first object in the first iterable is going to match with the first object in the second iterable, and so on. Now, interestingly, now we've had three lists, but we could actually change this to a string without the commas. It's still going to be iterable. So the first one, the one is going to be the first zero element, and then two is going to be the first and so on. So if we run that, is it still going to work? You bet. Except now they are both lists of tuples with strings in them. So I could have turned this into a tuple equally, but it turns out I can actually turn it into a dictionary as well. And if we run that, we directly get a dictionary, not a bunch of tuples inside a list, but we get a real dictionary. And that's quite convenient and something we can use from time to time. We can also add even more of these iterables. So let's add the names. Now, of course, the dictionary isn't going to be of much use since it only takes two values. So let's make it a list again. Run that. As you see, now we have a list of tuples with strings in it. Then, sometimes we might want to take this apart. In order to take them apart, we can still use the zip command, but we can unzip instead, but it's not called unzip. You can do it this way. So we'll define three variables, num, let, and nam. So that's for numbers, letters, and names. And then we're going to run the zip command, but basically unzipping. And to unzip, you use an asterisk, and then we unzip the combo. And what we're doing now is actually immediately assigning the results of this unzip into three different variables. And that's something called unpacking, which you can also do in Python, which again is also very convenient. So you see the results. We have the list of tuples and then let's print the results. So we'll print num, let, and nam. And what we did in the first step with the unzip is something called unpacking, where we immediately assign the values of that unzip to three different variables. And now we're going to print the results. So there we go. We're now back to what we started with, except they are tuples now. If we want to turn them into lists, we can do that. So that's zipping and unzipping. Now let's look at a special case with dictionaries. 
So here are two strings, the keys and the values. And the top one is English, this parrot is deceased. And the second one gives you a chance to learn some Swedish. That's denna papigojan är avliden, which means the same thing, just in Swedish. So let's turn this into a translation table. Now the keys and values aren't that easy to iterate over since they have the spaces inside them and it's not obvious where they're actually separated. So the first thing we can do is split them into lists. So we'll say keys, keys, split, and we'll split on white space. Then we do the same thing with values. So they get values, split. If we now print these, keys, values, we get the following. Now we have two lists. So that's awesome. So let's try and zip those into a dictionary. We'll call it English Swedish Dictionary. And the way we'll create it is by calling a dict on keys and values. And then we'll print the English Swedish Dictionary. Now we have a dictionary that says this is denna, parrot is papigoyan, and so on. There's a second way to create the same dictionary, and that's called dictionary comprehension, very similar to list comprehension. So let's create a new one new dictionary. The way we'll create it is we'll say, this is a dictionary, we want the key and the value for key value in in zip keys values, which we have created above. And if we print this, it should be the same thing. And lo and behold, it is the same thing. So that's two different ways of doing the same thing. What about if we want to take this dictionary apart? That's not exactly the same procedure as we would do for the zip lists we created before. So one way would be to use the dictionary's keys and values methods. So we could do the English and Swedish, get, and we now need two different values here. So we have the en, sv, dict. We'll start with the keys. And then the second value is a list of English, Swedish, dict, values. Well, parentheses too many. And then we'll print the ENSV. Run that. Whoops. Ah, that's where the extra parentheses came from. So let's try it again. There we go. Now we've broken it apart again. We have a list. This parrot is deceased. And we have the Swedish version. Another way we could do the same thing is to say EN1, SV1, get. And this time we'll unzip it instead. So we'll say zip, asterisk, ENSV dict items. As you may remember, the items contain all of the items. And then we print those, run that, and we see that we get the same result, but it's now tuples instead. So if we wanted lists, we would need to cast those into lists. All right, so that's some zipping, unzipping, and a little bit of playing with the dictionary. So it's the right thing to use. Lambdas, or anonymous functions, exist in Python and allow you to write single-line function definitions that you might just use once and then throw away, or you can use them multiple times and give them a name. They can be quite convenient, but aren't always the right thing to use. So let's look at some examples. Here's the function for a square, which returns x multiplied by x, so squaring the number. And then we're printing the result, so the square of 3. So if we run that, we get the result 9. If we were to rewrite this as a lambda function, lambdas are defined in the following way. If we want to give it a name, we can. So name gets, and then we say lambda, which is the keyword. Then we specify the parameter we want to use, or the parameters, a colon, and then the actual expression. So as you see, it's quite similar, but not completely like creating a function. So let's try and write the above function as a lambda function. So we'll say square, let's call it one, gets lambda x colon, then we have the expression x times x. Now the return value is implicit in a lambda function, always. So it always returns a value. A function doesn't have to return a value. All right, so let's run square number one. And we see we get the same result. Put the print up here. So that's fun, but how useful is it really in this case? We could write a single line function definition instead, saying def square 2, and then specify the in parameter, a colon, and then return x times x. And that's also valid syntax for creating a function. So if we run that, we also get 9. So as long as it's just on the one line, you could use either of these. But let's focus on the lambdas. So we'll delete this, and let's say we have a double multiplication function. So we have two in parameters, x and y, and we multiply 2 times x times y. Now if we want to call this, we change that. So let's send 2 and 3. That gives us 12. So 2 times 2 times 3. 
So that's how you write a lambda function, but so far we haven't really made them very anonymous. But let's try a different scenario. Let's say that we're taking a username and an alias from an input box in our program, whatever the program is. And then we want to clean those up and put them together, separating them with a colon. Okay, let's write a function for that first. Parameters name and alias, colon. And to return, we want to take the name and strip out any leading spaces or trailing spaces, and then also titleize it so that we have a capitalized letter starting. So the way we do that is we take the name, we start by stripping it, which is a method on the string, and then we also make the first letter a capital letter. Then we concatenate that with a colon, and then with the alias, where we do the same thing. So that's our function. And then if we print an example, so let's say we have, and the string we take in is, let's say somebody doesn't know how to type, John, that's messy enough. And then as a second string, we take in his nickname or alias, Heckler. So if we run this, let's get rid of that top stuff. We've now tightened it up. So it says John Cleese Heckler, nicely capitalized. But we could actually write this as a Lambda as well. So let's say, name and alias one gets, and we'll copy this. We'll say lambda, and we'll take in a name and an alias, colon, and we'll paste the part we just copied. Now, if we run name and alias one, we should get the same result. We'll copy that. We get the same result twice. And naturally, we could do exactly the same thing by doing a one line function definition, which to make it easy, we could just copy this, place it here, and since it's on a one line, we just bring it together and we call that name and alias two. Change this to two. And we also get the same result. So these three methods do exactly the same thing. So let's do something different. Let's say that we have this list of Monty Python members. And then let's print our list. So there's our list. Now let's say we'd like to sort this list. We could do this using a lambda function. So we could say sort using the method. And then as the key, we will input a lambda function. So let's say lambda. We'll use the parameter name. And that name we will split on space. So each one of the names will be split on space. And if we run this, they should be ordered by their first names. So now Eric is before Graham, is before John, is before Michael, Terence, and Terry. So if we wanted to order them by their last names, we would simply say minus one, accessing the last part of that split string. So now they're in order of last names. We could do exactly the same thing by creating a function. And that function could be so that would be the equivalent function. And if we run the same sorting function using the key, but now just importing the name of the function, we will also sort. So now it should first sort by last name and then print out a second one and then sort by first name. So let's input another print statement. There we go. We'll run that. So the first one is sorted by last name. The second one is sorted by first name. So that was an introduction to lambdas. In the next tutorial, we'll dig deeper and see how you can use lambdas to get functions inside of functions. Instances when Welcome to part two of lambdas. So last time we ended up with this sorting function and we saw that we could replicate most of the lambda functions with regular function calls. In fact, you can always replicate a lambda with a function call. But there are some instances when lambdas really come into their own. And we'll take a look at how, and we'll take a look at when that is. So let's start with defining a function of n and have it return just n. If we print this and pass it the value three, we get three. If we take a look at the type of the return value, we should find that it's an integer. And it is. However, what if we do a lambda here? So we say lambda a, the parameter of the lambda function, and then we have a times n. What will be the result now? 
Now we see that the return value is actually a function. Now, so far in this course, we haven't had return values as functions before. What it means is that we're actually receiving a function, and functions can take in parameters, right? So what this actually means is that the function we have is outputting a new function that's using the n value in that function. So the new function that it's outputting in this case, a times 2. So if we created a new function to use this, let's call it doubler, it would call the function with 2. Now this looks like we're just assigning a value to a variable, and we are, but we're assigning a function to the variable. So if we were to run this, say print doubler, we would get a function lambda. But if we send an in parameter as it the lambda value wants, because it's saying lambda a, so if we send the in parameter 3 as an argument, we get 6, because essentially our value 3 is being multiplied by 2, which we specified when we created the function. So if we create another function, which we call the quintipler, or quintupler if you prefer, and we say that that is the function of 5, and then we print that of 3 again, that should give us 3 times 15, and it does. Now this may be a bit abstract, so let's use a specific example and see how that works. Leave this for now. We'll create a new function. And this function is for, let's say, our consultancy, where we calculate the price based on a startup cost and then an hourly cost. So let's call it price calc. And it takes in two values, a start value, or a startup cost, and an hourly rate. So what we're going to do is use this function to create new functions that we can use depending on what type of clients we have. Because essentially, let's say we have two clients. We have people that just walk in from the street, which we charge one rate. And then we have clients who are premium clients who are charged a different rate. So let's return a lambda that takes in the hours. And then it takes the start value plus the hourly rate times the number of hours. So that's our new function. Now we'll create two functions. We'll call the first one walk in cost, and we'll set that equal to price calc, $10 setup fee, and then we'll charge $30 an hour. So that's our first function. And then we'll print walk in cost of a two hour treatment. Before we do that, we'll get rid of these. Let's run that. We get $70. Now let's say that we have a premium customer, our best customers. So premium cost, we set that equal to price calc. And let's say that we only have a $1 setup fee and we only charge $25 an hour. If we print that as well, copy that, call that premium for two hours, we get a different result, $51. $1 setup fee and then $2 at $25 an hour. So now we've created functions that we can reuse in this way by using lambdas. Another thing that lambdas allow you to do is call the function immediately. So you can call it as soon as you create it. So for instance, if we say, and we have A, B, and C, colon, and we have A plus B plus C. And then we can call this function immediately with three numbers, two, three, and 4 using positional argument notation. So the 2 goes into the A, the 3 into the B, and the 4 into the C. And then we need parentheses around this whole thing. So that equates to 9. Now that means that we could call the price calc function directly using the same kind of values. So we could say price calc 125, which is our premium calculation. We want to print it. And then the function that we get, we want to call with the value 2 for 2 hours. And that will give us the same result. We have 51 twice. So that's one way you can call lambdas. Another way, we copy this, is to use default values. If you're going to use default values, always remember to put them last. So let's say that we use ABC and we'll cut away the last parameter. So that way the default value C equals 2 is going to be used. So what do we get? We get 7. We can override it by putting back the number again, and we get back to 9. But again, remember to put your default values last and the values that you have to use before that, so don't mix them. Another way you can call them is to name your arguments. So you can specify that this is B and this is C. And as you remember, it doesn't matter which order you put them in if you start naming them. So if you run this, it gives you the same result because, of course, we've thrown them around, so it doesn't really matter which one we put where. 
The last kind of neat thing to use is to use unpacking when you're working with arguments. I'll show an example of that. If we start with this, and then instead of saying ABC, let's say args, and you can call that anything you want. And then you put an asterisk in front, which will then unpack any arguments you send it. And instead of saying A plus B plus C, let's just say sum of the arguments. So if we run 2, 3, and 4, that again gives us 9. But let's add another argument. Let's add 50. Now you've created something where you can keep adding arguments. So that covers an introduction to lambdas, and we'll continue to introduce some new concepts in the exercise. And if we run it, all right, welcome to this exercise with lambdas. So the plan is that we're going to look at some different functions, and then it's going to be your job to turn them into something lambda-ish. And I'll walk you through it, and then you get a chance to try it on your own, and then I'll show one possible solution. You ready? Let's go. So here's a function on one line, and if we run it, we see that it inputs the number 7, because the function is using the input x, it returns x plus 5. And then we're inputting 2 as the x, so it's x, which is 2, plus 5 is 7. So your job is to turn this into a lambda function. And I've gotten you started here with f equals, and then you just type in whatever you feel should be the lambda function. Okay, so one way to do this is simply to say, lambda x colon x plus 5. And we'll comment out the old one and run this one and see how that works. And we get 7 again. So that's rewriting a single line function to a lambda. Here's our next one. We have a function called strip spaces, which strips the spaces from a string. And if we run it, we see that all the spaces are removed. So your job is to write a lambda version of that function. So give that a try and I'll be right back. As we've said previously, lambdas are really only a different way to specify a function. So we can take this old function and we can say lambda, then we'll use the str as the variable, and then we'll paste in the same string that we had up here, the code. And then if we run strip spaces one instead, that should work. And it does. So we got rid of the spaces. So here we have a function which joins two lists and removes all the duplicates. And the input is list A and list B. We've got list A and list B, and our job is to write a new function that does the same thing using a lambda. So let's first see that it works. Yes, it outputs a list without the duplicates. So now, here's your new function. We'll call that 1 as well, and then I'll come back and show you a solution. All right, so one way to do this is to say lambda, and then we'll bring in list A, and then list B colon. And then again, we're reusing the same code. So why don't we just copy this code? There we go. And then we run this no duplicates one instead. And we get the same result again. Awesome. All right. So here, complete the function. So it returns a function. So this is a function inside a function. So here's the function we have. We've got create quad function, inputs a, b, and c. A doc string, return function f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And then we return a lambda function. So your job is to write this lambda function that should be here. And then you create a function called f, which we've written all the code for. And then you write your own code for a different function g. And then at the end, print the results of both of them. Give that a shot, and I'll be back to help shortly. All right, so here we really only need to follow the instructions above. So we've got a times x and then raised to the power, which is two asterisks, two plus b times x plus c. And then we create our quad function, 2, 4, 6. And then we create another one. Basically, we just have to copy this. The syntax is exactly the same. And let's input some other numbers. Let's say 1, 2, and 3. We run that. We get 22 and 11. Awesome. So here's a sorting exercise. Imagine that you run a fan club, in this case, the Monty Python fan club. And you have a bunch of members and you've asked them to sign up for an event. These are the members that have signed up and you'd like to sort them. So if you sort them using a normal sorting, you will get the following result. Okay, so that gives us a sorting, but not quite the sorting that we'd like. This is what's called a lexicographic sorting. So it's sorting 
first three letters, and then it's seeing the number one. It's not seeing it as 104, but it's seeing it as the number one. So that comes before any number two. That's not what we want. We would like to sort this according to integers instead, as we are used to seeing. So the question is, how can we bypass the letters and go directly to a sorting that makes sense to us? So try and write this function using a lambda inside here. I'll see you in a bit. Okay, so what we're sorting is the signups. And the key that we'd like to use is a lambda. Why don't we call it ID? And then we'd like to sort ID. And then we want to slice that string and use everything after the third character. So we don't want the M, P, and F. We only want whatever number comes after that. So that's three, which is the fourth position. And then all the way to the end. So we don't specify anything. And then we'd like it to sort on integers instead. And then we close off the parentheses. One, two, three. And with a bit of luck, that's going to work. So there we go. The first one is sorted lexicographically. The second one is sorted maybe the way we'd like it to be. Continuing on. So we have a class here called a player. The player has a name and a score. So maybe it's somebody who plays a computer game. We then create three players, Eric, John, and Terry. And we put them in a player list, Eric, John, and Terry in this order. And we specify their names and their scores. Now our job is to sort this using score so that we output the players in our list according to their score. So here's the print function that we're going to use. And here's where you write the code. And basically what you're going to do is just sort the player list based on the score of the different players in that list. Okay, give that a shot and I'll be back. Right, so one way to do this is to say player list. We use the sort method on the list using a key, lambda, and then we can call it something. What we call it doesn't matter, so let's call it player, colon, player, and then what's the attribute? This one, score, right? So player dot score, and then we're going to print it. So let's see how that prints. Okay, so now we have John, Eric, and Terry. So John has the lowest score, Terry has the highest, and he's the last, so that seems right. Then if we'd like to, we can turn this around and say... Reverse equals true. Then they get sorted with the top scorer first, and then the middle one again, and then the one with the least points. So that's that exercise done. I'll see you in the next. Less code. Okay, let's talk about comprehensions. Python comprehensions are a really cool tool that allows to create lists, tuples, sets, and even dictionaries with a lot less code. They're sort of an evolution of maps and filters together with lambdas, but they require less code and are easier to understand. So anything you can do with a comprehension, you can also do with a for loop. So you can use a for loop, it just requires more coding, or more lines of code at least. And since you're at least as awesome as comprehensions are, I'm sure you're going to get along great with comprehensions. So let's get cracking and start trying to comprehend this. So as our first exercise, what we're going to do is try and take the list of numbers, and we are going to square each one of those numbers and print out that list. So the first thing we need to do is create a list. New list, gets, and an empty list. Then we'll say for num in numbers we're going to append to this new list so we indent and we say new list append and we're going to calculate num times num and we're done and we're going to print it so print new list there we go let's run that and see what happens so we get 1 4 9 16 25 36 49 64 and 81 okay great so in order to write a comprehension one thing we could start with thinking is think of this instruction that we had as a sentence so look at this sentence give me a list with num squared for each num in numbers so that's sort of a sentence way of saying what we wanted so let's think in that way while we write the comprehension so we want a new list and that's going to get some form of list, right? Okay, so we have the list. Then inside the list, we want num squared. Okay, so we'll write num times num for num in numbers. And then again, we print new list. So let's see what happens with that. We get exactly the same result. So we managed to do the same thing that the for loop did, but with a bit less code. So now let's modify this a bit. Now let's say we want a different thing. Let's say that we want this instead. Give me a list with num for each num in numbers if num is even. All right, so let's create that list instead. Let's say we want num 
for each num, so we got that, in numbers, and then there's an if statement that we need to add. And the if statement is if the number is even. And how do we figure out if a number is even? Well, we take the modular 2 of that number. So if we divide the number by 2, and it has 0 as the remainder, then it's an even number. If it has 1 as the remainder, then it's an odd number. So let's say if num modulo 2 is equal to 0. All right, let's see what we get. Now in the second printout, you see we get 2, 4, 6, and 8. So now we're no longer squaring the numbers, we just get the number printout. Now if we wanted to get the odd numbers, we could set this equal to 1 and run it. Now we get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Another thing we could do is to say not equal to 0. That would also get us the odd numbers. But let's get back to the old one. Now we could do exactly the same thing using a filter and a lambda function. And that would look in the following way. So we could say a new list, filter, and then a lambda function. And the lambda function would be num, colon, because we just want the num. Then num modulo 2 equals 0, and applied on numbers. Then we print a new list again. But the filter is actually going to give us a filter object. So we need to turn that into a list in order for it to be printed properly. So let's try that and see what we get. There, we get the same result. Now filters are just more complicated to use in my view. All right, so let's look at another example. Let's say that we want a letter number pair for each letter in spam and each number in 0, 1, 2, 3. How would we do that? Well, with a for loop, we can simply do this. So we create a new list, for letter in spam, so that's going to iterate through the string, spam. Then for num in range, 4, so that's 0, 1, 2, 3. To the new list, append the letter and number, and then print new list. So let's try and run that, and we'll comment out these other ones for now. So let's run that. Now you see we get tuples inside the list that contain the letter and then a number, and then the same letter and the next number, and so on, and it loops through that. Now you could create this using a list comprehension instead by reading that text above. We can say new list gets, it's a list, and the first thing we want inside is a tuple of letter and num. We want that for letter, so if we read the text, I want a letter num pair for each letter in spam and each number in 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so for letter in spam, for num in range 4. And again, we print the new list. And if we run this, we'll see that we get exactly the same thing. Now, I've created a slide down here, which I'm going to show you. So the comprehensions actually contain exactly the same code as the for loop. So if we take the for loop here on top, we'll see that we have the new list in blue, for num in numbers in red, and then in green we have new list append. If we look at the list comprehension, which is on the next line, we'll see that we have the blue, we have the green, and we have the red. And then we have the blue at the end because that's, of course, the square brackets for the list. Now the same thing goes for the last one we just did. We have the new list on top, for letter in spam, for num in range 4, new list append, letter number, and then we have the comprehension at the bottom with the same color coding. So you can look at that if you feel a bit confused about how to create these, just to see that all the code is actually there, it's just structured in a different way. All right, so that was an introduction to comprehensions with lists, sets, and tuples. And in the next tutorial, we're going to go through dictionary comprehensions, and that will follow on directly from this one. I'll see you in real list I just made. Okay, so let's clear up our code here and look at dictionary comprehensions. So here are a couple of Monty Python's movies, and then the year that they were produced, and then the names of the people whose favorite movie that was. Now that's actually not a real list, I just made that up, so bear with me. So let's say that we'd like to create a list that contains the movies and the year. So let's try that. So we could do that by saying print list, and then we need to zip the two lists. So zip movies and year. If we run that, we get them combined as tuples inside the list. Okay, great. So using the same analogy that we had with the sentence, let's try the same thing for this dictionary comprehension. So give me a dict, movies year, for each movies year in zip movies year. All right, so if we were going to do that with a for loop, we could say 
new dict gets, and then an empty dictionary, then we would say for movie year in zip movies year. And with a colon, and then we have what we're going to do. So new dict movie year. And then we're going to print our new dict. Let's see what that gives us. Now we get it as a dictionary instead, the same information, just differently structured. Now, how would we write a comprehension to do exactly the same thing? Well, let's give it a shot. Let's look at that sentence up there. Give me a dict, movies year, for each movies year in zip movies year. Hmm. We'll start with a dictionary, new dict, and that gets a dictionary, right? And then inside that dictionary, we say movie year for movie year in a zip of movies year. And we print the new dict. Is that going to work? Yes, it does. We get exactly the same result. So the comprehension did the same thing as the for loop. So now let's say that we want to add some stuff to this. Let's say we only want the movies before 1983. How would we do that? Well, let's extend our comprehension. Let's add an if clause. So let's say if year less than 1983. What do we get then? Let's take a look. We now get a shorter list of only the movies that were before 1983. We don't have the Monty Python Live or Monty Python's Meaning of Life. So that's awesome. Now, what if we only wanted movies before 1983 that start with Python? So let's add another condition. So let's say, and movie. And then since the movie is a string, we can use the method on the string, which is called starts with. Starts with. And the string is going to be... Monty. So let's see what we get now. Now we only get the ones that start with Monty, which are only three. The Holy Grail, Life of Brian, and Live at the Hollywood Bowl. Great. Now let's say we want a list that prints out movies that each person liked. We'll create a new variable. I'll call it n1. But let's say that we create a new list that contains a tuple of name, movie, and year. For name, movie, year in the zip of all three lists. So we have names, movies, and year. If the year is before, let's say, 1981. And then let's print N1 and see what we get. So at the bottom there, we now see John, and now for something completely different, 1971. Eric, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, 1975. Michael, Monty Python's Life of Brian, 1979. Okay, let's say we want to add some actual text to this, so make it more of an information string. So let's go in here and change it slightly. So we'll say, we'll encapsulate this in a list, and we'll say name, and then concatenate that with some text. Favorite movie was, plus the name of the movie, which was from, and then the year, and because the year is an integer, we can't put that in the string, so we have to make a string out of it. So we have to typecast it into a string, like that. And then if we run that, we get a text. John's favorite movie was, and now for something completely different, from 1971. We should probably add a space there. Now, perfect. All right, I hope that was a good introduction to comprehensions, and that you got something out of it, and I'll see you in the... True random. The world around us is often seen to be random, and when you're programming, sometimes you want to mimic that randomness. In Python, you import a module called random when you want to work with randomness. The randomness you create with that module is not true randomness, it's almost true randomness, something people generally refer to as pseudo randomness. When you want to do really secure random generation, you should use some different modules that are also part of Python, but for some reason I can't get to work properly in this interface. But let's get started with the pseudo-randomness. So some things you might want to do is control characters in games or different things that happen in games, or maybe even generate random lists of characters and words. So the first thing you want to do is import the random module. So we'll do that. Import random, and it still runs. That gives us access to the various random functions. Now that we've imported the random, we can run functions by calling them. So there's a function called random, which generates a number between 0 and 1, but not 1. If we wanted to instead generate five numbers, we could use a for loop. So we could say for i in range 5. We get five different random numbers. So that's a number between 0 and 1. 
But what if we wanted to generate a number up to, say, 6? Well, we could multiply this number by 6 to generate that. So now we get a number up to 6. A different way to specify this ourselves would be to use a different function. So there's a function called uniform. And uniform takes two arguments. The first is the first number it should start at, and the second is the second. So now we're generating a number between 1 and 6. Let's try that. Now we have five numbers between 1 and 6, but these are all floats, and we might want to have integers instead. Naturally, there's a function for that as well. So let's start with the simple one, where we're actually mimicking a dice roll. So we can use the randint function, which is similar to the uniform function, in that it's going to generate a number between 1 and 6. 2, 3, 5, 5, 5. You could also change this to be a range. So call rand range, and then it takes a third argument, which is the step. So if I do this, say from 1 to 100, it's now going to choose numbers between 1 and 100 with a step of 2. So it's going to choose from the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on, up till it reaches but not goes over 100. So that means just odd numbers. Let's run that. 989, 91, 55, 87. So that seems to work. If we set it to 2, it would instead choose even numbers. But we don't just have to work with numbers when we're doing randomness. Get rid of this for a moment. Let's add a friends list. And that gets our old friends John, Eric, Michael, Terry, and Graham. If we have a list, we can choose from that list using the random functions. So in this case, we'll say print, and we'll make a random choice from the friends list. And the way you do that is you say random choice friends list. That gave us Graham. If we run it again, it will give us Graham again and Graham again. That is weird. Now we got Terry, fooled by randomness. If we want to draw multiple names, we can use a different function called sample. So we replace choice with sample, and then we say how many samples we want. Now sample is a bit special because it only draws a value once, so it's not going to draw any duplicates. There's another function that does that called choices, but for some reason I can't get it to work in this platform. Probably just a lack of skill on my part. So if you use this, you're not going to get any duplicates. So it would be impossible for me to draw six because that's bigger than the list. So I can only draw the whole list. Another thing we can do is to shuffle. So let's shuffle the list. You can say random, shuffle, we'll shuffle the friends list. And then after we've shuffled it, let's print it. There we go. That's the first shuffle. Let's shuffle it again. And it changes order. So that's working with lists and numbers. But we can do some more things. Move this and paste in this. So here I have the small caps letters, large caps letters, and the digits, which you might want to use when you're generating random strings. Now luckily people do this so much that there's actually constants that hold these values. And in order to get those constants, we're going to import another module called string. And we'll comment that out run it once. And in order to access these constants, we can create a new one called letters and numbers. And we'll set that equal to string ASCII letters. And we'll concatenate that with string digits. So the first one holds both the small cap and large cap letters, and the second one holds the digits. If I wanted to access just the lowercase, I would say lowercase. Or uppercase. In this case, we want all of them. So we'll say letters. And let's take a look at that. So we'll print letters and numbers. So there's the whole string that we've imported, all the small caps, all the large caps, and the digits. So let's do something with this. Let's start with a variable. We'll call it word that gets an empty string. Then we'll do a for loop for i in range. Let's say we want seven characters. We'll say that the variable word is equal to word plus random choice letters numbers and what this should do is generate a string of seven characters and then instead of printing the letters and numbers we print word so here's our string now the first thing we could do is use different notation say plus equals instead of this word plus make it a bit shorter that's going to do the same thing if we didn't want to repeat any of the characters we wouldn't need the for loop we could use say word one gets Join random sample letters numbers and then seven. We'll print that. 
that also generates a string, but it will never have any duplicates. Now, without even having to use the join function, we could use that function I mentioned before, the random choices. So it would be very similar to the one above. So word gets random choices, letter, numbers. And then you can say k equals 7. So that's the number you want. But again, as I mentioned, that doesn't work in this platform. It does work in any other Python implementation you'll run. And it will save you the for loop. And this will generate one where the strings can be duplicated. So that's a little bit about randomness. And as I mentioned, this module isn't truly random. It's pseudo-random. So if you want to use something for cryptography or for generating passwords, you should probably use one of the strings inside the OS or the secrets modules. Good luck with your random generation, and I'll talk to you next time. It's basically, let's talk a bit about performance and how to measure it using the time it module. So earlier today, I looked at some code for the sieve of Eratosthenes, which is basically a way to find the prime numbers within a certain range. So this was the code. It's a list comprehension that runs through all the numbers from one up to 150, and checks that as long as the modula of none of them is equal to zero for all the numbers from two up to x, and x is the number here, so this number is going to keep increasing the whole time, and also checks that x is not equal to one, and that x equals to one only happens that first time. So I suggested maybe you could remove the back end of this, making it like this, removing this and not x equals to 1, because that really only happens the first time with the first number. And we know that 1 is not prime, so why don't we just start at the number 2 instead? Okay, so let's see if these both run. And they give us the same result. That's good. But how do we know which one is faster? Well, at this stage, we don't know. We just know that they both give us the same result. I mean, I made the claim that the second one should probably be better, but do we really know? I mean, is it a lot faster or just a little bit? So let's look at another way to solve the same problem, this code right here, which starts with an empty list, and then it runs through all the numbers in the range 2 to 151, again skipping 1, and then it assumes that the number is prime until it's shown to not be. So it starts with setting is prime to true, then it runs through the range 2 up to the integer of the possible prime raised to a half, which is the square root, plus 1. So that's the number after, so that we actually include the number we want. If possible prime modula num equals to 0, then we set is prime to false, and we break out of this for loop. If it is prime, then we append it to the, uh, this primes list that we have up here that started out as empty, and then we append numbers to it as we go along. So let's make sure that works as well. And it does. So how do we figure out which of these is the faster code? The two first ones look shorter, right? They're list comprehensions. They look really nice. And the second one is all messy and a bunch of indents. And hmm, I wonder if that one's any good. It doesn't really look like it, does it? So how do we do this? Well, we can use the time it module. And because we're going to import something really important when you're in Scrimba, you need to make sure that this bit here, the Brython standard library.js has now been uncommented, which it's normally commented in most of the code that we run, unless we're importing something. So keep track of that, otherwise you're not going to be able to import, and it's not going to fail, and you're not going to know why. So let's import the time it module. Well, that was easy. And then what we're going to do to use that, there's a function inside time it called time it, and we're going to use that. And in order to do that, we're going to encapsulate these calls inside functions. So let's define a function called test1, test2, and test3, and let's put the code inside it. So we'll do that, colon, and we'll remove the print because we don't want to print all this stuff. There we go, so that's our first one, and we want to return something. And when using the timeit module, it's really important to have a return value, otherwise the timeit module is not going to work. So we return one, great. Let's do the second one, def test2, like so. We indent that again. Remove the print, remove the end parentheses. This one's going to get trickier, def test 3. So now what I want to do is indent all of this code, and for some reason that almost never works for me. There we go, indent. Uh, it didn't work this time either, did it? Maybe it did. And we don't want to print, and we want to return value. So why should we return anything other than the same we do in the other ones? So return 1. And now we're going to import the actual timeit code, which I pre-recorded. There we go. Fantastic. That's how fast I can type.
So we're going to print the timestamps telling us how long this took. And we're going to run 10 cycles of each of these. So the first line here, print time it time it is that function. We're going to call function test one. There are no arguments to send. And we have this part of the call, globals gets globals. And then we have the number of iterations we want to run. So in this case, 10. So you see, I have test one, test two, test three. Let's make sure that's correct so that I haven't typed them in a different way. Test one, test two, test three. So with a bit of luck, this should run and this should tell us which of these is faster. So let's try it out. Ah, and as I said, it actually did fail on my indentation. So let's run through the indentation and make sure we do this right. So the four is there, there's the error. That goes in, this goes in, and these go in. Now it should be okay. Let's run it again. And there we have our results. So we see that the first ones took about 3.8 seconds to run 10 iterations each, and the last one took only 0 0.17 seconds to run 10. Wow! So if you thought that running list comprehensions was a lot faster, that's not always the case. Code that looks messy can very well be a lot faster than other code. And the reason the list comprehensions are kind of slow are mainly to be found, I think, in this area, because you're always running through these long loops that increase in size the higher you go. So that's an interesting performance result, and I hope that taught you how to use the timeit module for easy timing of your code to see which runs faster and slower. Now just remember to run a number of iterations, but not too many, so that you can see a difference. All right, I'll see you. Decrypt the message. Hey, welcome. I thought we'd do a project together, and the project is making a crypto machine. So the idea is to build something where we can enter a message, we can decide to either encrypt or decrypt the message, and then we get a plain text message. We take that message, we send it back into the same machine to get the decrypted message back. That way we can send messages to each other and nobody can read them except us. That's cool, right? And we'll call this something exciting, maybe Enigma. So. I'll start by listing the different things we probably need to do in this project. And then I suggest that as we run through, when we've completed one part, try the next one on your own. And then when you've tried it, come back and take a look at what I've done. Then you can, of course, laugh at my complete ineptitude at coding. All right, how does that sound? Great, let's get started. So first, we want to create our keys. Create key string. After we've done that, we want to auto-generate the values string by just changing the original string because we're lazy and don't want to type it twice. So, as the next step, we want to create two separate dictionaries, one for encoding and one for decoding. As our next step, user input, message, and the mode of the crypto machine, encrypt or decrypt. Next step, we either run encode or decode. Then we want to return the result. And at the very end, we want to clean up and beautify the code. So those are basically the steps. So let's get started. So number one, which we haven't even typed here, let's start by creating a function. So we'll say def enigma, and we'll call it light. There we go. Go down here, indent, and then we start keys. So this is a string variable that we're going to start with. Could be something else than a string, but let's start with a string because it's easy. So how would you do that? Well, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to add a space and an exclamation point. There we go. In the dictionary, that's going to be our keys. OK, then we want to auto generate the values string by offsetting the original string. So we're going to generate the values. How would you do that? I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say keys, then I'm going to slice the string. I'm going to start with the last letter, then I'm going to concatenate that with the rest of the string also by slicing. So that's going to take the first position, or the zeroth position, and all the way to the last position, but not including the last. I'm basically going to move the last character to the first spot in the string. So let's see if this actually worked. Okay, in order to test this, we need to run this function. Otherwise, it's going to get hard to keep track of what we're doing. So let's run it. Let's call, let's call Enigma Lite. Okay, so let's see what we have. Let's print ease. And let's print values. Now naturally it'd be clever if we added the colon at the end. So let's try it again. There we go. So now we have two lists. The first one, get rid of this, we don't need it. So the first one is the original list. The second one is the offset list. Okay, great. So that seems to work. 
Now we're going to create two dictionaries, one for encryption and one for decryption. So what do we call them? Let's call them dict-e for encryption. And how do we create that? Well, why don't we zip the values? So we'll zip keys and values. And then to create a dictionary out of them, we'll call dict. So there we go. And then we do exactly the same thing with the decryption dictionary, except we change the order of the key and value. So we'll say decrypt. And instead of keys values, we'll say it's the other way around. So we'll say values keys. So that's one way to do it. There's another way to do exactly the same thing, which we don't need here. I'm showing it so that you can use it for other things. Or we can create one and then flip it by changing the dictionary so that the key becomes the value and the value becomes the key. So how do you do that? Well, do it this way. We can start by reusing this, and then we use something called dictionary comprehension to create the other one. So we say dict d equals, and we're creating a dictionary. We say value colon key. This is the definition of the dictionary we want. Or e comma value in dict e items. So as you see, what we're specifying is that we want to take the value first and then the key. So we want to create a new dictionary where the old value is now the key and the old key is now the value. And we take the key and the value from a dictionary that we have here and the items spits out a list of tuples of that dictionary. So this accomplishes the same thing. It flips around the dictionary. All right, let's get some user input. The first thing we want is the message. So the message is input. Enter your secret message quietly. There we go. And then we need a mode, our crypto mode. So what mode are we going to be running in? So input, crypto mode, either encode or decode. Encode will be E or decode, which will be D. OK, next step. Now we run encode or decode. So now we need a conditional. So let's do an if. If the mode is equal to E, then we're going to run the encode. So we'll create a new message, which is the encoded message. And how will we create that? Well, we use a comprehension. And we're going to be creating a list. So we'll say dict E, and we'll call it letter, because we'll be typing letters, or letter, so for each one of the letters, in message. So this is going to use the dictionary, dictionary E, and use the key letter, and then it's going to output the equivalent value for each letter in the message. And if it's not, so elif mode equals D, then we do the same thing with one small change. We change the dictionary E to be dictionary D. And then at the very end of the function, what do we always do? We return new message. And then let's go down to the Enigma light and then let's print the result of it because now we're returning something. So what is that going to look like? Let's give it a shot. And again, sloppy with the colons. Sorry about that. So let's say hello, make it simple. Crypto mode, encode. It's now outputting, first of all, it's outputting our first two prints that we don't need. And then it's outputting a list. We don't really want that list. I'd like that in plain text. Okay, so let's comment out these two print statements and do something about these lists. So if we have a list and we want to create a string, what can we do? Well, we can join them, right? So let's join them on the empty string. And the second one on the empty string. Run this again, hello, crypto mode encrypt. Now we have a message as a string. And then if we want to get that string back, we copy it. We run the code again and we paste in what we just copied and we run the decrypt mode and we get the message hello. So that seems to work. Now let's try and clean it up a bit, make it a bit nicer make sure you can't mess it up as a human. So one thing we might want to do is when we're checking this letter here, let's make sure it's a lowercase letter we're checking. So nobody enters the wrong thing. Let's do the same thing here. And then the message, let's make sure that is lower as well. Otherwise, it might not be in our dictionary because we only have small caps. So message lower there. And then the return message, how about we capitalize that? Now, what else might we want to do? Well, I think that the conditional we have here is a bit long. Let's make decrypt the default because the spy that needs to decrypt might be in more of a hurry. So, so we'll change that. And instead of saying elif here, we'll say else. So in all other cases that they're not trying to encrypt, we will run this statement. How about that? Try it again. Hello, all in large caps, and we'll start by encrypting. So we get this string. It's capitalized, looks good. Let's run it. 
and decrypt, and we get hello back. So now that seems to work. And now to just prove to you that both of these work. So we've been obviously running these so far. So let's comment those out and make sure that this runs as well. Type a message, encrypt it. So there's your message. I suggest you copy that, paste it into the input box and run decrypt and see what it says. How many so I think we've established by now that the best way to get good at programming is to practice. So let's practice with another project. We're going to create a math tutor that tutors us in multiplication tables. So the application is going to take input from the user and ask for how many questions they want. Then we're going to present the user with a question like 5 times 5, and then the user inputs the answer for each of the questions one by one. When all the questions are answered, we print out the following information, some form of greeting, like thanks for playing, number of correct answers and the total answers, and then the percentage that the user got correct. And you can use different rows as you feel like it. Remember that the backslash n and the triple quotes don't really work properly with Python. Then we have a couple of bonuses. We measure and present the time it took to answer the questions, all of them in total, and then per question. The per question should probably be on average, but you can do it by calculating the time for each one of them exactly as well if you want to. Let the user specify how high the tables should go. So should we be doing five tables, 10 times tables, or 15 times tables. Then show all the questions and answers at the end as the final bonus. And don't forget to save the work you're doing so that it just doesn't disappear when you turn me back on. All right. Okay. I'll see you in a bit. So how'd that go? I'm sure it went swimmingly and you have a fantastic math tutor in front of you. You've learned so much that I'm pretty sure that you've done some things that are much smarter than what I'm about to show you. But let's get cracking. So when we're building things, one of the first things we should often do is write something called pseudocode. And pseudocode is just basically English or your own language kind of description of what you want to do. Now, there aren't any real rules for how to do this that I'm aware of. The main part is to just make life easier for you. So I have a snippet here that I'm going to paste in of what I think I need to do. So I'm going to import some modules. I'm going to ask how many questions the user wants, set score and start at zero, loop through number of questions, create two random numbers and calculate the answer, show user the question, capture answer and modify user score, and then output the final score. And then basically I'm just going to fill in code in these spaces and see what we get. So import modules, which one do we want? Well, I'm going to import random. And to make life easier, what I actually want is the rand range function. So I'm going to import from random, import rand range, and I'm going to call it r. That means instead of writing random dot rand range each time, I can just call it r, which is much shorter. So great. So we've imported that. It's not as easy to understand and read, but you know, let's not worry about that for now. Ask how many questions the user wants. That is going to be the number of questions. That's going to be an input. How many questions do you want? There we go. And of course, we want to make that an integer instead of a string. So we turn it into an int. There we go. Next thing, we need a score. So let's have a score. Score, and that gets zero as the starting value. Then we want to loop through the questions. So we want some form of loop. So let's try for loop. Let's call it Q for questions and range. Number of questions. Finish with a colon. Indent. So what are we going to do there? Well, let's say num1 gets, and then we're going to use that super function we have, the r. So that's actually random.randrange. And the rand range picks a random number within a range. And I'm going to get a number between 1 and 11. Now that's actually going to give me a number between 1 and 10 because it's non-inclusive. So it doesn't include the 11. It only goes up to 10, right? Number 2. Number 2. Well, let's not make it difficult for ourselves. Let's just copy this one. There we go, exactly the same number, except it's going to be num2. Now there's a different way to write this that I'm going to use instead. I'm going to say this instead. So I'm going to define two variables, and then I'm going to define two values like this. That's exactly the same thing as writing it on two lines. So num1 gets that first expression, and num2 gets the second expression. Awesome, right? Then I'm going to define the answer. So ans is equal to num1 times num2. That's our answer. Then we're going to get the user answer. So let's call that u ans. And again, we're going to make a input into an integer. So input, we'll use an f string and we'll say num1, back that up, 
times num2 equals, and that's where the user will input the number that they think the answer is. So then we're going to check if he inputs the right number. So if u ants is equal to ants, then we're going to do something. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to increase the score. So score plus equals one. And that should do it for our loop, shouldn't it? And at this stage, we want to print out the final number. So let's say print. Thank you for playing. Now, if this was not Scrimba, I would say backslash n, which means a new row. You got, and then how many right did we get? Well, we got the score, right? So score out of how many questions did he have in total? Well, that was the number of questions. And then we're going to calculate the percentage. So that would be the score divided by the number of questions, right? Those are calculations, so we need to put those in curly brackets as well. Like that. That's also a variable, not a string. And then I'd like to round it, otherwise it's going to be a big number. So we'll say round, which is a math function. And since I don't have a comma here, it's just going to round it to zero decimals. And then we want to multiply it by 100 to get it into percentage. Then we put a percentage sign, and that should do it. Let's try it. Turns out I forgot to close the string and also the print statement, which would be useful. So there we go. Now I have a pop-up box, and you should too if you try it on your own. So how many questions do I want? How about two? Six times six is 36, and then 10 times two is 20. All right. Thank you for playing. You got two out of two, 100%. Let's actually encapsulate that answer a bit nicer. Let's put parentheses inside the print statement. There. Okay, so what was the next bonus we needed to do? Measure the time it took to answer questions in total and per question. So for that, we could import another module, the time module. So let's do that. From time, import time as t. Another one of those cryptic variables we're going to use in our code. And then we need to start the time at some point. So where do we start it? Well, let's start it before we go into the for loop. So down here. So let's call that start. So start gets t. So that's where we trigger that function, the time time function. And then when are we going to stop it? Well, let's stop it when we're done with the loop. So down here. So, so end gets we call the time function again. Now this is going to give us the difference in seconds between these two numbers if we calculate it properly. So let's add that to the string. Let's say after we're here, let's add some more stuff. Let's start by making this actually say that we got those correct and we got them in. And then again, we need this is a variable inside our string. So and we need to round the number probably. So round whatever end minus start to one decimal, so you know, 5.6 seconds instead of just whole seconds. So this is the rounding function, and then that's the whole variable, so we'll close that. Seconds, and then let's specify the average time by calculating. So we'll put that inside of parentheses, and we'll say another variable, and that's going to be the end minus the start. So that's the total time, which we just calculated. So we're doing that twice. That could have been done more efficiently. And then we divide it by the number of questions. And then we're going to round all of that again to one decimal. So one, and then you're wondering where's the round? Here's the round. And then seconds per question. Let's see if this runs then. So we run it again. We get a pop-up box. How many questions do we want? Two. Six times one is six. Two times seven is 14. Thank you for playing. You got two out of two, 100% correct in 4.3 seconds. And then it seems like we've got the rounding wrong here on the last thing. Why is that? N minus start. Hmm, let's round the whole number. So we'll put parentheses around this as well. Run it again. You want two questions. Nine times seven, 63. Nine times nine, 81. All right, thank you for playing. You got two out of two, 100% correct in six seconds, three seconds per question. So that's kind of slow. So what's the last thing that we were going to do in the last bonus here? Bonus two, let user specify how high the numbers used should be. Okay, so how do we specify that? Well, then we need to change this number right here. So we're going to let the user do that. So we'll use another input statement. We'll let him say the max number. And again, it's going to be a number. So whatever we get in the input box is going to be converted to an integer. So input is number used in practice like that. And then we're going to use that max number in our code. So here, max num max num. 
But if we want to use the actual number, we need to increase it by one, right? Because it's not inclusive. So max num plus one is the one we're going for. Okay, let's run that. How many questions do you want? I want three questions. Highest number used in practice. Well, let's say five. Three times two is six. Five times one is five. Two times four is eight. Now we see that, thank you for playing, you got three out of three, 100% correct in 7.4 seconds, 2.5 seconds per question. And that was only up to the five times table. So let's do the last one. Show all the questions and answers at the end. Hmm. How do we go about doing that? Well, then we need to capture each one of them as they happen and then print them out at the end. So we're probably going to use a list and save them too. I think that sounds like a good idea. So let's go in here in the code and create a list. Let's call it answer list. So that's an empty list. And then we're going to start adding stuff to it. Where do we where do we have all the numbers? So we're inside the for loop here. And here we're creating the numbers. Here we're creating the answer. Here's the user answer. So by here, we have all the numbers that go into that. So here, let's put that inside the list. So let's say answer list. And then each time we go through, through here, we're going to append the data that we have for each one of the questions. So again, we'll do an f string. Say num1 times num2 equals, and then we have the answer, and then whatever the user wrote, which is the uans. Okay, so we've created that list. So each time we run through it, if we have 10 questions, it's going to fill up with 10 ones of these strings inside that list. Okay, then we need to print it at the very end. So we need a new print statement. And we need to print on five rows. Let's say we have five. So let's do a loop for printing. So then we can say for each one of the elements inside the list, we're going to print it. So for a random word in the answer list, we're going to print a. That should do it. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. So running the code. How many questions? Let's say three. Highest number used in practice, 12. Two times two is four. Nine times 10 is 90. Five times 10 is 50. There we go. So thank you for playing. You got three out of three, 100% correct in 8.2 seconds, 2.7 seconds per question. Two times two is four, you got four. Nine times 10 is 90, you 90. Five times 10 is 50, you 50. We rule. Awesome. Okay, I hope you had fun. I'll talk. All right then, in this project, we are going to build a marble betting game, which is actually a trading simulator to teach people or new traders how to size their bets so they don't lose too much money. So this is how it works. We're going to have a bag with 10 marbles inside. So it's going to be a random draw. We don't see the marbles. There are six green, four red. Green is good, red is bad. If we draw a green marble, we win the same amount that we bet. If we draw a red one, we lose the amount that we bet. So if we had 1,000, bet 10, we now have 990. If we bet 10, had 1,000, and got a green one, we have 1,010. Marbles are replaced into the bag after each round, so the probabilities are the same for each draw. Before each draw, we decide how much we're going to bet and enter that amount. We start the game with 1,000 gold pieces, or dollars, pounds, or euros. The number of rounds draws should be variable. If we lose half or more of our money, the game is over and we lost. That's bad. Then we're going to print some data along the way to show the user how they're doing. Is it going well? Are they winning? Are they losing? And we should remember that when Scrimba's running, we can't actually print anything in the console. So everything we print out, we have to push out to the input box that pops up. You know the one that you can't see when I'm running code, but you can see on your own machine? That's the one. And then as a bonus, we're going to replace two of the marbles. One green, one red. One of the green ones gets replaced with a black one that is a 10-time winner. So if we bet 10, we win 100. And the red one is going to be replaced by a white one, which is a five-time loser. That's a terrible marble. So if you bet 100 and that one comes up, you lose 500. That's not a trade you want. And then one last thing before you get started, the index HTML. I've already uncommented the part here that allows you to import modules because you're going to need the random module I'm guessing. So why don't you take a crack at that and when I come back I'm also going to talk about pseudocode and what that is and how to use that to write some code. So good luck and I'll talk to you soon. So did you do that exercise? If you didn't then go back and do it and then come back and see me again. Okay I'm waiting. Awesome. I'm sure that went great. So let's take a look at how to handle this. So pseudocode is sort of like writing English text that describes what we're going to do in the code 
and makes it easier for us to code. And to do that, first we maybe have to talk about what we're going to do. So we're going to have a bag with marbles. 10 marbles, 6 green, 4 red. We're going to draw a marble at a time, and first we're going to bet some amount that it's going to be a winner. And if we do that, we either win an amount or lose an amount. And then we're going to do that for a number of times, so that's probably a loop. And then at the end, we're going to print the final result. And if we lose half of our money, we lose the game. All right, so let's do some pseudocode here, see what that looks like. So we'll start with, I'm going to need the random thing. I'm actually not going to make that into code. I'm just going to say import random because we're going to need that. Then let's start writing some pseudocode. Then I need a bag. So create a bag with 10 marbles. After we've done that, we need some starting amount of money. So then we need whatever amount of money we have right now. So the current money that's with wins or losses. Then we need the result of the last round. Or let's maybe do the, we need how many rounds we're going to play. We also need to know what the last marble was, because otherwise we can't calculate anything. So that's probably going to be a variable. Then why don't we welcome the user to the game? Then we're going to do our loop. So loop drawing marbles. Inside the loop, we're going to do some stuff. We're going to find out how much was bet. Then we're going to draw a marble. We're going to figure out if it was a win or loss. Then we want to calculate win or loss or result. And probably our new amount of money and new amount. Let's call it purse. How much we have in our purse from the medieval times. Then we lose the game, right? Lose. If we lose half our money, we lose the game. Then we need to print some results after each round, although that won't actually show in this version, it would in a normal version because of Scrimba and Python. Then we're done with the loop, I think. And then we need to print final result. Okay, so that's sort of my pseudocode. And then what we'll do is we'll fill this out and see if it works. And wherever it doesn't work, we'll try and fix it. So that's pseudocode. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. And of course, remember that whatever you wrote, as long as it works, that's fine. You don't have to do it the way I did. Maybe you have much better solutions. All right, so we create a bag with 10 marbles. Let's call it bag. Why make things more difficult than they have to be? Let's make it a tuple. So let's call one green. We could have called it one as well, and then we could have called the red ones minus one, but this is more readable, so we'll do this. Comma, copy that. So we've got one green, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. But the seventh one is going to be red, so we turn that into a red one. Copy that. Two, three, four. One comma too many. So that's our bag. Awesome. Starting amount of money. So let's call that the purse again, but let's call it start purse. And that gets a thousand gold pieces. Woohoo, we're rich. Then how much money do we have now? Let's just call that our purse. And let's set it to the starting purse as a start value. Then the result of the last round. We don't know what that is yet, but we haven't played yet. So let's call it result. That gets zero. How many rounds are we going to play? Let's call it rounds. I recommend that you play this 25 or 50 times to make it fun. But for testing purposes, let's just play three to make it quick and see if it works or not. The last marble, why not just call that marble? And this time, we're just going to give it a string called none. That's not the data type none, that's just none as a string. Then we're going to welcome the user to the game. So that should be a print statement. What shall we say? Something interesting, that they start the game with some amount of gold pieces. So, and of course we need to enter a variable holding the gold pieces. So that would be purse. We're actually starting purse. Start purse. There we go. Then we're going to loop. I'm thinking this is going to be a for loop, and we're going to do it for the number of rounds that we have. So let's say four and then some name let's call it draw so we're going to do draws right so this is going to be one of the draws in range one up to and including rounds but it's not inclusive so we have to do plus one go down here so how much was bet well that's an input and let's call that bet we haven't set that variable before but we're doing it now that's going to be an input so input so let's say their current purse their last draw and then whatever the round was and ask them how much they want to bet it sounds good so let's say current and then the variable purse that's how much they have now the last draw let's tell them what that was that was the marble, so that's going to give them a color. And then let's do a new line. That's backslash n. 
and then we'll say what round it is. And that we are going to get from the for loop. So that's our dummy variable called draw. So that's going to be one, two, and three. Then we're going to say, how much do you want to bet? And what are we going to capture in an input? A string. Do we want a string? Of course not. We want an integer. So we're going to convert this whole thing, typecast it into a int. There we go. So what's next? Now we're going to draw the marble. So how do we draw something from a list or a tuple in this case? We use the random choice method. So we'll say marble is going to get the value of random choice and we're going to draw from the bag then we're going to figure out if it's a win or loss and I'm sure you remember green is good red is bad so let's do an if here and say if marble double equals green that's good we are going to get the result is the same as our bet so there we go and then in all other cases it's going to be red so this is our catch-all so we'll just say else so that's all other cases the result is going to be bad so it's going to be minus the bet all right then we calculate the win or loss on our purse so we take our present purse and then we do plus equals and then we add the result if it was a win we add bet if it was a loss we add minus bet so that's plus minus, which becomes minus. So that's great. Then if we lose half our money, we lose the game. So we should check that each time we bet. So if purse drops below 0 0.5 times the start value of the purse, then we lose the game. So let's say you lost too much. And what else do we need to do? Well, anytime we lose, the game is over. So we got to break out of the loop. So we're going to break. And then after the code is run so that we can keep track of what we've done, we want to print some stuff. So let's print some stuff that we want to keep track of. So let's print the current purse after each round. This is more or less what we printed in the input box, right? So we print the purse. The last result, put that in the parentheses. The marble, so that's going to be the color. And then how much we won or lost. So result. And then to space things out, let's do a empty line. If it wasn't Scrimba, we could just put a backslash n at the end of the first print statement. Then we're going to print the final results and calculate some stuff. So let's say starting ending purse. Let's print a little bit differently. Let's say start purse. So now I'm sort of not doing a formatted string anymore. I'm just printing using commas. And let's put in a slash and then the purse. I'm basically doing this to show that it's possible. It's not really best practice in any way, shape, or form. So print, let's say our gain and loss, and then we calculate how much money we made in percentages or lost. So what we're going to do is take our present purse minus our starting purse and in parentheses. And if we do that and divide it by the starting purse, we will get the percentage return as zero point something. But we want it as a percentage, so we'll multi multiply by 100. And we'll close that parentheses, and we'll put an extra there, make sure that it's proper, and then another comma, and then a percentage sign. Again, not really best practice here, just showing you that this is one way that you can print. And as far as I can see, with a bit of luck, this should run. Let's give it a shot. So I'm getting a pop-up box where it says current purse, last draw, marble. So we need to fix some stuff there. So 30, 40, and 50. So we get some printouts. That's nice. But there was something wrong in the input thing that we had. Let's see where that come from. Yes, this is not an F string. Let's make it an F string. There we go. All right. Other than that, it seemed to have worked. So you can practice this. And we're going to do the bonus bit. So what actually happens in the bonus thing? We're going to replace two of the marbles, right? One of the green ones, one of the red ones. So let's replace one of the green ones with a black one. Now that's a 10 time winner. And then one of the red ones is going to be white. And that's a five time loser. That sucks. So we replace those. We're still drawing from the same bag, but now we can get black and white as well. So we need to go down here to this bit and make a change. So first we're going to check if it's green and then else it's red, right? But now we have two more options. So what kind of if are we, we going to use here? We're going to use an elif. So if the marble double equals black, then we're going to create a new result. And the new result is not bet, but it's 10 times bet. Now that is awesome. And then we'll copy all this, do another elif, and we'll make that white. But this time it's not 10 times, it's minus five. 
Now that sucks a lot. We definitely don't want that one. So now we've modified the code to have those new marbles. And now I really recommend using this game to test. So let's give it a quick shot and see if it actually works. So I'm getting the pop-up box. You can run it as well and see what happens. Current purse, 1,000. Last draw, none. Round one, how much do you want to bet? Let's bet 200. That's crazy much. Round two, we actually made 10 times the money. That's insane. That's so lucky. It's ridiculous. So the next round, we're going to bet 200. We won another 200. So the next round, we're going to bet another 200. Wow. The fact that I've made 10 times the money on the first bet is just insane. So that seemed to work. Now, one thing you can notice here is that this actually has a feature that makes it a bit like real trading. And that's the fact that if you enter a negative amount into the bet, that means that you make money when you get a losing trade or a losing marble. Now, that's a bit interesting. And we could, of course, lock that away by only allowing positive bets. All right. I hope you found that interesting. I do hope you give it a shot and turn it up to 25 or 50 shots and see how you did. So I'll see you next Still have some... Congratulations. You made it. You've finished the Python 101 course. You are truly awesome. Most people don't even start a course they have, let alone finish it. But you did. That is a real cause for celebration. Well done. If you still have some exercises to do, then just go back and do them. I can wait. When you started this course, you were probably new to programming, and a lot of this was probably a little strange and maybe even confusing, perhaps even frustrating at times. Think of how far you've come in such a short time. And frustration? Well, that's just life telling you that you're learning new things. For me, it's been a real privilege and joy to guide you through this course, and we've covered a lot of ground. You've learned how to manipulate strings, lists, tuples, sets, dictionaries, and iterables, immutables, and variables are no longer a mystery to you. You can control how your code runs with conditionals and loops. You can return values, comment your code like a champ, and control if the code will crash or play nice when something goes wrong using things like try and accept statements. You've learned how to create lists, dictionaries, and functions on the fly with comprehensions and lambdas. You've looked at the foundations of object-oriented programming, learning about objects, classes, and inheritance. And now you can imagine maybe how a doctor might inherit from a nurse. Together with the knowledge of modules and the knowledge that there's always many ways to solve a problem, hardly ever just one, you are now ready to set your sights on whatever you want to learn and just start doing it. Now, before I leave you to do more awesome things in your life, I have one last exercise for you. If you want to, you can close your eyes. Now, I want you to look and think back to the course for a moment and re-experience the part that was the very best for you. Think about what that was. Get it in your mind. Do you have it? Now imagine you're watching yourself in that moment on a huge screen in front of you and you're experiencing the same emotions you did then when you felt awesome. See it. Really feel it. Feel the emotions you were feeling when you felt like that. Feel how strong you felt. Now turn up the color and the size of that picture so that it fills your whole mind. How does that make you feel? Now make it even bigger and double and triple the feelings you experienced and bring those feelings back with you to right now and say to yourself, I did that. And you know what? Whatever comes next, I got this. And if you want to share your experiences and what you thought of the course, I'd love to hear from you. You can post in the Facebook group or tweet me. I'd really appreciate hearing back from you. For the future, I wish you the very best. Now go out there and make whatever your dream is a reality. Because this code thing isn't a roadblock. It's a skill that you will master. So whatever it is you want, go out there and get it. And I look forward to hearing about your success. See you soon.